Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. A very good afternoon and welcome to Expert Talks on Kalkine TV. I'm your host, Rose Jacobs. Now this is where we chat to industry leaders and some of the experts in the financial field in an effort to inspire you to make the most of your own financial investments. Today we're exploring how companies should enhance their workflows. In today's contemporary times, technological advancements like AI are total game changers. Ben O'Loughlin from Servicely joins us for an industry insight. Now, Servicely is a next generation AI powered platform for enterprise service management and ITSM in particular. They make the service desk faster and cheaper while improving CSAT and NPS. Ben O'Loughlin has founded and run companies in IT, marketing, large organization culture change and employee management and engagement, and IT service management. His role at Servicely is is at the board level and Ben thank you so much for joining us today. Rose my pleasure thank you for having me and hello to all the uh, Calkine community. Thank you we're delighted to have you. Now Ben I'm told that your main obsession at the moment is to help service desk professionals understand the incredible efficiencies and cost savings that are possible with AI and how this can also drive customer self-service and satisfaction is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're all about. Great. So it's true that digital transformation requires intelligent workflows. How would you describe how companies can enhance their workflows? I mean, is this a simple solution or is it quite a complex formula? <laughs> yes, uh, the art is making the complex simple. So when, we, when we're talking about workflows here, what we're talking about is like repeatable kind of information based business processes. So the way that work in you know, information work moves around the organization. And so that can either be slow, you know, it can sit in someone's email inbox for a while or it can get routed to the wrong person. Um, but ideally we want it very streamlined. Uh, and there are three dimensions to the performance of this sort of workflow. The first is actually the, the user or the customer experience. So, you know, if you're a customer, for example, you want to make a warranty claim, you email them and nothing happens for five days you know you don't know if anything's happening that's a, a that's a bad experience um secondly um the second dimension of workflow performance is how efficient is it in terms of what resources are required to produce the service outcome that you want you know is it is it costing a lot of money to staff a service desk um, and it's disproportionate to, to to what you want to be spending on that kind of overhead um, and thirdly, the third dimension of performance is how connected is your organism, is your enterprise, is your business, the different business units, do they talk to each other and can work 
move between different business units without sort of slow and unreliable things like phone calls and emails sort of flying back and forth? Is it is it easy to track where things are up to? Um, is it easy for people to see what work they've got to do? Can you report on all of it? So that's, you know, by addressing those three dimensions essentially is how the um, user experience, the uh, efficiency and the con connectivity, that's how, how companies can enhance their workflows. Well, you certainly um, drew a, a chord for me there when you're talking about the customer experience. For me, obviously during mm. the pandemic experience, I can imagine so many people have been doing that online shopping experience and trying to communicate with businesses and the customer service desk. And you can certainly see the businesses that do have the automated response and you feel respected, you feel heard, you feel like it's all being under control. So that makes perfect sense to me. Now, yes to ask how would you rectify the top challenges and solutions for service desk strategy and also operations? Yeah, so let me just pick up a point there, uh, Rose, and that is that what you just described, your, you call that CX, you know, customer experience, that's equally important for employee experience or user experience. Because for example, you know, you, you asked if you could have leave, but you can't walk around to your boss's um, you know, office and, the, and, the, and then your boss says, oh, look, I'll, I'll fill that out for you. Don't worry about it. You know, all of a sudden things are happening at a distance. Um, so you need to be able to access resources and support um, from your whole organization in one place. Now, the challenge is that this is all, there's this big rush for digital transformation with the hybrid workforce because, you know, we can't do things the old way anymore. Um, and it really has accelerated digital transformation. And that means there's more and more services uh, coming online to be supported digitally. Um, so to your question about the top challenges, I mean, one of the main challenges is just the volume challenge. I mean, I was talking to a CIO um, in uh, Dallas um, earlier in the week about how, you know, when COVID hit, they went from 1,500 uh, support calls um, a month to, to five and a half thousand and no extra, no extra resources. So that's a, that's a challenge because the service agents then get burnt out it's bad for their morale, um, you lose people, you have difficulty retaining skills and it gets worse. Um, so, you know, in a perfect world, as the, as the increase in um, volume and in demand came on, you'd, you know, you'd just be able to throw money at it and hire more people and scale out. But unfortunately, nobody has that luxury. Everyone, it's, you know, you, you've got to, dare I say it, do more with less. Um, and the way to do that these days, uh, you know, ever since the industrial revolution that's been used technology and these days that's um, AI technology is, is mm -hmm. sort of where the, the real opportunities are uh, leveraging um, AI to, to make better use of your people. So would that for you also include those um, telephone services where instead of staying on hold for an hour or two hours where the customer just becomes more and more frustrated, you can now have that automated um, option to press the button, leave your phone number, and then you get the call back from the company, so you're just not left on hold. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really simple hack, if you will. Mm. Um, you know, another way might be that, you know, if you get sent your the invoice for something that you bought, there's a link on there, um, and it, you could click in there, and it'll just show you you know, what your purchase was, what the unit is, you, there's a link to the manual, there's a link to raising your ticket, like everything is just easy yep. for you. Even your and return you and refund options, everything's exactly. there. Vital, I would say, yeah. particularly in the current environment. And so can you That's tell right. us about the strategy that you implement to configure custom workflows to match various businesses' processes? Yeah, sure, Rose. Um, I guess the key to any of these sorts of projects is um, we're looking for, no, for low hanging fruit. I mean, we don't want to boil the ocean. We don't want another billion dollar transformation project. We've got to look at areas of the business, consult with you know the relevant stakeholders and find places where we can just make a, a real difference in people's lives, where it, whether it's your customers or your users or your service agents um, and improve one of those three dimensions or one, one or more of those three dimensions of customer experience of efficiency and of connectivity um, yep. and so then as, yeah as you've said yeah, you're not reinventing the wheel it's some of those simple tweaks can make the ultimate difference and you start with one of those three areas yeah and, you, and then you just uh, scope it and then get some wins um, for, for key stakeholders and do it in a way where you can actually bed down a platform you can make a few integrations you can get you know you can use it as a as a way to get buy-in from technical and business teams um, around that vision of workflow transformation. 
uh, and you make things better for the for the users, and then you uh, yeah celebrate the wins, and then look for what how can we up the ante? How can we um, you know achieve the next thing now that we've kind of reached base camp? Sounds as though there's a lot of hard work happening behind the scenes at your end. So being an expert in the field, Ben, can you tell us about how AI accelerated workflows are better than all the other options out there at the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it's a case of um, look. I don't think it's controversial to say that computers are better than humans at some things. Um, you know, we've known that since the '60s. Um, you know, it's been a decade or so since uh, Deep Blue beat the, the the world grandmaster at chess. So look, I mean, it's just a matter of finding. And the other thing is, I mean, we routinely in our economy we shift work to the lowest cost supplier. Okay, that's that's why we've got global supply chains. Um, because different countries, different parts of the world are better at different things. Um, and it just so happens that AI is better at certain things. Um, and there are certain repetitive tasks, uh, workflow tasks that AI does really well. Like, for example, to use natural language understanding to understand a request and then triage it into the right, you know, categorize it correctly and send it to the right person. Then running automated data capture um, and to give service agents full context. And then when the service agent makes a decision, just make all the re like orchestrate what needs to happen get all that to work and so you, you're not really talking about you know hybrid workflows are, are more than just you know it's naive to think you can automate everything with ai what you need to do is strike the right balance between what people are good at mm. and what uh, machines are good at and make sure that you play to the strengths of both and you, you really leverage the people that you've got indeed in fact that was my next question just to you know reassure people at home that we're not trying to replace the human element and that connectivity that that is vital for any successful business um, but more so using the AI um, to really sort of support that human connectivity and uh, and bring out the best in it yeah that's right I mean, and and just to do it's, it's that thing of doing more with less like the the inevitable inevitability of progress is that as people get more and more tools, like with a, a flint, you could you know cut meat faster than you could with your fingernails, and and these days the boundary is a, is a, at finding AI and using that in really super practical ways, uh, and when you do that, you, you can you just get more, the your humans can get more work done, and that's good because they've got more and more and more work to do. Absolutely. Um, you know we're and not so sort of we're not we're not laying off service agents at this point in our. Good to hear. <laughs> People at home can rest assured. And, but can you suggest some of those ways, you mentioned the hybrid workforce, some of those ways that businesses can incorporate the, the hybrid workflow? Yeah, of course. Okay, so there's, there's really um, some key capabilities. So there's, you know, the people process tools data, all that sort of stuff. But you sort of need to make sure in your stack that you've got a couple of things covered, a few things actually. So you need to make sure that your platform that you're using to build your workflows is, is kind of fast, easy, economical, agile to create workflows because, you know, it used to be that, that people would go in this multi, multi-million dollar business process engineering, uh, re-engineering projects and you'd hire, you know, a bunch of expensive consultants with cufflinks. I'm not sure if I'm wearing one today. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, and, and it would be a bigger than Ben Hur, and some would fail, some would succeed. But what, we, we're sort of that's waterfall. We're in agile now. We need quick results. We need something that is is can follow along with us quickly. Secondly, um, you know, you can't just be if you look talking about AI, you can get some gains with just an AI chatbot. And I mean, I think we've all been to websites now where. Um, you know, there's a bot that comes up and you ask it something and, you know, sometimes it helps you and sometimes it doesn't. Absolutely. You know, the, you know the, those things are good for what they're good for, but to really transform workflows, you need AI that's really embedded alongside the human operators, hand in glove, so that they can kind of hand off and trade off and bounce off each other and really get the efficiencies going and, and not just have something um, that's not that smart at the front end. I and couldn't the third agree thing, more. <laughs> <laughs> Any other final thing, tips? Yeah, the third thing is actually the, the sort of the cutting edge of this stuff is it has to, the AI system has to be self-learning. So you can't really afford to, well, maybe you can, if, if so, get in touch with me. But most of our customers um, can't afford to hire a team of data scientists and, uh, you know, business analysts and do up their UML diagrams and swim lanes and, you know, and, and sort of, you know, the process of automation itself to date has been, you know, dare I say it, fairly manual. 
These days, systems are adaptive. They can self-learn. They can just watch what the service desk agents are doing and then just like slide into the chair and start taking the workload off. So that's my third piece of advice as for how businesses can incorporate hybrid workflows is make sure that your platform has the ability to dynamically configure who does what work and, and, and slide the work over to the AI when the AI has trained itself. Ben, that's it for today's interview with Expert Talks. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Rose, and thank you to Capcom. We'll chat again soon. Ben O'Loughlin from Servicely, and I'm Rose Jacobs. Thank you for watching Expert Talks with Calkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Bitcoin, the most popular crypto with a more than 45% share of the market, is on the tip of the tongue of hundreds of millions of people following its record-breaking run. And in this video, I'm diving headfirst into the discussion of whether it has a resistance level. But first, please make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Calkine. Let's start by looking at what a resistance level is. A resistance level is the price level which an asset finds difficult to breach. This difficulty usually emanates from supply side pressures. As the price touches a certain level, sellers are more inclined towards cashing out. This is because they believe it might be the best time to book a profit on the investment before a likely dip. Resistance level is a technical indicator that involves the use of past price data and its analysis. It's a short term indicator because past data can be irrelevant in the long term. However, many stocks defy this so-called resistance level without much stress. Moving average also plays a key role in identifying resistance levels. It's the arithmetic mean of price over the past given number of days, for example, 50 days. Moving average is said to weed out short-term variations from the price. So with that said, how do Bitcoin's price fluctuations impact the resistance level? The issue with finding Bitcoin's resistance level is that the asset isn't just volatile, it's hyper-volatile. At the beginning of the year 2021, Bitcoin was priced at nearly 29,000 US dollars. Just a month before that, it was priced at nearly 18,800 US dollars on December 1, 2020. Within a week into 2021, Bitcoin had reached 40,000 US dollars. This shows that the digital currency more than doubled within fewer than 40 days. The fall in price has also been in the same breath on multiple occasions. The moving average of Bitcoin virtually fails to take into account the extreme volatility that has dominated prices in 2021. So what do non-technical indicators say? Qualitative indicators can help to roughly forecast at least the short-term price of Bitcoin and other cryptos. However, not all Bitcoin headlines generate the same surge or slide. For example, El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption as a legal tender was largely ignored by crypto enthusiasts. No major price change followed that announcement. 
So to sum it all up, we can find a rough resistance level of Bitcoin that can be calculated by relying on moving average, but it may not be the best investment strategy. That's because the resistance level is so technical that it fails to factor in the most important elements that just cannot be quantified. Any big news can severely impact the price of Bitcoin and technical indicators might very well paint a completely different picture. So it's unfortunately mostly up in the air. The price of Bitcoin could well breach 100,000 US by the end of 2021, but it could also experience a massive dip due to profit booking pressure. But hey, that's the world of crypto in a nutshell. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, share, subscribe to the channel, drop us a comment about what other crypto related info you'd like us to break down. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkai. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkaimedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkai. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Look at two dividend paying insurance stocks to buy in October. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones, and you're watching Calkine Media. The insurance world is seeing continuous growth, and insurance stocks can make a great addition to an investor's portfolio. Let us look at two FTSE 100 listed insurance stocks. The Prudential is a provider of asset management and health and life insurance services. Recently, it announced the completion of the demerger of Jackson Financial Inc. and collaborated with Invest Africa, a leading African trade and investment platform. Prudential reported a 17% year-on-year growth in life insurance, new business sales in Asia and Africa to $2.08 billion in the first half of 2021 and an increase of 25% year-on-year in new business profits. The company's overall adjusted operating profit from continued operations increased to $1.57 billion in the first half of 2021 compared to $1.28 billion in the second half of 2020. 
For the first half of 2021, Prudential announced an interim ordinary dividend of $5.37 per share to shareholders. The shares of Prudential returned 28.63% in the last year to shareholders. And the market cap of the company is £37.63 billion. Pounds. That was at the 5th of October. Now, Aviva is a UK-based multinational provider of life and general insurance services. Last week, Aviva PLC completed the sale of its Italian general insurance business, Aviva Italia, to Allianz for £284 million and its French business, Ema Gruppe, to a cash consideration of £2.8 billion. For the first half of 2021, Aviva announced an interim dividend of 7.35 pence per share to shareholders, payable on the 7th of October. The company registered an increase of 17% in operating profits from continuing operations to £725 million compared to £621 million in the first half of 2020. Shares of Aviva returned 39.57 to shareholders in the last year. The market cap is £15.29 billion in October. Now, if you like this information, please like, share and comment on this video. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. And for more information, log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals In terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with season two racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that season two finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is said to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. Oh, I'm 
On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Men of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage, you're watching the Executive Corner. And today's guest is Mr. Darren Abrams, the Managing Director of Oss Merchant Investments. And Oss Merchant Investments' goal is to bridge the gap between traditional and digital finance and offer wholesale investors a reputable, regulated option to invest in the blockchain space, a digital currency provider for investors and businesses. So, as you know, we bring you the business leaders to help you understand the insights of the stock market. And today we're very lucky to share some space live with Mr. Darren Abrams, the Managing Director of Ausmerch and Investments. Welcome to the show, Darren. Thank you very much for having me. Well, with your wealth of experience behind you, I'm keen to get the discussion started. And Ether, the cryptocurrency of the Ethereum network, is arguably the second most popular digital token after Bitcoin and indeed as the second largest cryptocurrency by market cap comparisons between Ether and BTC are only natural. And as a market expert yourself, what would you like to tell our viewers about the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum and what sets them apart, please? Sure. I think a great way to summarize it would be to say that Bitcoin is the gold what Ether is to equities. See, Bitcoin has been aptly described as dumb, and that is by no means a dig at the revolutionary discovery that Bitcoin is. What it means is that Bitcoin's purpose is simple. It's a digital form of money. It's also censorship resistant, as it's maintained by an international decentralized network of computers. 
all of whom have a copy of that same distributed ledger. No third parties are needed to utilize the network, nor can any deny uh, an individual's ability to do so. Bitcoin is also a particularly effective store of value, much like gold. Bitcoin and gold are both forms of hard money. And the central investment thesis for both assets are that they are an, an effective hedge against inflation. Unlike the supply of fiat currencies, as measured by the M2SL money supply, which can be increased by central banks to assist with economic goals, the supply of both Bitcoin and gold are finite. One may ask, why is this even important? The answer is very clear when you assess the purchasing power of the dollar which has consistently decreased over time as the monetary supply increases. The investment thesis for Bitcoin doesn't assume that the world economy and the US dollar is about to implode. The thesis revolves around the fact that the amount of money being injected into the financial system by central banks is unsustainable. We are beginning to see the effects of this uh, massive expansion of the M2SL monetary supply in the form of inflation. And inflation acts as a silent tax. Without having your money yielding a higher interest rate than that of inflation, the dollar value of your savings may stay the same, but their purchasing power will be diminished. Bitcoin's price appreciation has consistently outperformed the rate of inflation, which makes it an excellent way to preserve savings. Ethereum, on the other hand, and its native token Ether, are far more than a form of digital money. Ethereum's ability to facilitate smart contracts is a paradigm shift from Bitcoin. Ethereum is essentially a platform upon which a, multi a multitude of decentralized applications are built. These, de these decentralized applications, or dApps as they are referred to, are part of a revolution in the computing space known as Web 3.0. Uh, Web, Web 3.0 is powering a new era of decentralized finance, or DeFi for short. Among, among a myriad of other uses, dApps allow users to borrow, lend, swap, utilize derivatives and earn yield on their uh, digital assets. And it's done in a permissionless manner. Rather than having financial gatekeepers decide who can and can't utilize these financial applications, it's all executed via software, i.e. through effective use of these smart contracts. All of the dApps built on top of Ethereum utilize Ethereum's native token Ether to pay for miners to process transactions. Therefore, from an investment perspective, having exposure to Ethereum by holding that Ether token affords the investors exposure to all of the dApps built on top of that blockchain. Fantastic. Thank you for that summary of quite a high level concept. And I think proof of stake and proof of work, the methods that are used to mine both Bitcoin and Ether are also quite different as well, which is an interesting point. So thank you so much for that, Darren. And Bitcoin and Ethereum are both crypto colossi. One was the first digital currency and the other was the first crypto to launch the all important smart contract. And moreover, they are the top two cryptocurrencies by market capitalization, both increasing by the day and tend to be the yardsticks against uh, which all the other cryptos are measured usually. So when comparing the two coins, what does Bitcoin and Ethereum, what do they have to have in common? So as I alluded to earlier, both are decentralized, both are also cryptographically secured blockchain platforms. They both allow for permissionless censorship resistant peer-to-peer -peer transactions. From an investment perspective, what Bitcoin and Ether have in common is that they are both forms of hard money. Ether is currently in the process of being upgraded and one of the changes being executed will dramatically reduce the inflationary rate of the Ether token. This means that both digital assets will be useful as a hedge against inflation and therefore an effective store of value. Fantastic. And that issue of inflation is definitely on the forefront of many investors' minds at the moment. So it's going to be interesting to see how cryptocurrencies play a part in hedging against inflation. So cryptocurrencies have experienced waves of volatility over the past year without a doubt, but they're steadily gaining traction among the investors, institutional as well. And in regards to the Bitcoin versus Ethereum debate that we're having at the moment or discussion, or even Cardano for that matter. Which cryptocurrency is a buy in your opinion, please, Darren? Sure. Well, firstly, to speak to the volatility. 
Uh, volatility is a product of a nascent asset class, and it isn't exclusive to digital assets. In fact, the price of gold was particularly volatile in the decades following the US abandoning the gold standard. Volatility is essentially the price investors pay for the parabolic price appreciation. That being said, as, the asset class, as this asset class matures, the volatility will diminish, as will the parabolic price movements. This holds true for Bitcoin, Ether and Cardano. However, new technologies will inevitably result in new tokens that will each need to mature independently with respect to that volatility. Um, so what's interesting is that when you look at the traditional 60-40 portfolio, mm. allocating 1-5% to to Bitcoin since uh, 2015 would have been a very profitable decision. And now that's obviously no surprise considering the trajectory Bitcoin has had. What may surprise the investors is the positive impact on this uh, allocation with respect to ris risk-adjusted returns. Using the benchmark Sharpe ratio, a recognized measure of the trade-off between volatility and gains, showed an improvement for all levels of crypto exposure considered, i.e. between that 1% and 5%. Earlier this year, uh, an analysis by JP Morgan & Co. suggested that exposure to Bitcoin could achieve an, an efficiency gain in risk-adjusted risk adjusted portfolio uh, returns. Which, which digital assets have the most compelling investment thesis? This answer will change over time. Oz Merchant Investments is always trying to find asymmetrical investment opportunities, which are far more prevalent in the crypto space than traditional finance. However, the knowledge, skills, and time required to do so require a team of experts. Therefore, having a trusted ASIC regulated expert in the space managing your portfolio is, we believe, the ideal way to gain exposure to the asset class. Alternatively, investing in Bitcoin as well as the platforms powering the DApps is an advisable place to start. Specifically, Ether, Luna, Polkadot, Solana, Cosmos and Avalanche. Okay, so you've mentioned the majors there. Thanks for that. Definitely we'll keep them on our watch list. So just a quick question. Um, in regards to using bots or algorithmic trading for faster analysis of crypto trades, would your company do anything towards that side of the business or not really? Interestingly enough, we are actually in the process of developing a couple of different proprietary trading bots. The uh, interesting learnings that we've had is that they deliver outsized results, but they still really do need that human intervention to be able to inform them of the prevailing market conditions so that they can act accordingly. Thank you so much. And now back to the main line discussion. Do you believe that DeFi savings is more flexible and efficient? The yield that can be achieved through DeFi in orders of magnitude is higher than bank deposits. But how is that possible, please, Darren? So the yields uh, achievable through DeFi are certainly far higher than traditional banks, and they will continue to be for the foreseeable future. The reasons are as follows. Firstly, there is a lack of regulation in the uh, DeFi space. And now what this means is that um, when you compare it to banks, the cost of implementing and maintaining regulatory requirements for banks is particularly costly. Thank you, Darren, for sharing your valuable insights on in our show today. We really do appreciate your time. And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Darren Abrams, the Managing Director at Oz Merchants Investment. And the full recorded interview will be available from Calkine Media's YouTube channel. So keep watching Calkine Media for more expert talks, live market updates, and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches, 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. A very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Kalkine TV Sydney Studios. Now Australian shares are poised to open lower this morning. That says commodities retreated. The price of oil fell, pacing energy stocks lower in New York. Yesterday on the ASX, the best performing sector was communication services. They were up 1.9%. According to the latest SPY futures, the ASX 200 is poised to open the day 12 points or 0.15% lower. Yesterday, the benchmark index ended the day marginally higher at 7,448.7 points. And the worst performing sector was consumer staples, down almost 2%. The best performing stock on the S&P S X 200 yesterday was the Unity Group. Their shares closed 5.8% higher at $4.20. They're followed by shares in Reliance Worldwide and White Haven Coal. The worst performing stock on the S&P ASX 200 was Coden. They closed the day 18.8% lower at $10.95. They were followed by shares in the A2 Mill Company and Champion Iron. Yesterday, the ASX 200 increased 0.07% to 7,448.7. Over in the U.S., on Wall Street, the Dow Jones was down 0.7%. The S&P 500 was down 0.5% and the Nasdaq was flat. Let's look at some local news from this morning now. ANZ has recorded a $6.2 billion profit, beating consensus. They reported their full-year cash profit was beating expectations 65% better than a year ago. The stronger profit result was driven by the partial reversal of COVID-19 related credit provisions. ANZ Bank New Zealand Chief Executive Antonia Watson said the results reflected record demand in the housing market, a stronger than expected economy and a significant reduction in provisions the bank put aside last year. Unibail Rodamco Westfield reported their proportionate turnover for the first nine months of 2021 amounted to 1,981 million euros. That was down 16.5% year on year, predominantly reflecting the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, particularly the restrictions that were applied in the first half. Shopping centres slipped 11.9% to 1.248 billion euros while Office and others tanked 28.7% to 50.9 million euros. Convention and exhibition dropped 26% to 70.5 million euros, while property services and other activity revenues decreased 13.7%. An open pay has delivered strong growth in core businesses and is now officially live in the U.S. The company saw the highest increase of active merchants up 87 percent relative to the prior corresponding period in the first quarter of financial year 2022. Customers were up 56 percent and open pay UK entered healthcare and doubled their active customer numbers. Well, now it's time for a very short break, but stay tuned for more news set to affect the trading day. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? 
Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome back. This is the Morning Outlook Report on Calkine TV. Now, the European Central Bank is set to meet on Thursday this week. And the U.S. Federal Reserve met yesterday. And, the, sorry, they're meeting next Wednesday. And the Bank of England is set to meet later today. On the commodities front, all prices fell after U.S. crude oil stockpiles rose more than expected. West Texas Intermediate crude oil fell 2.89% to $82.20 a barrel. Brent crude, that's oil's international benchmark, fell 2.5% to $82.24 a barrel. Prices of safe haven gold eased in at choppy trading as strong tech earnings prompted some investors to opt for riskier assets. Gold jumped as much as 0.22% to $1,796.70 an ounce. Well, that's all for the Morning Outlook Report here on Calkine TV. Have a great day trading. Stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Adventure Gold has risen within Binance's latest rankings, and in this video I'll take a look at why that is and the price prediction moving forward. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay up to date with the latest videos from Kalkine. Bitcoin has been touted as digital gold. but there is another crypto with the word gold in its name. Adventure Gold, or AGLD, is neither Bitcoin nor gold nor Ethereum, but it borrows some elements from all three. Like Bitcoin, AGLD wants to be a digital currency. AGLD was contemplated as currency that could be used in DeFi games. Like gold, AGLD wants to increase the wealth of its holders. It's yet another token that works within the ERC20 framework. So let's break down exactly what Adventure Gold is. With the rising interest of all blockchain enthusiasts in NFTs, a project titled Loot was launched. Loot is a blockchain stored initiative that has some 8,000 text-based non-fungible tokens. 
Adventure Gold is now the native token of this project. It was initially given free of cost to loot NFT holders. Will Papa of Syndicate DAO is the developer of AGLD. DAO, or DAO, is an interface that enables online communities to interact. The Loot Project is also said to have the endorsement of Ethereum's Vitalik Buterin. AGLD's Key Feature Loot NFT will use AGLD as its governance token. Governance tokens serve the purpose of providing users a chance of having a say in future developments within the project. Decisions are then put to a vote. AGLD's Binance Listing Binance, a leading crypto exchange, has announced it will include the AGLD altcoin in its innovation zone. This zone includes crypto tokens that are comparatively a late entrant but have innovative features. The exchange also cites volatility in prices as one of the features of innovation zone cryptos. AGLD may also likely see its price undergoing volatility in the coming days. The exchange has also called upon AGLD holders to deposit their holdings in order to facilitate trading in them. According to CoinMarketCap, the market cap of AGLD is nearly 267 million. So what is AGLD's price prediction? Adventure Gold is a new cryptocurrency. According to CoinMarketCap, it jumped from nearly one US dollar to seven US dollars between September 2 and September 3, 2021. In the following days, the price hovered between two and five dollars. The Binance listing can push the price higher in the near term, and it might even attain the seven dollar valuation or an even higher price tag again by mid-November. So to sum it all up, AGLD has made it to the Binance Innovation Zone list. This governance token of the Loot NFT project can be a promising cryptocurrency. New and innovative tokens are usually subjected to volatility once trading in them begins on any exchange. This means that investors must undertake due diligence. What matters the most is the fundamentals of the cryptocurrency. AGLD's price relies on the success of Loot NFT and the overall sentiments of various stakeholders in the crypto space. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other crypto-related info you'd like us to break down. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Calcine. For more information, just head across to the website, calcinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calcine. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mohan Jessadason, CEO of X2M. Now X2M is a fascinating company, it's an Internet of Things company which monitors and controls smart devices in the gas, water and electricity sectors. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello, Mohan. Welcome to Calkine. Hi, Rachel. Good to meet you. Great to speak with you today. Now, firstly, I just, I'd love to say congratulations on your recent listing on the ASX. Now, can you tell me a little more about X2M and your specialty areas? Yeah, look, you, you summarized it really well uh, at the start, Rachel. We are, are a technology company. We connect devices, sensors, meters, machines over the internet. It's the next evolution uh, of the internet. Our particular focus at this point in time is the utility sector in the APAC region. Fabulous. Now let's talk about your IPO. How much did you raise there and what do you plan to do with those funds? Yeah, so we were looking to raise a minimum of six, maximum of eight. We were well oversubscribed, so we were delighted uh, uh, delighted to hit, uh, hit the $8 million uh, ceiling. Uh, look, we're a fully proven commercialized business. We have a market leadership 
position in South Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan. Uh, we've uh, gone to an IPA to raise funds to accelerate that growth. So to go deeper into our existing geographies, to go into adjacent geographies like the Philippines and Vietnam, uh, and uh, and uh, to license our technology for to third party uh, hardware manufacturers. Now, it's fair to say that Xtrem has found a unique opening in the utility market connecting devices. Can you tell me where the idea came from and how it was developed? Sure. So, look, th this is, I guess, business or management 101. We have a great end to end platform. It's unique, it's different, it's protected by a bunch of patents. It can go into any vertical market. Uh, businesses that we've run have been successful because we've been laser-like focused. And uh, so we looked at uh, the, the globe, the region. We liked APAC for a whole bunch of reasons. We knew it. We understood it. Uh, it was it's sophisticated and growing. And within that, the utility sector is migrating from the old analog world into digital and internet-based digital. So, uh, you know, you had a region and a vertical market that was right for the picking. We had very little competition uh, and, uh, you know, and the rest of it's now history. Excellent. Now, how does it help homes to regulate the energy efficiency of their appliances? So uh, our customer really is the enterprise customer or governments. And so our uh, platform, uh, we have a little chip that goes into water, electricity, gas meters, smoke sensors. Uh, that allows us to take control of that end device. So that, that, that's one of the things that makes us different. So we can put our chip into a uh, water meter or a gas meter and collect information, collect data, automate billing, uh, and then in turn go back and control that end device. So if there's an earthquake, it can shut off gas into a, a, a region, for example. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we've got a whole bunch of other smarts in, in South Korea. Uh, if you're over 18 and living on your own, or you're disabled and living on your own, you're on a government register. And if you don't use water to a regular pattern, then uh, we send off an alert to social welfare that says, you know, this customer of yours could have uh, could have a problem. And over the last three or four years, we've had about 200 cases of uh, people who needed help, and that's been picked up because of our technology. There's some amazing safety stories there, obviously. Now, X2M Connect was incorporated in 2019 and has seen undoubtedly significant growth in a short span of time. Now, did the company need to adjust their strategy in order to keep up with the exponential growth? No, not, not really. So we always embarked on a uh, program uh, to grow uh, and build a substantial business. So. Uh, building a successful small business wasn't in our vocabulary. So uh, the people we recruited uh, as individuals uh, are all smart, really intelligent, scalable executives and staff. Uh, what we built, our platforms, you know, could could accommodate a thousand uh, devices, water meters on, uh, on our platform or a million. So we created this business and built this business and built our brands to create a exciting uh, and successful, substantial organization in the future. Now, you mentioned your staff there. How do you invest in your staff and how do they manage to keep up with the emerging technologies? Sure, so uh, firstly, you, you need to pick the right staff and you've got to create the right culture within your organization. And we want uh, employees who are not just subject matter experts in their space, whether it be engineering or developing code, but but we look for staff that are inquisitive, uh, that think outside the box, uh, that like and are able to grow and, and develop, and then we create an environment that uh, that, that actually facilitates that. We have, um, uh, thanks to our Japanese colleagues, we, we have a culture of Kaizen, continuous improvement, uh, and, and we just have a culture where we, every day we want to do something better than we did the previous day, and all our staff are shareholders in our company. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, there's the right environment for people to learn, study, grow. Uh, and, of course, in the tech space, you have to do that all the time. You, you've got to be inquisitive. You've got to be reading. Uh, you've got to be looking up what other people are doing. Uh, yeah. Well, I bet your staff have been very excited about the IPO. 
Now, the ITO market is expected to cross $25 billion by 2024. Now, this is on the account of rising demand for smart devices and also growing government initiatives and increasing demand for analytics. Now, you've had a huge response from the APAC region for XTERM's technology. Do you expect the Australian market to follow suit? Uh, yes, we do, uh, Rachel. You know, the needs... Uh, here are, are the same as what they're in APAC and, and, uh, and uh, we've had momentum in APAC because they've been moving from analog to digital. We've done a lot of digitization in the utility sector here anyway, but you know the fundamental needs for enterprises to improve productivity, for consumers to get more information and data and, and, and to be better satisfied, and for governments and communities to drive for greater sustainability of our environments you know, are the same whether you're in, in Australia or, 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 or in South Korea. So uh, those drivers will see continued growth and adoption of this uh, internet-based technology. Well, it's a fantastic space to be in, and here at Calcine, we'll definitely keep a close eye on your progress. It was great to chat with you today, Mohan. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thank Cheers. you very much and thank you for your time. Now with that, I will sign off, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. 
Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks, and I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Peter Bui, the co-owner and manager of PB Web Development. And Peter will share insights in running a web development business who helps digital agencies in Sydney and Brisbane that don't have the web design or web development skills in-house to solve complex digital problems and deliver seamless user experiences with leads as well as results. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you understand the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Mr. Peter Bui, co-owner and manager of PB Web Development. Welcome to the show, Peter. Absolutely fantastic to be here. I can just hear you as well. Oh, okay. It's a bit soft. Is that a bit better for you, Peter? Uh, not quite yet, but um, I'm sure someone will take care of it. I can just hear you in the background. Okay. Uh, let us know how we go. But Peter, we're keen to share your insights today because not only do you have extensive experience in web development, but you're also passionate about blockchain and Cardano and Ethereum in particular. So I believe Cardano had a summit just recently a few weeks ago in September. Could you, as one of the Cardano community leaders here in Australia, please enlighten us on the recent developments in the Cardano ecosystem? Yes, certainly. Uh, it's It's been quite an exciting space to be in at the moment. Cardano has just released its uh, smart contracts capabilities just as many other smart uh, smart blockchains have 
Uh, Ethereum did it many years ago, about uh, three or four years ago, and now Cardano is following suit finally and releasing uh, multiple different uh, um, uh, app applications that are coming to the blockchain very soon. The most exciting thing that came out of the summit, which just came around the corner, was a lot of the partnerships that came from it. Um, partnerships such as Dish Mobile, a telecommunications partner, which is one of the uh, top 250 companies in the United States, uh, to partnerships such as Veritree, which do uh, tracking of forest restorations. And even early in the year, there was an announcement with the Ethiopian Ministry of Education, where Cardano is providing digital identities to millions of students in the country, providing them with uh, digital identity and also trackable educational records uh, for all the students uh, there in Ethiopia, which is absolutely amazing, absolutely exciting. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that information. And that's so true. The democrat democratization of the uh, finance industry through blockchain and crypto is very exciting and that it's reaching people in remote regions of Africa and, and helping them to get access to basic things like bank accounts or, well, not bank accounts, but crypto wallets and things like that is very exciting. And in your opinion, what makes Cardano especially good? You've touched on it a little bit. Do you have any more to elaborate on that? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of aspects with Cardano which make it a little bit or quite different from other blockchains. First of all, if you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, they work on a consensus mechanism called proof of work. So proof of work works on providing computational power, usually from computers, but now these days it's specific mining equipment. So it's a specific computers made to validate the blockchain itself. Now, as we're seeing Bitcoin and Ethereum grow over time, we're seeing that more and more computational power is needed. And because of this, the power that it's using is growing astronomically. So it's it equivalent to uh, Bitcoin's using equivalent to the power of uh, Malaysia, like the entire country of Malaysia. And that is, I don't think, very sustainable in the long term. There's, there's you know, a talk about using excess power that's being not utilized properly to power these blockchains. But you could do it differently, like how Cardano is and using low power computers, such as a small Raspberry Pi, which uses only 15 watts of power, and you can power a blockchain from that. So it's a massive power difference in what uh, the different blockchains uses compared to Gadano. Now, the really cool thing about this, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier with one of the partnerships that Cardano is doing, it's doing that partnership with Veritree, which manages forest restoration, and it does so by tracking each of the trees that it plants and verifying it on the blockchain. So you can actually see where the money is going, what trees are being planted, where they're being planted. So all this metadata about the trees and the forest restoration. The really cool thing that came out of the summit was that Cardano is trying to do a big charity fundraise where they are planting enough trees to make the entire blockchain carbon neutral for five years. So that's, that's absolutely massive compared to some of the other blockchains which are you know, using non-renewable resources in some cases to power the blockchains. We're seeing here Cardano doing the complete opposite, restoring the environment, restoring uh, nature, but still providing a decentralized financial backbone for the world to use to power uh, new economies and a new emerging markets. So that's that's probably the biggest and most exciting thing that I find about Cardano that's really different. I, I really like the way that um, the solution has evolved out of this, you know, the challenge. They really rose to the challenge and they've come up with what seems like an obvious solution. So that's very exciting. Thank you so much for sharing that. And being an expert in the field, please talk about the crypto wallet security options available for Australians at the moment. Yes, uh, crypto wallet security is always important. So if you're looking at getting into crypto or uh, specifically Cardano, it's very important that we keep everything that we're doing as safe and secure as possible. Uh, because now that you're, I guess, speculating in a particular market and you're converting your regular currency, your regular fiat currency into a cryptocurrency of some sort, such as uh, ADA for Cardano, you are now the custodian of that, and you don't have anyone to fall back on. So unlike fiat currencies, you can call up a bank if your credit card gets stolen and say, hey, there's a there's a scam, 
scam here, there's, there's an incorrect uh, usage of my credit card, you can get that money back. But in terms of cryptocurrency and Cardano in particular, or um, in any cryptocurrency, I should say, you, you don't have anyone to call. You are that person that is looking after your wallet and looking after cryptocurrency. So security is paramount. Using strong passwords, using what is called a hardware wallet is probably your best bet. So there's hardware wallets uh, such as a, a Ledger Nano or a Trezor, which are readily available around the world. You can purchase them. They don't cost too much. You can find them on, uh, on their producers' websites for about 100 uh, US dollars. And that is by far the best way to keep and secure your cryptocurrencies. It does a little thing where it stores your secret keys, which validate transactions to send cryptocurrencies. It stores that on a hardware device itself, might have one here. No, I don't. But um, you can use that in particular to uh, keep that extra level of security to avoid hackers getting into your computer and stealing your uh, special seed phrase, which is used to restore your wallet and potentially send your cryptocurrencies elsewhere. So hardware wallet is probably my number one tip. Great. Thanks for that. And in the world of digital media, what are the best ways of monetizing a blog or a website in your opinion? Well, uh, there are many ways. Uh, you can do anything from advertising on the website, uh, affiliate links and promotion of products, uh, paid sponsored links, they're really good ways of doing it. Or you can go down the path that are a little bit more involved of actually doing a digital product of some sort or selling uh, products online through e-commerce. They're brilliant ways of uh, leveraging a blog and selling and upselling to a particular audience as well. So they're brilliant ways of doing it. Uh, what we're looking at now is how to incorporate cryptocurrency into that process as well. So now you can set up an online store and accept cryptocurrency for whatever you're selling. So if you're selling a digital product, you can tap it into various payment gateways that will allow you to accept the cryptocurrency and then convert it into fiat currency if you need to. So that's that's uh, probably the, the, the best and easiest ways to monetize a blog or a monetize a website in general. Fantastic. And I've heard of some businesses who are choosing to go onto the blockchain, maybe sometimes finding it a little bit difficult to download the blockchain in order to get their business on there. Do you have any experience with that so far? Um, well, the businesses don't need to specifically download the, the blockchain to get get started, but um, uh, like, there's, there's lots of little tools. So if you're looking at simply accepting cryptocurrency uh, as a business, or you simply need to set up a wallet and then uh, provide those payment address details to the, uh, pr um, uh, the provider that you want to accept cryptocurrency from. So uh, for example, um, you can, uh, instead of providing an invoice with your BSB number, your account number, you can provide them with a wallet address. And that wallet address, anyone can accept cryptocurrency or pay as a cryptocurrency into uh, so that you can accept it and use it as a, a currency. Sure, I've heard that payment via crypto can be quite, uh, sorry, much more cheap uh, in regards to the remittance costs uh, rather than using the banking system. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, work with um, customers over in the United States and in Europe, and we're waiting for payments for, for days, weeks, sometimes just to come through. We know that the payments have been made. We know that um, uh, the transaction's happening, uh, but we just have to wait. And it's just that little bit nicer to actually receive that, uh, that money in a faster rate via blockchain so we can actually uh, receive it. And that goes the same when we're paying our um, uh, developers, our overseas developers in various countries, being able to pay them in cryptocurrency and then letting them convert it to their local currency wherever they are just speeds up the process a lot faster. So thanks, Peter. Um, I find that people who start reading about crypto or get involved get really excited about developing tokens. Uh, a lot of people are developing tokens and creating liquidity in the economy from doing so. And for those who are new to the Cardano world, uh, is it possible to create tokens for your business in Cardano? And what advice would you like to give them uh, if they want to start investing in, in Card Cardano? Yeah, so the Cardano ecosystem has had the ability to create tokens and NFTs since about March uh, 2021. Um, and that space has absolutely exploded. So you've, you've seen, I'm pretty sure you've seen uh, NFTs 
or tokens being sold on the Ethereum blockchain for millions and millions of dollars. And we're starting to see that happen on the Cardano ecosystem as well. So just this morning, I was looking at a particular NFT that was sold called a Space Buds. It sold for 400,000 ADA, which is equivalent to uh, just under a million US dollars. Uh, so it's, it's uh, ast astronomical the, the prices that these things go for. But in terms of actually minting and producing your own NFTs, there's many tools out there. And uh, if you jump on to cardano.org or our website, cardano.com.au, you can find a whole bunch of links and resources so you can learn how to mint the process, uh, go through the minting process to produce an NFT. And there's also a whole bunch of different marketplaces where you can sell them afterwards as well. Uh, so after you produce your NFT, um, you can list it on a marketplace, start marketing, engaging with the community, and hopefully you may sell a couple of your NFTs and tokens out there. Um, we're also seeing a lot of the uh, decentralized applications at the moment, uh, developing and potentially launching very, very soon within the next month or so. And they're also releasing their own tokens. So a lot of these projects do their capital raise via these uh, token raises. And a lot of people have been participating participating in these token raises at the moment. And these projects are just about to launch because smart contracts are available. So it's uh, quite an exciting time for the Kadona ecosystem, that's for sure. Yes, it certainly is. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your passion for Cardano and blockchain and the work that you do. Now, I understand there might be two streams to your business as PB Web Development, and then you also mentioned Cardanode. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So PB Web Development is our web agency that we've been running for many, many years. We help um, all of our clients integrate uh, complex solutions into um, their everyday business. So um, integrating third-party APIs, payment gateways, um, and now cryptocurrencies, um, specifically Cardano. So we're slowly developing that and uh, I guess pivoting towards more blockchain solutions using Cardano. Our uh, cardano.com.au website focuses purely on getting people into the Cardano ecosystem. So it has a lot of resources on there to teach people about Cardano and what they need to do to get set up, where they can potentially purchase uh, the cryptocurrency and what they can actually do with it. So I, there's a lot of interviews, a lot of resources on there from people that are building on Cardano at the moment. So all the really amazing projects that are building in the Cardano ecosystem, everything from NFT marketplaces uh, to um, uh, name handling services uh, to digital identities uh, such as uh, digital passports and so much more. So it's, it's a, a big, big um, ecosystem that we're looking at at the moment. Absolutely. And I believe um, Charles Hoskinson, who is the founder of Cardano, used to be the co-founder of Ethereum as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. They are all uh, Vitalik, uh, Charles Hoskinson. I've uh, forgotten the names from the other co-founders uh, off the top of my head, but they all um, left at some point in time and formed their own blockchain. So Polkadot came out of uh, Ethereum as well, such as uh, also uh, Cardano, as you know, and mentioned. Uh, and they've slowly formed and grown their own uh, blockchains over time. And we're seeing like a, or each, each one of the competing blockchains uh, doing and creating some amazing things, create, creating some amazing uh, ecosystems as well. Uh, so we'll just wait and see which, which one will win out in the end. But um, I'm excited to see interoperability between the different blockchains and Ethereum being able to trade on Cardano, Cardano being able to trade on Polkadot and, and vice versa. So something like that eventually will happen and we'll see interoperability across all the different blockchains one day. Yes, it is a very exciting space to watch. And I like the world views as well of, of, of uh, Vitalik Buterin and Charles Hoskinson. They seem very altruistic and like they actually want to do something for the world. So it's, it's a wonderful space to be in. Thanks again, Peter, for making time for the show today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Peter Bui, the co-owner and manager of PB Web Development and the full interview will be available on Calkine Media's YouTube channel. Please keep watching Calkine TV for more live expert talks and market updates and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. 
At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Are clean energy ETFs a good bet due to rising oil and gas prices? Hello, I'm Rachel and you're watching Calkine Media. Not long ago, fossil-based fuels were the primary source of energy. Now there's increased awareness around zero emission energy sources such as wind, solar and hydropower. Let's take a look at four ETFs with the highest assets under management focused on renewable energy. First up, iShares Global Clean Energy ETF. They track a tiered index of clean energy companies globally. The portfolio consists of companies engaged in hydroelectric, solar, wind, biofuels and geothermal industries. The iShares ETF was launched by BlackRock in June 2008 and it is an open-ended fund. Its expense ratio is 0.42% and assets under management are $5.79 billion. The ETF has an average daily volume of $76.39 million. Their next ex-dividend date is the 13th of December. It has over 81 holdings. The tracking index is the S&P Global Clean Energy. The ETF gave around 14% return in one year based on the closing price of $21.77 on the 1st of October. Next up, Invesco Solar ETF tracks the Global Solar Energy Companies Index, in which the companies are selected based on the revenue generated from a related business. The ETF focuses exclusively on the solar energy segment. They started in April 2008. They track MAC Global Solar Energy Index. The open-ended fund has an expense ratio of 0.69%. The Solar Energy ETF has $2.99 billion worth of assets under management, with a daily average volume of $74.25 million. Its ex-dividend date is the 20th of December. They have around 46 companies in their portfolio. The ETF yielded around 22% return in one year at the closing price of $81.06 on the 1st of October. Next up, First Trust NASDAQ Clean Edge Green Energy Index Fund. They track the US listed clean energy companies based on their weighted market cap index. They started on February 27. The ETF is open ended and has an expense ratio of 0.6%. The ETF has $2.46 billion of assets under management and its daily average volume is $15.96 million. The ETF has 53 holdings in its portfolio. It tracks NASDAQ Clean Edge Green Energy Index. It gave a 39% return in one year and at the close $62.86 on the 1st of October. Next up. Invesco Wilderhill Clean Energy ETF. They track an index of clean energy companies based on modified equal weighted. They're an open-ended fund and started back in March 2005. The ETF has an expense ratio of 0.61% and assets under management of $1.77 billion. The average daily volume is $29 million. It tracks Wilder Hill Clean Energy Index and has over 73 holdings in the portfolio. They gave a 24% return in one year at the closing price of $77.50 
on the 1st of October. Now, if you like this information, please like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to press the bell icon for our latest videos for regular updates. Take a look at our website, calchimemedia.com. I'm Rachel, signing off for Calchime Media. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calpine TV. Are these five New Zealand small cap stocks on a growth trajectory? Let's take a look. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Kalkai Media. Small cap stocks are companies that have a relatively small market cap and are traded publicly in a stock exchange. Investors who are risk lovers and can bear market risk can consider investing in these stocks. Investors can invest in quality low price stocks amid market inefficiencies and take advantages of the growth potential that these stocks carry with them. Let's skim through these high performing five small cap stocks on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. Cancer Diagnostics a Business Pacific Edge opened its retail offer on the 28th of September. The offer comes on the back of the group's capital raising that was announced on the 23rd of September. Shareholders in New Zealand who fulfill the eligibility conditions will be able to raise roughly 20 million New Zealand dollars and apply for almost 50,000 new shares. The retail offer will close by the 13th of October with the settlement allotment and trading of retail offer shares to begin on the 20th of October. The group's CX bladder range of diagnostic products has proved helpful in critical cancer recognition and has been also praised by the Journal of Urology in the US. Transport tech services firm E-Road entered into a strategic collaboration with Seeing Machines, an industry leader in vision-based monitoring technology that allows machines to observe, understand and help people. The partnership will provide operators with one tool to handle video telematics where there were two separate managing systems previously. The integration of the technology will also help fleet managers in prioritizing actionable insights from data. Next we have Serco, a supplier of corporate travel and cost solutions. They reported a 37% drop in sales to $16.9 million in financial year 2021. During the year, Serco also partnered with Booking.com and Zeno brand was approved in North America. The group has been developing new systems as well as carbon control options for all forms of business travel. Motor ship vehicle dealership owner Colonial Motor reported a 19% increase on their prior corresponding period in its revenue to $901.2 million for the year ending the 30th of June, while the profit attributable to shareholders stood at $28.4 million, up from $21.8 million in 2020. The group paid an interim dividend of 15 cents per share on the 29th of March and a final dividend of 40 cents per share on the 4th of October. Their business took a hit after the country went into level three lockdown on the 17th of August. The unpredictability of COVID ongoing international supply chain constraints 
Timing and pricing of new electric vehicle products are just some of the challenges faced by the group. The Vista Group, a provider of cinema management systems, has announced total revenue of $44.9 million, an EBITDA of $6.4 million in the first half of 2021. That's a broad industry rebound and a free flow of films into worldwide theatres. The company also created Vista Cloud, which aims to broaden cinematic opportunities. They expect to rate, make around $95 million and $100 million in sales for the year ending the 31st of December. Now, small cap stocks are volatile and risky in nature, especially during market lows. However, investors can wave off this risk by adding investments that are market friendly. All figures were mentioned in New Zealand dollars unless said otherwise. Now if you like this video please like, share and comment on it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. And for more updates log on to our website calchimemedia.com. I'm Rachel signing off for Calchime Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for joining us on our trending topic. Coal demand goes through the roof. Here are five ASX listed small cap coal players to watch. The price of crude oil and natural gas soar high as demand from Europe is on the rise. The European nations are struggling with the energy crisis and the Asian countries are competing with them as they bid for the delivery of natural gas. The renewable sources of Europe are growing at a fast pace, but still more needs to be done to make renewables sufficient enough to meet the energy appetite of the region. The focus now shifts on coal producing nations and companies and let us discuss five ASX listed coal producers amid the biggest comebacks in the price of coal. Allegiance Coal Limited. Allegiance Coal invests in metallurgical coal projects which are in the advanced stage, production stage or near production stage. The company has three major coal projects. Tennis project in British Columbia, Canada, New Elk Mine in Colorado, USA, and Black Warrior Mines in Alabama, also in the USA. Allegiance acquired the Black Warrior Mines recently in July of 2021. 
Allegiance has provided a production guidance of 100,000 tonnes of metallurgical coal from its two mines located in the USA from November 2021, which is forecasted to grow up to 120,000 tonnes per month by calendar year 2022. Australian Pacific Coal Limited. Australian Pacific Coal operates Dart Book Underground Coal Mine in the Hunter Valley, New South Wales. Dart Book Underground Mine was operational from mid-1990s through to 2006. The company is in the process of recommencing operations on the mine and has applied for permits and approvals. Dart Book Project will produce thermal coal suitable to sell to coal-based power plants to overseas countries. Metro Mining Limited. This Queensland-based mineral explorer is into bauxite and coal exploration and production. The company's thermal coal resource is located in the Surat Basin and is characterised by low sulphur quantities. The infrastructure is under development phase and Metro has maintained its coal projects in good standing conditions. Metro is looking for opportunities to create value from its coal assets. Bow and Coking Coal Limited. Bow and Coking Coal operates coking coal projects in Bow and Basin. The company holds 100% interest in Broadmeadow East, Hillalong, Isaac River, Kurara, and Comet Ridge projects. Apart from these, BCB also holds 15% interest in Lilyvale and 5% in the Mackenzie Coking Coal projects. New Coal Resources Limited. New Coal operates Delworth Coal Project through its 100% owned subsidiary Delworth Pty Limited. And Delworth holds exploration licenses EL6812 in New South Wales. The EL lies in close proximity of major mining projects operated by Glencore, Coal and Allied and Anglo Coal. Bay's water power station lies in close vicinity of Delworth's project and the project is in the exploration and initial development phase. Hopefully this has been informative for you. If you do like the information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, do head to the website. It's calkinemedia.com. My name is Sage for Calkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Good morning, a warm welcome. Sage here for Calkine TV reporting to you live from Sydney and you're watching the Global Markets Roundup. Let's dive into some of the key highlights and happenings from yesterday, starting with the US market. And the global equity markets gave up recent gains on Wednesday while the US Treasury yields fell to a two-week low as traders weighed continued positive corporate results and a resurgence in the US-China tensions that could compound supply chain worries. The MSCI World Equity Index, which tracks shares in 50 countries, was down 0.2%. And the benchmark US indices closed mixed on Wednesday, 27th October, as investors delved into the company's quarterly earnings and sought to catch up with their latest developments. The S&P 500 was down 0.51%, the Dow Jones fell 0.74%, the Nasdaq Composite stayed flat and the small cap Russell 2000 was down 1.90%. On Wednesday, the Commerce Department said orders for durable goods like appliances and automobiles fell for the first time in September since last spring. New orders declined by 0.4% in the month from August after four consecutive months of gains. 
The data renewed concerns over supply woes and rising commodity prices. Communication, technology and consumer discretionary stocks were the top gainers on the S&P 500 on Wednesday. Energy and financial stocks were the bottom movers and eight of the 11 stock segments of the index stayed in the negative territory. Around 82% of the 192 companies that reported quarterly earnings beat Wall Street expectations, the referentive data showed. Shares of fast food chain McDonald's Corporation rose 2.60% in the intraday trading after its third quarter net income rose to 2.14 billion US dollars up from 1.76 billion US dollars a year ago. The beverage maker Coca-Cola company's stock gained 2.30% after it raised its fiscal 2021 outlook. Its revenue jumped 16% year over year to 10 billion US dollars in the third quarter. Let's move on now to Europe. European stocks slipped from near record highs on Wednesday with miners leading the losses after concerns over China hit the metal prices while mixed corporate earnings reports and an upcoming central bank meeting kept investors on edge. The pan-European stock 600 closed 0.4% lower after coming close to a record high on Tuesday. And the UK shares hovered in the negative region on Wednesday, 27th October, with the headline FTSE 100 snapping the three-day gain and the mid-cap reflector FTSE 250 struggling to hold the marginal gain due to mixed earnings and market-wide subduedness due to the autumn budget 2021 presentation. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Exchequer sorry, Rishi Sunak unveiled the autumn budget today announcing a wide range of protective measures for the ailing industries to augment the pace of recovery. The global heaviness amidst the capital markets has been weighing on the London equities with the major round of earnings coming to an end. However, a set of blue chip companies are yet to report the quarterly figures in the upcoming days as oil and gas company Royal Dutch Shell British cigarette, cigarette maker American Tobacco and financial institution Lloyds Banking Group prepared to release the financial results on Friday, 28th October. In the next week, the large cap corporations including oil and gas company BP, telecommunications group BT, banking group Standard Chartered, bookmaking holding company Flutter Entertainment, chemicals company Croda International, clothing company Next, Medical equipment manufacturing company Smith and Nephew, supermarkets giant J Sainsbury and airline company IAG are slated to release the earnings report card. And the benchmark FTSE 100 traded down 0.34% from the previous close of 7,277.62. The mid-cap index FTSE 250 surrendered the gains in the terminal trade up 0.08%. Let's move on now over to Asia. And Japan's Nikkei share average recovered from the early declines to end Wednesday. Little changed as the strong earnings supported the market despite overall caution ahead of a parliamentary election on this weekend. The Nikkei slipped less than eight points to close, maintaining most of the previous day's surge of about 500 points. The index earlier sank as low. China shares closed lower on Wednesday, led by coal miners following Beijing's latest move to address the skyrocketing prices, while environmental protection-related companies advanced on the country's plans to hit a carbon emission peak before 2030. The blue chip CSI 300's index ended down 1.3%, while the Shanghai Composite Index lost as well 1%. South Korean shares fell on Wednesday as traders booked profits after two straight sessions of gains with focus on Samsung Electronics earnings on Thursday. The benchmark KOSPI ended down 0.77% after gaining 1.43% in the last two sessions. Finally, the Australian shares may open lower on Thursday after commodity prices fell as China further ramped up its efforts to check the coal prices. Market sentiment was also in the negative zone after the US shares ended mixed overnight and oil prices tumbled. The ASX 200 ended the day marginally higher on Wednesday. The Australian dollar surged after a surprisingly strong reading on core inflation propped up market wages on early rate hikes and sent short-term bond yields to their highest since late 2019. The Australian dollar popped higher on Wednesday after a surprisingly strong reading on core inflation fueled the market wages on early rate hikes and sent the short-term bond yields to their highest since late 2019. 
The Aussie dollar added 0.4% on the data and the yield on the 10-year US Treasury note dropped 0.07 percentage points to 1.54%. Let's move on now to some of the newsmakers. An ANZ reported a full year cash profit from continuing operations of 6.2 billion US dollars, beating expectations. It was 65% better than a year ago. Commonwealth Bank revised its 2021 Australian GDP forecast from 3% to 3.5% and from 4% to 4.4% 4 .4 in 2022. Trading marketplace High Pages Group's total revenue was up 14% from a year ago while recurring revenue rose 17%. And lastly, let's take a look at the commodities market and oil prices fell after the US crude oil stockpiles rose more than expected. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil fell 2.89%. Brent Crude Oil's International Benchmark fell 2.50%. Prices of safe haven gold eased in choppy trading as st strong tech earnings prompted some investors to opt for riskier assets. Gold jumped as much as 0.22%. And thanks for joining us in the report. That's all for now. Keep watching Calkine TV for more market updates. Sage signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. What is technographic data? Hey, and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. Technographic as a word is culled from the combination of technology and demographics. Hence, technographic data informs people about the reality of technology with a particular customer. Technographic data received from whatever source provides insight into how a company uses technology. The unique insight is a core reason of managing technographic data effectively is important. When leveraged properly, technographic data can improve your business's revenue. This is namely through improved segmentation, when you can identify different customers based on their usage and deployment of technological infrastructure. It becomes easier to classify based on these needs. Improved specificity. Rather than spreading a solution out into the air and hoping that one will stick, technographic data improves the specificity of the approach. Improved prioritization. Not all leads will offer the same value to your financial bottom line. Some leads will pay you more and the market is competitive, so you need to pick your battles wisely. Technographic data can help with that. Reduce lead time. You can't time spent on leads by half when you have adequate technographic data to make decisions with. Now we know that technographic data offers immense benefits, but before you can leverage the data, effective collection should be your priority. Here are three ways to collect technographic data. Surveys. Surveys are direct methods of collecting data. For example, when you're targeting a prospective customer, one way to get data is to put the company's staff through a survey. Website scrapping. Website scrapping is the process of extracting information from the website of the target customer. The information extracted provides insights about the app and services the prospect runs the business on. Technographic data. So to sum up, technographic data may be hard to get on your own. Hence, it's better to patronize technographic data providers. The data you get from providers tends to be accurate, especially when the purchase is from a reputable data provider. 
Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. If you like this info, why not sub to our channel as well while you're at it? This has been Holly Shield for Calkine Media. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix, with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released, and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is said to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out, Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend, even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. 
So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hello, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Tim Gray. Tim is the founder of Profit Systems. They provide supply chain software to manufacturers with highly complicated supply chain processes. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Calkine. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Good to speak with you today. Now, firstly, Tim, can you tell us a little bit more about Profit Systems and where the inspiration for the company came from? Certainly. Uh, about 20 years ago, I started, I uh, was doing rapid employment and improvement for my clients in the areas of supply chain, and we kept falling over the reality that most businesses, most manufacturing companies, IT, departments were heading towards standardized systems and, and uh, standard installs of SAP and Oracle and so on. And it made them very unresponsive to the changing needs of, of the business and to deliver rapid improvement. We needed to have tools that could show us where opportunities existed in the supply chain. And uh, initially we started building Excel spreadsheets and found they weren't robust enough. So we put the thinking cap on and started building the profit suite. And today that's uh, our, our lead and most of our work comes from uh, deploying systems and, and consulting around integrating the supply chain planning tools into businesses, ARP systems and their businesses. Now, in your experience, how do you believe that people can disaster-proof their businesses? It's a very topical uh, terminology you use. The, the uh, last 18 months has shown more disruption in most supply chains around the world than, than many of us have seen for the rest of our careers. Um, some of the most important things to do, I, I like to use the term of synchronizing. We, we have to synchronize uh, our, our demand signals or our best understanding of what our customers might want all the way through uh, our supply planning, our capacity and resource planning, our transport planning and our purchasing and procurement. And they sound fairly obvious things to do, but are uncommonly rare to see in, in most businesses. So really getting alignment through the business um, and what's interesting too is there's been an enormous push to improve forecasting because I think it's very obvious to everybody in the boardroom that what happened last year is unlikely to happen again this year and certainly what was happening two years ago is no indicator at all to, to how this year's unfolding. And uh, it's really interesting that we are seeing a lot of examples of businesses getting focused on forecasting but then waiting for the forecasting to deliver results. And one of the most profound messages I have for my clients is don't don't wait, absolutely set up and improve your forecasting. But having a process to forecast and having a forecast is one thing, then using it in with all its errors and all its assumptions, just share that with the rest of the business. Having one set of numbers is powerfully liberating for a business uh, and, and is often missed. And that really helps businesses start future proofing. Having a forecast, not enough, but having uh, sharing that and sh particularly sharing things like knowing where your forecast is poor and sharing that information as well is uh, uncommon but incredibly powerful once it's done. Absolutely and, and on that note what do you believe in your opinion could be the reason for failing to deliver optimum results despite some businesses investing millions of dollars? It's a great question. Many many businesses uh, invest heavily in their ARP systems and it's very um, e easy at, at the board level to presume that if we buy SAP, and I'm not beating up on SAP, but if we buy SAP or if we buy Oracle, it's set on the brochure that we can do all things. So surely we should do it all in, in, in our ERP system. But when it comes to planning, running your business, uh, running your planning through your ERP system is a little bit like driving a car, uh, looking in the rear vision mirror. The reason I say that is 
uh, your ERP systems are perfect at telling you when an order was received, when the stock was picked, when the when the product was manufactured, uh, when it was dispatched from the warehouse, when the quality checks were done, and when the invoice was paid. The the and these are all essential and they're absolutely essential parts of the business. But the commonality with that is that they've all happened, and so there's no longer any doubt about those particular actions. And ERPs are necessary for telling us what's happened and tracking our immediate execution, but they're not sufficient when it comes to planning. When we plan, we need to be able to see forward. In the, using the current analogy, we've got to be able to look forward through the windscreen, see what's coming, see vehicles that are getting in a lane or potholes and so on. So for me, when I'm planning, I don't just want the rear vision mirror, I want all the windscreen, I want a heads up display, I want the Google Navigator, I want to have the whole gambit of forward detection systems that can tell me what's going on ahead so I can navigate before I get into trouble. Um, and, and you know, a lot of people often say to us when they're, when they're early on the journey of working with us that the ERP systems, surely they must be sufficient. You know, they said on the brochure they could do this. Um, the best indicator you have that they're falling short is that almost everybody that has these systems will end up planning in Excel. And Excel is a great prototyping tool, but they, they're there and it's available to everybody in the business, but they're not robust, they're not sufficient, they're not scalable. So the the reality is we need to have businesses, when we're planning for business, we need to be able to see things like what happens if the FX changes, what happens if my ship misses a delay or container price goes up another 50%. I hope that doesn't happen, but we've seen crazy, uh, crazy uh, responses around the world at the moment. And once once we have various scenarios, we need to be able to run them to ground and see what are the impacts on on our resources, on our share prices, on our on our raw material procurement, on our on our footprint, on our on our crew working hours and conditions, and so on. And once we've run those to ground, we've worked through the various scenarios. Then we can choose as a management team which of those we're going to execute to, and then we push that back into the ARP system. But ARP systems are not designed for doing that kind of what if scenario. They're designed to track what's happened, and they advertise having other features, but they're all kind of con constrained by this need to be able to report and record and what's actually happened. And what is the most crucial aspect to be taken care of while working on supply chain management so that it does turn out to be a game changer for businesses? Yeah, we've seen really good evidence, particularly over the disruption of the last 18 months, of businesses absolutely going gangbusters and still being able to navigate the many disruptions that they've had. Uh, and, and the key elements uh, run to that point I made earlier about synchronization. They need to have a, a forecast and forecast fast, but they can't get stuck at that forecasting level waiting for the forecast to solve all the answers. They then need to run that forecast in, into integrated business planning or sales and operations planning processes so they can see what resources they need where, what crew they need where, how much and which customers they're going to satisfy, and if they're constrained, you know, who are they going to let down and make these tactical decisions with knowledge and foresight and then um, e execute that uh, and, and keep tracking that. The, the key here in such a time of disruption is not to have one plan and just go blindly to that. It's to, to frequently reassess that. And a little bit like in a yacht race where you tack you know, in, into the wind, um, it doesn't matter that you're not right on course. It matters that everyone's pulling in the same direction. And as long as your business is synchronized, uh, and, and you regularly review these assumptions and the plans, you'll do very, very well. Uh, and, and that's the key where we're seeing our, our business and our clients and customers that are really excelling have really embraced that synchronization, make sure their organization is nimble and agile, as opposed to those businesses that are struggling or just focusing on forecasting um, or, or still in the chaos land of leaving every silo to, to work on their own definitely be about having a different set of eyes on things, isn't it? So, so Tim, in your experience, what's the key to shifting decision making from a business being reactive to them being agile and opportunistic? Yeah, it's interesting to me that's really at the, gets to the heart of why anybody would invest or should be investing in business software. Um, in my mind, you want to be making faster, more informed decisions. If your organisation isn't able to do that, then I, credit, then I question why would you spend money on any any system? Um, and I'll put that in in the context of if in the if where you're planning, if you can't see what my customers might need tomorrow or outside of the order horizon, 
I, I'm left with no choice, but we call it hopium. I'm left with no choice, but looking at last year and I'm trying to apply some instinct about what materials I might purchase or what materials I might need to, to, to make uh, and uh, and where I might put in my, my supply network and hope that it's somewhere near where a customer finally consumes it. Um, if, however, if I have a, a forecast and a supply plan and I, and I can see what the consequences of our expected requirements are, we're now planning to serve. And so we've got a, a clearer picture and we can make decisions around which customers to serve if we don't have enough, how am I going to do a fair share allocation? But the, the highest level of, uh, of decision making comes if we can show the cost to serve while we're planning um, so that everyone in the supply chain can see, well, when we serve this customer, it costs a dollar fifty a pallet to move. But when we're serving this customer, it's costing five dollars a pallet. What's different? And it actually elevates the decision making process and starts driving this innovation that we stop just thinking about supply and we start thinking about supply at the best possible cost. And that's an enormous transition from the poor, poor people that were working in the hoping phase where they're just relying on on their instinct and what's happened in the past to guess what's happening in the future. We're now talking about um, having plans and having the right information to make the best decisions at the time, in my opinion, organisations should be demanding that every every decision point in their supply chain should be supported by having the cost and consequences of each decision choice that they've got. So they can make, if we're going to try and source material from Thailand um, because, uh, you know, I don't know, Sing Singapore is not available or, or South Africa mills have gone offline or whatever the, the, the contrast is, we need to see what those cost, what the shipping lanes mean, how, how much extra work we're going to carry, um, you know, are they are they approved suppliers, and if not, how long will it take? All this information must be readily available so we can make informed decisions. What happens in the chaos realm is that we're we're responding with just thumb in the air and and trying to anticipate with instinct rather than with information, and it slows the whole process down, and we, we end up not working synchronisation. Well, it's definitely been a disruptive few years for many businesses. It's great to know that there are companies like Profit Systems out there. Thanks so much for your time today, Tim. My pleasure. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. Today's trending topic covers, is Sun Crypto a viable option to invest right now? I'm Sage for Kelkai Media. Ever since Justin Sun, founder of Tron, launched the Sun Crypto in September 2020, it has captured the imagination of the cryptocurrency world. This year, Sun reached new heights. It touched an all-time high of US $50 in 2021 before the market crashed in May. But from the 20th of October, Sun Crypto again showed signs of resurrection. Sun is a cryptocurrency developed on the Tron network, which is described as a protocol primarily used for the development of decentralized finance. In using the proof-of-stake consensus, Sun is considered a multifunctional governance token that grants token holders voting rights, governance and community staking rewards, and much more. 
So what made Sun Crypto surge? One of the main reasons for the Sun Crypto's recent surge is the acquisition of Just Swap, which will allow the Sun Crypto to upgrade itself into the most prominent decentralized exchange in the Tron ecosystem. With it, the liquidity providers stand a chance to earn rewards and users can buy back tokens with revenue on the platform, manifesting Tron's original aspiration to extend benefits to the broader public. It is already registering rewards of over US 70 million in TRX, WBTT, WIN, JST, and others, and is considered one of the best rewarding DeFi mining campaigns in the crypto industry. So what's its price prediction and is it a good investment? Sun is ranked 310 on CoinMarketCap and according to market experts, especially now following the acquisition, the Sun Crypto presents itself as one of the most profitable investment options in the market. Not only does it present a bullish run going forward, but with the crypto markets overall at a high now, it does present a viable option. It is expected that Sun Crypto will yield approximately 591 US dollars 78 cents by 2026. Thus, going forward as Tron's DeFi ecosystem expands, Sun Crypto along with Just Swap can prove to be a significant force in the crypto ecosystem. SunSwap does have the potential to become one of the largest decentralized exchanges in the whole industry. It is proving to be one ideal investment option for choice. If you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, please head to the website, which is calkinemedia.com. And I'm Sage for Calkine Media. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Ningalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. 
The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off the grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. China has announced plans to roll out a pilot real estate tax amid the ongoing rise in real estate speculation across the country. The top decision-making body of the Chinese parliament, the National People's Congress Standing Committee, on Saturday provided the nod to the latest plan to promote rational housing consumption, according to the state media. The world's second largest economy under President Xi Jinping is all set to witness major reforms in its real estate policies. The policies come in the wake of a burgeoning affordability crisis. But what is an affordability crisis? Since the 1990s, Chinese home prices have surged by over 2,000%. It's expected that the new tax may finally curb the rise in property prices. According to the official news agency Xinhua, the tax will be applied to residential and non-residential property as well as landowners. It will not however apply to certain legally owned rural homes and residences. So what could the impact be on Australia? It's not the first time that the Chinese government has looked at implementing a property tax. Such a scheme was first discussed back in 2003. The plan faced strenuous opposition at that time amid fears of a collapse in house prices and a dip in household spending. 
This time, the plan is being rolled out whilst giant property developer Evergrande is on the verge of default. Now, Evergrande may not be the only Chinese developer struggling presently, as a few other debt-laden property developers are also witnessing a similar liquidity crunch. Banks are also applying a break on fresh lending amid rising speculation in the sector. Could iron ore feel a pinch? Experts expect the tax to result in a slowdown in the property construction business in China. It would have an adverse impact on the prices of iron ore, which is primarily sourced from Australia. Since May 2021, the export of iron ore has already halved for Australia. Every $10 US fall in the price of iron ore erodes some $6.5 billion from Australia's GDP as per budget estimates. Is consumer spending expected to show a drop? Even the discretionary spending of Chinese citizens is expected to dip amid worries over falling property prices. Chinese international students bring a big amount of revenue in the form of tuition fees and living expenses for Australian education institutes. According to the official data, education exports fell a further 36% in the first half of 2021 after a 24% plunge in 2020. So whilst the policy, at least on its face, is designed to help bring some equilibrium to China's difficult property market, it could have a number of adverse impacts both in China and Australia, and it may force a rethink of your portfolio. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks, Executive Corner by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Peter Kazakos, the founder from Kaz Group. And Kaz Group provides information technology services. The company offers computer applications, systems and business process outsourcing, application software development, systems management, technical consultancy, and con any other computer equipment um, requirements that you need, they may be able to help. Kaz's core platform quantum technology in the crypto space has already started and is behind the recent launch of Quantum Assets Token on the Binance Smart Chain and with a goal to create its own mainnet and launch Quantum BTC as well as ETH, this should surely be an interesting discussion. So today bringing you live we have Mr. Peter Kazakos, the founder from Kaz Group. Welcome to the show Peter. Thank you. And with your experience, we're keen to share your insights on the show today. So we're using science for a new era of securities. How is quantum cryptography making it theoretically impossible for data to be accessed by hackers, please? Okay, so we're actually using a real quantum box to actually deliver this. So one of the biggest issues you've got with, with, with crypto is the keys. The keys are, are everything. And the keys are generated uh, 
in, in normal instances by, by our method. Using crypto, using our quantum technology, we can create truly random keys. And it's quite important we've got a truly random key. You, you cannot copy this um, and find it out as you would with a, uh, traditional computers can't do this, but now with quantum computers, it's theoretically possible that, that, that these keys can be decrypted. Uh, therefore, we're using quantum technology to fight quantum technology. That is fantastic news because apparently quantum computers aren't as far away as we think they are. And the impact it'll have on the crypto sector will be very interesting to note. And the quantum phenomena, how is this going to be used to produce a new class of quantum cryptographic keys that cannot be hacked into? Would you mind sharing your insights yeah, on this? Yes, yeah. so, so, so it, it, it's, it's a bit, uh, so, so, I suppose, scientific, but let me just try to cover it simply. Uh, it, we have a situation, we have electrons that try to go through this barrier. And to try to get through this barrier, they, they go through it in a random sequence over a period of time. We count the numbers that go through the barrier. That is completely random. That number is used as the seed to create the crypto key, which is the lock on your cryptocurrency. Great. And if it's not your key, it's not your crypto. That's an important motto to go by. And it's important. It is important comes with a new set of threats and in your opinion what does the Australian crypto market need to know about the quantum technology that's emerging? Well I think it's important to understand that these computers are, are not in the in the distant future they're coming now in fact we, we're using that technology therefore uh, hackers will get hold of these computers and attempt to actually get to people's keys. So it's important that when you look into the future that you are using the right type of technology to generate your keys and therefore protect your cryptocurrency. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that insight. And what would you like to tell us about the purpose of Quantum Assets PTY Limited? Will it help yes. secure investors against vulnerability and devastation? Yes. Well, yes, we have so. Uh, the, the technology uh, uh, we're, they're using our technology uh, to come out with uh, two crypto coins, uh, uh, the uh, quantum uh, a digital, uh, uh, a Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, those coins will be using our quantum technology. Um, to As a predecessor to that, they have uh, come up with uh, quantum asset tokens, QA token, and it's quite unique in that that token allows people when the coins come out to actually get a drop of those coins uh, with no additional charge. They will just get those into their wallets as long as they're holding the QA token. Well, what exciting news from your company. Congratulations and I look forward to seeing yeah. how it um, prospers for you. Um, one quick question though, there's so many altcoins that are emerging all the time. Do you mind me just asking quickly um, how your quantum BTC and quantum ETH will be true to the fundamentals of the actual Bitcoin white paper? The, the, one of our key areas is our area of ensuring that we've got a low carbon footprint. And in fact, um, uh, unlike Bitcoin and, and others that have miners that using a lot of energy. We don't have to use that in the crypto area. So in fact, we, we are uh, uh, neutral in that space and we guarantee to be neutral. What fantastic news. Thank you for sharing that. And how can digital assets be eco-friendly? You've just touched on this now, but it is yeah. a trending topic in the space. And yeah. quantum assets, the choice for eco. What makes yeah, quantum assets I, I, a choice? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's the key thing that we don't have mining, right? Mm. And that's not part of our, uh, our uh, philosophy. Uh, and as we all know, mining uses a lot of energy. And in fact, um, in a lot of places, a lot of dirty energy as well. Uh, we don't have that and therefore we, we, we ensure that we are uh, eco-friendly. Wonderful. So it'll be a system of nodes that um, validates the transactions instead of uh, miners. Is that correct? That's right, that's right. Great, great. That sounds similar to another cryptocurrency I've been reading about today. IOTA apparently does the same. 
Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights today. That was definitely okay. worth the discussion. Was there anything you'd like to finish off with before we end? No, no, I think the only thing is people should be wary of what, uh, how their, their, their currencies is protected, what technology, what platform it's on, uh, because uh, situation, it's not like having your money in the bank where you can sort of potentially get it out at any time. Here, if you haven't got the keys, you haven't got the right keys, you haven't got your money. And I think you need to understand that. Fair enough. Yes, keep it simple, sweet, when regards to ownership of crypto and keys. Thank you so much again, Peter. I really do appreciate your time. That's okay. Thank you very and much, Isla. If you've just joined us, we had a very interesting and informative discussion. Mr. Peter Kazakos, the founder of Kaz Group, and the full recorded interview will be available from Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. Keep watching Kalkine Media for more expert talks and crypto buzz. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Zealand and the UK have signed the historic free trade agreement, which will help in accelerating the country's post-pandemic recovery. The deal will not only provide a nearly one billion New Zealand dollar boost to the country's GDP, but will also give an unparalleled access to Kiwi exporters to the British market. Hey, thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calpine Media. The FTA means that the UK will remove all tariffs on New Zealand exports, mostly on consumer sector products like honey, wine, kiwi fruit, dairy products, and so on. A wide range of industrial products as well. With that said, let's dive into some NZ exclusive stocks that might be impacted by this. First up is Kathmandu Holdings. New Zealand's famous global outdoor lifestyle brand Kathmandu has announced that it will hold a hybrid annual meeting, i.e. both physical and virtual, on the 23rd of November. Next up is Michael Hill International. Known for its fine and appealing jewellery, Michael Hill is the country's famous jewellery brand. In its recently provided quarterly update for the period ending 26th of September, the company disclosed strong same-store sales growth by 15.5% as compared to the first quarter of financial year 2021. Plus, its digital sales soared by 58.2% on the previous corresponding period. Despite the closure of many of its stores during the current Delta outbreak, the company maintained resilience with earnings being well managed due to persistent cost control and digital growth. Next is Brisco Group, the leading retailer in New Zealand a reported 69.63% increase in net profit after tax and 22.58% increase in sales revenue for the half year ending 1st of August. Gross margins rose because of better analysis handling of the promotional activities. Towards the end of August, BGP sales were considerably down. Risco anticipates the pent up demand to increase sales from October through to January of 2022, although there is still uncertainty. Convita Food and Healthcare Provider. Convita made good progress in 2021 and stands on a strong footing. The group reported a net profit after tax of 9.5 million New Zealand dollars in the financial year 21. The company also imported its sales number by 17% year on year in the fourth quarter and resumed its dividend payments. So the bottom line is that New Zealand companies dealing with consumer products are sure to reap benefits from the historic partnership with the UK. However, its direct impact on the retail sector is yet to be seen. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ and stay up to date. 
Sub to our channel as well while you're at it. This has been Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market, as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching. Property with Calkine. See why Squid Game is a financial dystopia. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones, and you're watching Calgary Media. Here are the seven financial lessons from Netflix's Squid Game. Quick money slips faster. The show brings out a big lesson of saying no to fictitiously impressive return on investment and fraudulent schemes. Instead, you can easily save a small part of your regular earnings and invest wisely in quality securities to generate wealth or pay off debt. Next, to get rich, Pay debts first. Another takeaway is that you must always think of repayment before applying for debt. Once taken, it should become the top priority. You can't focus on building wealth if you keep running away from financial obligations. Squid Game also reveals the harsh reality of loan sharks and their aggressive and intimidating debt collection tricks. Next, derivatives is a deep think game. The intense volatility of derivatives exposes investors to manipulators in the market, so investors must remain careful about it. But research is the only thing one needs to rely on for profitability and wealth creation. Diversification is key to wealth. It's a biblical verse for investors and portfolio managers. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, and it's quite obvious why. Diversification helps spread risk. It probably sang Wu's job as an investment leader, which gives him his survival instinct in the game. Next up, gambling is too risky. No matter how big or small the income is, putting to risk is not worth it. It's always better to not gamble and use one's limited resources wisely. Calculated risks always work better, even in gambling. Squid Game pretty much makes it clear how choices determine the future. And insurance is one wise decision. Health insurance was one crucial thing that even COVID-19 made us think about. Squid Game also showed the importance of a safety net to maintain one's standard of living, even during the darkest days. And seeking support makes you stronger for making better decisions. It's always easier to go to an expert with whom you can share your financial hardships. Seeking support, therefore, only makes you stronger in the wealth game. Trusting the right people can not only save your money, but can also multiply it. So we see how Squid Game teaches us the importance of good financial decisions, makes us realize the importance of informed financial choices. Squid Game is not just a show, but also a lesson on money management. Now, if you like the information in this video, please click on the bell icon for notifications for our other videos. You can also subscribe to our channel. I'm Rachel, signing off for Calkine Media. James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches, 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Kelkine has a new video. Thanks for joining us. Today's trending topic covers HSBC and Lloyds. Are these banking stocks worth holding? I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Let us take a look at the two FTSE 100 listed banking stocks and their investment prospects. HSBC Holdings is a UK-based global investment banking and financial services firm. The company reported its third quarter of 2021 results today, with its profit after tax jumping 4.2 billion US dollars and profit before tax rose to 5.4 billion US dollars. The rise in profits was attributed to the expected release of credit losses and other impairment charges during the period and from having a higher profit share from HSBC's associates. The group also said it intends to start a two billion US dollars share buyback program shortly backed by its strong capital position. Lloyd's Banking Group is one of the largest British financial services institutions in the UK. The group plans to close 41 Lloyd's Bank branches and seven Halifax branches across England and Wales between January and April next year due to an ongoing decline of customer visits in the group's branches. The move would bring the total number of closed branches by the group to nearly 150 branches in the last 14 months. The group had reported its first half of 2021 statutory profit after tax at £3.9 billion and its net income in the first half of 2021 was £7.6 billion. The group is set to announce its interim management statement later this week on the 28th of October. The UK banking stocks have started announcing earnings after the US banks kicked off a strong earnings season earlier this month amid the rising deal-making and deposits. 
However, according to the industry analyst, some British banks may have a slower release of their loan loss reserves due to some ongoing macroeconomic headwinds affecting the UK's economy. A continuing supply chain crisis, rising energy prices and the end of certain pandemic-related government schemes are expected to impact the UK's path towards economic recovery. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you do like the information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Kalkine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, please check out the website. It's kalkinemedia.com. And I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hello, welcome one and all. I'm Sage reporting live for Calkine Media and this is the Crypto Catch where we catch you up on what's been happening in the cryptocurrency space in the past 24 hours. And starting with Bitcoin, which has continued its downward trajectory in the past few days, sinking back below the 60,000 US dollar level to $58,457 US. Bitcoin's price has lost 5.62% in the past 24 hours. The fall continues on the back of research which suggests that the large portions of Bitcoin are owned by a concentrated number of people. The research by the Bureau of Economic Research found that a mere 1,000 people collectively own 3 million Bitcoin, which is equivalent to an eighth of its total supply. This news has prompted expert analysts to warn that Bitcoin is susceptible to systemic risk. Moving on, and Shiba Inu coin has overtaken Dogecoin, surpassing its 31 billion US dollar market cap. Shiba Inu has now moved up the ranks to be the ninth most valuable cryptocurrency in the world, according to CoinMarketCap's price index. The currency now has a market valued at 31 billion. 82 82,179,521. While other leading cryptocurrencies continue to flounder, Shiba Inu is now up more than 75% over the last 24 hours and 180% over the last week. Even more impressive, Shiba Inu's price has increased by more than an astounding 700,000% since January. Anyway, let's take a break and we'll be back with Bitcoin's market update as well as the day's winners and losers. Stay tuned. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome back. You're watching Crypto Catch. I'm Sage and this is Kalkine TV. Let's move on now to 
uh, some more of the news coming in from the crypto space. And winners in the altcoin market, apart from the aforementioned Shiba Inu, which has been the biggest winner in the last 24 hours. Helium has jumped 1.87%. The 58th ranked crypto has had a positive month, jumping from 17 US dollars 74 to its current price of $25.14 in the past 30 days. And in a day marked by heavy losses for some of the more major cryptocurrencies, Cosmos has lost nearly 15% in the past 24 hours. The 26th largest cryptocurrency fell despite having a jump of around 11% on Monday. Cosmos is now priced at 37 US dollars and two cents. And that was short and sweet, but that's a wrap for today's crypto catch and join us at the same time tomorrow for the latest in the crypto news. Meanwhile, stay tuned for more stock market updates throughout the day. I'm Sage reporting for Kelgain Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calkine has a new video. Thanks for joining us. Today's trending topic covers, are you confused about super? Well, here are four funds to consider. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Superannuation is a company pension program which benefits employees after retirement. And under this type of long-term investment, an employer contributes a fixed amount regularly. Australian super funds reported robust returns in the financial year 2020 to 21. And despite the challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic, which caused significant volatility in the stock market, according to the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia, these funds averaged annual returns of nearly 20%, which is a solid performance ever since compulsory superannuation was introduced nearly 30 years back. So here are the four superannuation funds that can be considered by Australians. Child Care Super. Child Care Super is a super fund designed for women. It's My Super product has three life stages, building, growing and consolidating. So your investments are adjusted according to your age. Guild Super. Guild Super provides superannuation products including super super insurance cover and services specifically designed to support women. Australian Super. Australian Super is an industry superannuation fund which is run only to profit members. It is owned by the Australian Council of Trade Unions and the Australian Industry Group, which is a peak employer's body. For every 50,000 Australian dollars you have in the superannuation product, you will be charged a fee of 0.6%. Five-year annualised net return on 50,000 Australian dollar balance stands at over 10%. Host Plus. Host Plus Superannuation Fund derives its revenue from investment activities as a superannuation fund targeted towards workers in the hospitality, tourism, recreation and sports industries. The company has its operations across Australia and for every 50,000 Australian dollars you have in the superannuation product, you will be charged a fee of 1.26%. The fund's five-year annualised net return on 50,000 Australian dollar balances stands at nearly 10%. Well, hope you enjoyed this video with the fourth superannuation funds worth considering. If you do like the information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, please head to the website. It's kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media.
October is set to be a massive month for Netflix, with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released, and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With Season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, Season 2 is said to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Men of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, or have you calling out, Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell, and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. 
I'm James Preston, reporting for CowGuy. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Lambros Fotios. He's the founder and CEO of Station 5. Now Station 5 is a software development company servicing startups and scale-ups across Australia, Europe, the UK and with offices here in Australia and the Philippines. At Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to you, Lambros. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Good to chat with you today. So, firstly, you have a very interesting company here. Could you please introduce Station 5 to our audience and explain some of the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, Station 5 is a software development company based uh, in Sydney. Uh, we're actually distributed though, so we're split across Sydney, uh, Brisbane, Melbourne and the Philippines. Um, but what we effectively do is we build uh, software technology from the ground up, uh, generally kind of greenfields projects, uh, and very heavily specialise in startups and scale-ups, so fast-growing businesses. And you signed a huge deal with the Swiss government. Can you tell me what was involved with that? Uh, a very arduous uh, kind of process, tendering process naturally. Um, so effectively what the project is, is it's a, um, the, the Swiss government effectively has a mandate to uh, contribute to peace um, over the next few years naturally. Uh, and they're undertaking a conflict sensitivity analysis project, which quite simply just means that they want to be able to measure uh, changes in conflict uh, simply because by virtue of uh, reducing conflict, you're contributing to peace. And so what we're there to do is to build a data framework and analysis tool uh, for them to be able to monitor their contribution to peace. So how are you tracking humanitarian efforts? Like how do you get access to that kind of data? Yeah, so there's 17 odd data sources, you know, kind of across the board that are contributing to this. You've got a combination of kind of qualitative and quantitative data from a few different organizations. So it's not just the Swiss who are providing this data. Um, you've got data provided by donors such as the United Nations, um, you have emergency services on the ground. And what we need to do is effectively amalgamate these 17 odd data sources, find cross correlations in those data sources and use that to uh, determine the effectiveness of programs by the Swiss government on the ground in Somalia. So what is some of the most difficult aspects of collecting this data? Yeah, I mean with anything data kind of related, um, there are two kind of big, I guess, challenges. The first is, I guess, finding or creating some sort of consistency to the data. So, uh, you know, you kind of have data split into qualitative and quantitative data. Qualitative is more kind of subjective or opinion based. And then you've got quantitative data, which is numerical. And so what we first need to do is we need to synthesize all that data and create a effectively a uniform framework where all the data can be uh, analyzed. Um, so effectively getting it to the same standard. And then from there, uh, the challenge is then how do we cross correlate those data sets and find interrelationships that can then be used to kind of, I guess, determine the end outcome or to, you know, help, help to make decisions, um, you know, for, for the organization. So you obviously get a lot of access to information that other people don't really get to see. How do you cope on a human level with some of the information that you do receive? Yeah, uh, Rachel, it's pretty confronting. I think, you know, particularly when you um, run a software company like I do, you're exposed to, you know, we've worked with the banks and insurance companies here in Australia. Um, we've been exposed to very large data sets um, and very personal information as well. Um, I think it's very different when it's uh, data that's coming out of um, an area with such a high degree of conflict like Somalia. Um, instead of being exposed to what you would within, say, an insurance company, things like claims data, for instance, you know, with this, you're exposed to incident-related data. So, you know, what is happening on the ground? What emergencies are being reported? Uh, I think in particular for the first couple of weeks of the engagement when we were exposed to those data sets, it was quite confronting. Um, but at the end of the day, you do just have to kind of, you know, I guess, uh, I guess acknowledge that you need to, you know, you're brought in as an expert to solve 
uh, probably need to apply the same methodologies and patterns that you always have um, and try and desensitize yourself, you know, a little bit just so you can get the job done. Mm, absolutely. So how important is it for Station 5 to work within humanitarian projects, such as the project you were working with with the World Food Program? Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly fulfilling both for the organization and for me personally. Um, you know, the eagerness that we see from the team members when they're kind of put on a project like this is incredible. Um, and me personally as well. I mean, I think, I think when you're kind of young and growing up, you have these ambitions to work on, you know, humanitarian projects and to give back in a way. Um, to be able to do that at this stage in my career has been incredible. And for the team as well, the team that's working on the project, um, you know, they know it's high stakes. They know the impact of what they're going to be doing. Um, some team members have shied away from the project, whilst, whilst others have really taken the bull by the horns and have um, taken, the, uh, you know, taken the, the, the project and the challenge um, on, and that's been incredible. So you know, I'm excited to see how things kind of evolve, um, but the main thing is now making sure that we set up a strong support network for those team members and, um, and enable them moving forward to do what they're best at. And how important is it for you to use artificial intelligence and blockchain within your software? I think in, in the context of blockchain, there wouldn't really be any practical use case here. Um, we do, at Station 5, we do a bunch of kind of blockchain work. Um, and as you know, as you would know, that's, that's obviously going a bit crazy at the moment with NFTs and, and everything else. Um, AI though, artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, um, natural language processing and the like are critical here. So, you know, I mentioned before we need to take opinion-based data, qualitative data, and synthesize that and find a way to make it um, to quantify it effectively so we can cross correlate it with other data sets. That process is really um, a combination of natural language processing, which is taking kind of human speech and human text and synthesizing that into a quantitative form. And then further to that, it's using machine learning so that we can look at patterns in the way that an in, on an individual level, someone will re be reporting what's happening on the ground and how we can then look to synthesize multiple different opinions um, or subjective views into a consolidated view that can then be kind of married up with quantitative data sets as well. And what's your future view on the progress of Station 5? Where can you see the company going in the future? Look, I think, um, yeah, I, I haven't mentioned this, but I think over the last, uh, I guess, 18 or so months, we've grown from, you know, a team that midway through kind of first lockdown here in Australia was stagnant at about six or seven staff. And over the last 15 or 16 months has scaled up to north of 60 staff uh, full time um, across across all the different offices that we've got. Um, my view is, is to keep doing what we do, which is to do software development. Um, I don't want to expand into other verticals. I want to stay focused on one vertical, which is software de development and doing it day in, day out and very well, um, but to do it with more organizations. So service more startups and scale ups. And now that we've positioned ourselves to also be able to work in, in the kind of humanitarian lens when the project is run in an agile way, um, then we'd love to be doing more of that style of work as well. I think. As a whole, what we do best is run agile software development, which a lot of companies claim to do but don't do particularly well. And our lens is to work with organizations who are eager to take us on to, uh, to do that. And you obviously have a foot in many corners of the world. Well, it's been fantastic chatting with you today, Lambros. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for now. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. NFT creators like Beeple are taking the world of NFTs by storm. 
The digital landscape is already swarming with NFTs, whether they be e-trading cards, original tweets, or crypto gaming characters. But now, they're set to emerge from the digital realm and find a place in real life art galleries. And in this video, I'll break it all down for you. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. CryptoPunks and Bored Apes are set to be put on display in a Christie's or Sotheby's near you. As reported by Decrypt, different art galleries are displaying the NFTs in a unique manner, trying to grab maximum attention. The love affair between art galleries and NFTs, though, is actually not new. Art auction house Christie's earliest sold a Mike Winkleman, better known as Beeple Collage, for a whopping 69.3 million US dollars. Christie's also teamed up with the Andy Warhol Foundation to mint five non-fungible tokens from restored and preserved files of the artist's 1985 collection, Andy Warhol, Machine Made, which were recovered from floppy disks back in 2014. Now that sold for a combined total of 3.3 million US dollars. Sotheby's, on the other hand, conducted a week-long auction of Natively Digital, a curated NFT sale. Now this collection, which begun its sale on June 3, 2021, netted an astonishing $17.1 million and featured nearly 70% of new buyers. The new buyer stat in particular bodes well for the future of NFTs, indicating a broadening interest base. It's not just buyers though. NFTs have been gaining eyeballs from artists, both old and new, celebrities as well as corporate giants. Visa, Nike, the NBA have all made a sizable investment into the space. Celebrities like Lionel Messi, Tom Brady and the latest entrant, former NBA superstar Shaquille O'Neal are not shying away from trying their hands in the world of NFTs, whether as an investor, as a muse or otherwise. So ultimately, whether it be endorsements, inspirations or features in physical art galleries, the trend in NFTs is growing acceptance. As to what constitutes art is an unending debate. Many are still coming to grips with some of the pieces at Tasmania's Museum of Modern Art, but they'll have a whole new digital world to embrace now too as NFTs look set to stay and their acceptance by art galleries and exhibition houses is a testament to that fact. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please like, share, subscribe to the channel, drop us a comment about what other crypto related info you'd like us to break down, and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Wayne Patterson. Now Wayne is the CEO of Anteris. Anteris is a structural heart company creating the world's most durable heart valve. Here at Kalkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome, Wayne, to Kalkine. Good morning, Rachel. Thanks for having me. 
Good to speak with you today. Now, such a fascinating company. Firstly, could you introduce Anteris to our audience and tell us about the powerful work that you are doing? Sure, thank you. Yeah, look, we're, we're very proud of Anteris um, in what's been achieved in the last several years. But Anteris, as you mentioned, is a, a company in uh, a space known as a structural heart space. Predominantly, we treat a disease called aortic stenosis. This is quite a serious disease, um, uh, affects folks from their mid-60s and beyond. Um, and when this disease gets to the severe state, the mortality rate is about 50% after two years. Um, there, are, there are several products to, uh, to treat this particular condition, but the only way you can treat this condition is to actually go into the heart, take out or replace that aortic valve with a new one. There's no pharmacotherapy to treat this disease. Uh, and there are a couple of players with, uh, with older uh, products in the market. We've come at this with a completely different approach uh, to that market, and we believe, uh, as do the doctors we work if, with, that this is, in fact, a product that is very much needed right now for these younger patients who, who are starting off with this disease. Uh, when we've got some very unique and novel technologies that have been developed in Australia, uh, and we're very proud that uh, you know we probably have a technology here in Australian uh, design and built technology that will be a global product, uh, helping out thousands of patients around the world in the years ahead. Sounds absolutely life-saving there, Wayne. And can you tell us about the recent progress achieved by Anteras? Sure. So developing a medical product that goes into patients is obviously a, a long and arduous task, and, and, and certainly can be. I've spent most of my career uh, globally in healthcare. Um, the achievements, particularly in the last 12 months, have been significant. Uh, we have had um, a fantastic group of doctors working with us on our medical advisory board for the last several years. As we've transitioned from developing our, um, our ADAPT technology, which is where we started, into, a, into the world's first 3D aortic valve for, uh, for replacement by a catheter. Uh, that's a world first. Um, and getting that through the animal studies, of course, through all the design tech uh, briefs that we have to go through and into humans uh, is quite an achievement. Now, we are on the precipice as we speak of entering our first human studies uh, for this catheter-based valve, uh, and FDA approval of that study is, is imminent within the next quarter. That's great news. Now, as the world continues to battle the coronavirus pandemic, how has this escalated next generation technologies in the healthcare sector, do you believe? So I think, um, you know, the healthcare space all over the world um, has clearly been moving during the pandemic. Um, and observing from where I do, having spent my whole career in, in the global space. I've seen a lot of shift in investments, uh, both in and out in the last several years. Of course, companies who make vaccines or the promise of vaccines or diagnostics are getting a lot of, a lot of support, but not just those companies. In healthcare, there is a big shift towards digital healthcare, uh, telemedicine, uh, real hospital in the home kind of stuff that I see. And also, I think I've seen movements of capital away from companies who may have been on the market for many, many years, um, developing healthcare products and not quite getting there, and moving into more interesting uh, and, and very current companies that are developing things very quickly, such as Anteris. So the money's there, it's, it's happening a lot. The, the obvious choices of vaccine companies are getting a lot of attention, but I think also this whole shift away from being in person, not only in the workplace, but certainly uh, from a, a doctor point of view, is gonna really go up in the, in the next few years. And the digital health space is just booming right now. So with that being said, do you believe the pandemic has been a help or a hindrance for healthcare funding? I think it has generated a lot of funding um, simply because the demand and the need is there. Obviously, we have had hospitals, uh, certainly here in the US, but of course everywhere stretched to their, their breaking point uh, with, with caseload. Uh, we thought we were coming through that, then the Delta variant started to come in, of course, and that, that created more problems. So I think uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And because of that um, sheer volume drive on the hospital and on the whole healthcare system across the world, it's created new opportunities and new technologies. So I think it, it, it's been helpful in the fact that it's helped generate new ideas. Um, and those ideas uh, may have taken longer to come if we didn't have the pandemic. And I think a lot of them are good. And that's driven capital into these spaces to get those ideas to market as quickly as possible. There are obviously a lot of downsides to the pandemic, uh, too numerous to mention, but certainly it's driving innovation and creativity, uh, definitely in healthcare. 
Absolutely. Well, let's talk about product development now. When you are developing a product, what's one of the most important aspects that you have to keep in mind? Well, in the healthcare space, um, it's hands down clinical superiority. Uh, you want to be altruistic to the point that if your product is going to be superior to what's available, um, you know, help humanity if, if you like, um, then it's going to be profitable. And I think that's the way we look at it. Uh, my whole career, I've brought a lot of drugs to market globally. Um, you always have that perspective. There is obviously shareholders and there is a profit basis behind all of this. But if your product's not clinically superior, um, if you're not going to move the needle in your given space for us, aortic stenosis, uh, then there's no point in really doing that. And therefore, in our company particularly, we've got a lot of really incredibly creative technical people in the medical side, on the engineering side, and their sole purpose is to bring something to market that's better than what's already there, not a me too. Um, and in doing so, they're going to bring a solution that is uh, more valuable for the physicians and certainly more valuable for the patients, particularly uh, in our case, where we're bringing something very different. We're bringing a valve that actually brings these patients to a pre-disease state, um, it, which is not possible with the current products in the market. It doesn't bring you out of the disease. It just makes the symptoms a little bit better. Um, and not only that, it's a valve that seems to be lasting a whole lot longer than what the current alternatives are. Uh, because of its novel 3D unibody design. So that innovation is really going to end up driving clinical benefits, patient benefits, uh, and ultimately that will bring uh, returns and rewards for shareholders as well. And from the time you embarked on the journey to where you stand today, what do you believe has been the biggest achievement of Anteras? So I was fortunate when I was sitting on the board, um, we had a, a technology that was being utilized in a different area to where we are now. It's a very good technology, it's a global technology, and frankly most small companies aren't lucky enough to have this kind of big market technology, it's called ADAPT. Um, and we were operating in a space worth about $50 million of surgical repair. Now I believe the biggest achievement was when we divested some peripheral businesses and focused the company very much into the structural heart space and we took a, took a gamble on this taking that one technology and turning it into three or four different technologies that would move the game forward in this particular space and that gamble's paid off so I'm, I'm really proud of the technology that we had I'm proud that it's Australian uh, I'm proud of what the team has achieved and we're now you know we've gone through our animal work we've gone through with we've, we've implanted cadavers we've gone through the whole process of bringing it to market we've been in liaison with the FDA on our submissions um, and so we're about to go to humans uh, very, very shortly with this product. Um, and we know what the results generally going to be because it's been so thoroughly tested. Uh, and I think that's just a massive achievement. Um, you know, Australia has some great healthcare companies and I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that Anteris in the years ahead will be another one of those big, really good uh, Australian healthcare stories. Let's hope so. And just finally, Wayne, how do you envision the healthcare industry to innovate and expand in the upcoming years? Yeah, I look, as you know, populations get older, and this is something I contemplated again um, in the pharmaceutical space where I worked prior to this, um, you know, how do you deal with these aging populations? The shift in demographics uh, is something that I think has been front and center to the healthcare discussions uh, for many, many years. Um, I started my career in Australia in the healthcare space, uh, and Australia was in fact leading the world on discussions around health economics. So we're quite advanced down there and have been and I think what's really happening is this shift away from hospital-based care uh, where you can uh, obviously there's the necessity for hospital-based care for certain diseases uh, has been accelerating over the years and I think the innovation is really going to come from um, you know having people being able to be, have to be treated in their homes staying in their homes longer um, having the elderly um, stay out of uh, hospitals and nursing homes where possible through telemedicine and things we talked about before but also the therapeutics are improving quite a lot we're kind of in some cases shifting away from treating symptoms to actually presenting uh, cures um, which wasn't always the case with pharmacotherapy in the in the years 60s 70s and 80s a lot of what we brought to market was simply to treat the symptom uh, which of course is important but we, we weren't, there weren't that many cures um, and Enteris, I think, is a good example of that, uh, where we're in a space where the product we bring to market could actually potentially be a functional cure for this disease where there is not one at the moment. So you see a lot more of that, but I think the hospital in the home kind of setting is, is going to be the biggest shift that we see in the next decade or so, where it becomes really, truly viable 
that patients can actually be treated from the, uh, from the sanctity of their own lounge room. Well, it sounds fabulous. Thank you so much for the formidable work that you are doing there, Wayne, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate the time. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for now. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello and welcome to Calkine TV, I'm James Preston and this is the Early Trade Show where we take a look at how the early session has panned out. So let's get stuck in. Australian shares fell in the opening minutes of Thursday's trading session, dragging the S&P ASX 200 0.4% lower. The decline followed a 0.5% fall for US blue chips and were led by the energy sector which tumbled 1.9% followed by tech shares which were down by 1.3%. Energy shares fell after the price of oil weakened overnight, reflecting downward pressure across the commodities complex that also hit iron ore and gold. Financial institution ANZ saw its shares rise by 1.9% following better than expected profit results, while consumer goods retailer JB Hi-Fi had their shares easing by 2.9% and that was going up after disclosing September quarterly sales. Moving on, and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission says that the conclusion of its report into the closure of the Australian share market for a full day last November is now imminent. ASIC is investigating whether the Australian Securities Exchange met its licence obligations during the outage. ASIC Chairman Joe Longo told a Senate committee on Thursday that the ASX had been cooperating well with the investigation to date. Wednesday's higher than anticipated core consumer price index increase indicates that underlying inflation is more widespread than initially thought and adds pressure on the Reserve Bank of Australia to hasten its monetary tightening, according to ANZ. A sustained rise in consumer prices would compel the central bank to bring forward its rates guidance one year to 2023 and drop the yield curve control program that has anchored yields on three-year bonds maturing in April 2024 to 10 basis points. There's also a number of AGMs today for shareholders, including entertainment company Star Entertainment, mining and metals company South32, retailer JB Hi-Fi, travel agency corporate travel management, investment firm Challenger, plumbing supplier Reese, building and construction material supplier Boral, and salmon farming company Tassel Group. Additionally, quarterly reports are due from mining heavyweights Fortescue Metals and Newcrest, as well as nickel producer IGO and a host of smaller companies. Well, time now for a very short break on Calkine TV, and in just a moment, we'll take a look at today's newsmakers on the early trades. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Welcome back to the Early Trades on Calkine TV. I'm James Preston, and it's time now to take a look at today's newsmakers. 
Banking group ANZ has reported a full-year cash profit from continuing operations of $6.2 billion, beating consensus forecasts for a $6.06 billion result. Its profit was 65% better than a year ago, despite statutory operating income from continuing operations falling by 1%. The stronger profit result was driven by the partial reversal of COVID-19-related credit provisions. The bank said profits grew in Australia retail and commercial despite challenges with processing numerous home loans. Commercial real estate company Unibol Rodamico Westfield has noted an increase in activity across its properties led by the reopening of Europe that has reduced vacancy rates and improved the business outlook for the remainder of the year. Tenant sales across its continental European centres now sit at 92% of 2019 levels and vacancy rates across the business have improved from 8.3% last year to 7.9% in the September quarter. Iron ore shipments for mining heavyweight Fortescue Metals rose 3% to 45.6 million tonnes in the September quarter to mark a record high for the period. The company achieved average revenue of 118 US dollars per dry metric ton, around three quarters of the average price of the commodity according to the Platts 62% CFR index. Production guidance for the 2022 financial year remains unchanged and the company drew attention to its plans for renewable power and its net zero carbon emissions targets for 2040. Trading marketplace High Pages Group's revenue has risen in the first quarter of the new financial year despite COVID-19 lockdowns and restrictions affecting both Victoria and New South Wales. The company's total revenue was up 14% from a year ago, while recurring revenue rose 17%. Financial services provider IOOF suffered net investor redemptions from its financial advice and funds management units in the September quarter, although increases in fund holdings helped to push up overall assets under management and administration. Investors clawed back $1.4 billion in net outflows during the quarter, while market gains of $2 billion pushed overall funds under management to $98.3 billion. Funds under administration also edged $1.8 billion higher to $228, or should I say $222.8 billion, despite net outflows of $900 million, as market gains added $3.4 billion to the overall total. High vaccination rates and an earlier reopening of both New South Wales and Victoria has led the Commonwealth Bank to upgrade its forecast for the Australian economy and bring forward its rate hike expectations. The bank noted the exceptional take-up of the COVID-19 vaccine, that the labour market held up better than feared during lockdowns in both Victoria and New South Wales, and the reopening of the two states occurring ahead of schedule. Commonwealth Bank revised its 2021 GDP forecast from 3% to 3.5% and from 4% to 4.4% in 2022. It also expects unemployment to sit at 4.7% by the end of this year, down from its previous projection of 5.2%. Alright, well that's all for now. Our commentary and review of the early morning trading session is all done and dusted. Stay tuned to Kalkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
Welcome to the Expert Talks Executive Corner by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is from the world's largest holder of self-mined Bitcoin, Canadian Hut 8 Mining Company. And the guest today is Miss Sue Ennis, Vice President at Corporate Development, sorry, for Corporate Development and Head of Investor Relations at Hut 8. And with the market capitalization of Bitcoin now being close to 1.18 trillion, which is larger than Facebook's market capitalization, do we have an interesting show for you. So please keep watching till the end. And we bring you the industry leaders, business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And live today we have Ms. Sue Ennis, Vice President of Corporate Development and Head of Investor Relations. Welcome to the show, Sue. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today speaking with you guys. Well, it's great to meet you and thank you for making time for us amidst your busy schedule. So you are one of North America's largest and most innovative digital asset miners and you have the computing power to match according to what's on your website and that's an amazing position to be in after approximately just four years of trading. Also the first Canadian yeah. mining company to be listed on the TXS and NASDAQ. So what's that's the strategy? Right. So we are, yeah, so we are as you've said, and so very succinctly, so we're one of the oldest and the largest uh, Bitcoin miners uh, in the industry. And the reason why that matters and why that's something that we really focus on is the fact that we have weathered, obviously, the uptimes and the wonderful bull market cycles, but we've also weathered the uh, down market and bear market cycles that have come in the past with this asset class. And so accordingly, we take a balance sheet first approach to how we manage our business. Um, and that's effectively what's helped us what's helped us uh, keep the lights on during hard times and ultimately thrive during bull markets like we're in right now. Um, so we're one of the OG, you know, original hodlers in this space. That means that we've been mining and holding Bitcoin um, pretty consistently since inception um, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Uh, and right now we haven't sold a coin since the beginning of January. So as of our last reported date, we're at about 4,724 Bitcoin on our balance sheet. Um, we're also effectively three Bitcoin and blockchain based businesses in one trade. So we do self mining. We also have a white label hosting business um, and we also have a yield and revenue strategy on top of our health Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, that's Hut8 Mining in a nutshell. And we're based out of um, Alberta, Canada, which is effectively like the Kuwait of North America. So it's incredibly cold, uh, incredibly windy, incredibly dry, which is um, optimal conditions for mining because the machines do tend to run a little hot. Um, and we recently just stood up actually a third mining site uh, in northern Ontario in Canada. Again, very cold, um, very windy. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about what the future holds as, as Bitcoin continues to reach all time highs. So yeah. Absolutely. And it's a great time to connect with you at the moment. Not only have Bitcoin and Ethereum both set new all time highs this month, but Forecast News reported that Hut 8 CEO Jamie Laverton announced the purchase of 12,000 new micro BT mining rigs, amounting to close to 58.7 million US dollars, which will be arriving at a rate of 1,000 rigs a month starting January. So that's big news just in this week. Um, and there have been some big changes to Bitcoin's hash rate earlier this year due to China's regulations partly. How does Hut8 navigate the geopolitical factors that impact the crypto sector? Yeah, so, so we definitely, you know, the geopolitical climate is certainly something we think about, you know, when we're deciding where are we going to grow next? What's our next move in terms of setting up operations and where we're building partnerships? Um, so um, Canada right now is incredibly favorable um, to the to the crypto space. Um, we ask, we actually also have a head of regulatory. Uh, her name is Tanya Woods, and she's an absolute badass lawyer uh, who was pretty instrumental in drafting some of the preliminary blockchain laws in Canada. Um, so we take building relationships with governments and regulators very seriously um, uh, because, you know, we think that that is paramount to making sure that there's thoughtful innovation within a regulatory framework happening in Canada. Um, so, so yeah, we're very cognizant as to sort of what the regulators are thinking and feeling. And we sort of are, you know, that is part of the, our decision-making um, 
strategy when we are deciding where we're going to go next uh, in terms of our business growth. Um, and I will say that one of the things we do love about Alberta is it is traditionally an oil and gas province. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's like it's like the Kuwait of North America. It's incredibly rich in resources. So so we have an incredibly accommodative government there uh, who you know is very welcoming to the jobs that we bring, the income that we bring, um, and understands sort of the, the resources space. So. So yeah, that's a little overview of how, how we look at it. Yes, um, certainly is very wealthy part of the world, Alberta, Canada. So um, at the moment, uh, Texas has been opening its doors to the displaced crypto miners from China. And is it the cost of electricity in Texas that's making mining there more attractive? How does power consumption impact the miners' earnings, please? Yeah, so so it is absolutely pretty much the number one cost of doing business. Um, and so Texas is rife in um, not only oil and natural gas, but also in solar and wind energy. So it, it is a really interesting place. Um, and it makes a lot of sense why people would be setting up shop there. Um, Ted Cruz, uh, I believe, who is the, the main government, the, sorry, one the governor of Texas, is also incredibly pro-crypto and pro-innovation um, in Texas, which is wonderful. That's what you know we want and what we need in this industry in order to ensure that we can thrive and survive and continue to innovate and prosper. Um, so I really think, yeah, it is a combination of the wind um, and the solar power there and um, also just, just the way that their energy markets are made up. Um, what we love, though, about where we are in Alberta and Ontario is that um, we do have a mix of a little bit of solar and wind, but also um, natural gas and our third site is actually behind the fence so it's we negotiated a rate of less than three cents canadian all inclusive and that's one of the lowest rates in the western hemisphere and it's behind the fence which is again having control over the number one input of doing business aka being able to do business um, and in the case of mining have competitive power at your disposal is incredibly important um, so we're, we're pretty excited and the timing for our third site going up at this price point it's an extra 100 megawatts at le less than three thousand sorry less than three cents canadian uh per kilowatt hour uh is is a very big deal and very instrumental in terms of us being able to mine at the lowest cost possible and then obviously you know uh hodl and um you know, maintain substantial profit margins. Well, it's great to hear that the crypto industry is is being able to integrate with the regulators, with the government. I mean, it sounds like renewable resources uh, to power your energy is is extremely important to your company, Hut8. And also, I've noticed that a lot of the crypto um, exchanges are working with regulators as well to fight against cybercrime and, and share their insights in relation to how the process works with the regulators, which is, is fantastic to hear as well. And Ethereum 2.0 mm -hmm. is nearing with the transition of Beacon Chain and Bitcoin's taproot will be occurring soon. How are these uh, going to impact the mining operations at HUD8, please? Yeah, so back in, um, I believe it was April, we made a strategic decision to you know we will always be core bitcoin miners but um we made a strategic decision to also move into ethereum mining and so we were actually one of three customers globally who was able to um, obtain a limited fleet of gpu miners from nvidia uh, and the strategy right now is um, we're going to be mining ethereum but then get be, um, get paid out in Bitcoin on the pool level at a price of less than $3,000 Canadian per Bitcoin. So we're really excited about that. Um, these are cutting edge, edge GPUs. It was a limited fleet, a limited run um, that NVIDIA put out. Again, like I mentioned, we were one of only three global customers who were able to get our hands on this on this particular fleet. So it's, it's like the Ferrari of GPU miners. Um, and before, you know, deciding on this purchase we modeled it as though and with the assumption that ethereum would be moving from proof of work to proof of stake within the year so this is back in april may um and you know what we've been hearing from on the ground and actually what was recently announced is that the the, the next decision um you know they initially were hoping to go proof of stake for january but um it's actually now been pushed to at least may um and so even the way that we've modeled it uh it still made economic sense for us to make this pivot and pivot into this this particular um 
uh, realm of digital asset mining. You know, another thing that we really like about it is let's just say proof of stake, um, you know, does come to fruition in the next six months. Um, we are in a position that we can just simply pivot and mine the next most profitable proof of work GPU based coin. Um, but, you know, another thing that's really exciting is is the fact that you know there is also potential case that we do look at instead of you know mining ethereum and then getting paid out in bitcoin on the pool level at less than three thousand dollars canadian per coin maybe we do look at potentially hodling at the beginning of january and you know uh looking at a hodl strategy so that we can play in the incredibly exciting decentralized finance space that has a little bit over i think 65 billion in locked value at the moment um and some of these really interesting um, you know, DeFi environments, yield farming protocols that, that are continuing to thrive. Um, our head of technology, uh, Jason Zalewski, is also a staking yield farming DeFi master. So he was also very instrumental um, in this decision for us to pivot uh, as well uh, and complement our business operations um, into Ethereum mining. So um, that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but uh, yeah, we're we're really excited about the opportunity in the space. Um, and even if it moves to proof of stake, we can still, you know, feel very confident about uh, Ethereum is absolutely here to stay. And um, if anything, it will be incredibly bullish for other altcoins. We think so. Absolutely, absolutely. In a, in a segue to what you've just said, I think Thorchain seeing some surging in its price because of that very factor of some of the decentralized yeah. finance um, protocols that it operates within. And yeah. there's going to be a lot of staked ether that's going to be released um, when Beacon Chain goes live. And, and they've been talking about that for about four years now. And you've just told us that that's going to be further delayed till perhaps May next year. So that's very interesting. Thanks for that information. Yeah, I think the, the, hard, the hard part is that um, this decision to move from proof of work to proof of stake isn't so much a technological challenge for the for the community, and it's the number two used digital asset in the world. It's it's captured a tremendous amount of market share and ideas and innovation and and is, is doing incredible things for the for just the proliferation of, of this industry in general. Um, but so it's, it's not so much of a technology, a technological challenge, but it's more so a governance challenge as well, is that, you know, the community needs to to have consensus in order for this to to move forward. Um, so I, I think it I think it is still a little bit of ways off um, before it actually does happen. And again, we, right. we just got noticed that it's been pushed to May. So it'll be interesting right. to see see where it goes. But I certainly do not see a world where Ethereum is ever going away. No. And it'll be interesting to see what the regulators say as well about the liquidity pools. I think they're still deciding about definitions surrounding that and how it relates to dark pools in the regular fiat mm -hmm. markets as well. So, yes, definitely a space to watch. So having one of the largest mining operations and cutting edge technology, how does Hut 8's infrastructure allow them to minimize their carbon footprint? You've mentioned it a little about the renewable resources. Would you mind elaborating? Yeah, absolutely. So we are grid connected in Alberta. Um, so we've got two sites in Alberta, 109 megawatts in production, and then we have a third site coming up that's an extra 100 megawatts of production out of northern Ontario. So in Alberta, um, both of our sites are grid connected. One of them is directly connected to the grid in Medicine Hat, and then the other one, the other site is connected to the grid out of Alberta, which is a mix of about 25% solar and wind. Um, and then this third site is really interesting because we will be um, uh, recycling some of the waste heat to actually melt some of the snow around um, the actual mining operation itself. And um, we, we also have undertaken quite a few um, ESG initiatives and we will be telling the market more about that. But things like, for example, electrifying our vehicles on the ground, um, partnering with a, um, a company that um, instead of uh, our, the styrofoam that comes off of a lot of the mining equipment that we receive, instead of that going directly to a landfill, we've instead partnered with a company that will compress that styrofoam and then actually resell it into the market. So looking at ways to also reduce our landfill footprint. And then ultimately, though, um, you know, looking at a carbon neutral strategy. So, for example, this third site that we have coming up in, in um, 
Northern Ontario and Canada is going to be carbon neutral by 2023. So those are just sort of high level, some of the things that we're looking at um, from an ESG perspective. And again, we really do consider the environment a stakeholder and a shareholder in our business. Um, and so being incredibly thoughtful about that footprint is something that we're incredibly committed to. And we'll certainly be updating the market more about that uh, moving oh, well, forward. Congratulations. That sounds like a fantastic strategy and adding to the circular economy sounds great. Um, do you think the GPU supply chain crunch will have an impact on your operations? You mentioned that you've got in there with um, some of the fastest GPU processes available, um, but how do you think it's going to impact in the long run? Yeah, so there certainly is um, a supply chain constraint just across the board for, for everyone, um, and obviously not just exclusive to the mining space. Um, it's it's really happening everywhere uh, across multiple industries. Um, but one of the things that we have done um, to at least sort of mitigate for that is we actually have strengthened our relationship with MicroBT that is one of the um, largest suppliers of mining manufacturing equipment. So we are now um, the only authorized MicroBT repair shop in Canada. And so what that means is that uh, we will be uh, servicing uh, other miners and MicroBT equipment in North America and also Northern Europe. And ultimately what that means is that we do have um, more access to parts and machine parts at cost. We are a little bit closer to that supply chain. Um, you know, we do have an incredible relationship and we absolutely love our friends at MicroBT. So, so, so being strategic in terms of how we positioned ourselves to be a little bit closer to that supply chain has certainly helped us. Um, and, you know, just in general, being incredibly creative and, and looking at how many different ways can we possibly diversify this business and earn as much, um, uh, multiple different avenues of ancillary revenue so that we can continue to be core Bitcoin miners uh, has also been a priority for us as well. And um, yeah, we're, you know, we do think the future is bright and that the supply chain uh, situations will resolve it. This, that's, you know, it, it does take a little bit of creative sort of planning though at the moment. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for connecting with us today, because although the crypto um, sector is emerging to the mainstream, to a lot of people, there still exists a massive gulf. And uh, sharing your uh, insights today has really helped to raise awareness about the ins and outs of operating a Bitcoin mining company. So thank you so much. Really do appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for making time for the show. And if you've just joined us, we have just had a very informative discussion with Ms. Sue Ennis, Vice President of Corporate Development and Investor Relations at Hard 8 Mining. Please watch the full interview on YouTube at Calkine Media and stay watching for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Morning pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals 
In terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With Season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, Season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell, and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend, even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkheim by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkheimmedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkheim. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? 
Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Saudi Arabian energy giant Saudi Aramco has set its net zero emissions target to 2060. On Saturday, Aramco chief Amin Nasser declared that the energy major aims to reduce emissions from operations by 2050. The news was shared at the Saudi Green Initiative Summit following the Kingdom's declaration to achieve zero carbon emissions by 2060. With this move, Saudi Arabia, the world's top crude oil exporter, is joining the global drive to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. The move from the Gulf Arab state is an aim to achieve net zero emissions overall by 2060. So what inspired Aramco's zero emissions target? In May, the world's topmost energy organisation, the International Energy Agency, had chosen 2050 as its net zero target year. It even asked energy investors to stop funding new conventional energy supply projects like oil, gas and coal beyond the target year. The 2021 UN Climate Summit is also lined up for the end of October and the IEA wants investment in renewable energy to triple by the end of this decade. As the world hopes to fight climate change and keep energy market volatility under control, the world's top oil producer, Saudi Arabia, has joined over 100 countries in the global effort to curb climate change. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman made his remarks about the Kingdom's climate move at its first ever Saudi Green Initiative Forum. It comes just a week before the global COP26 climate conference, which is being held in Glasgow, Scotland. The Kingdom is taking over a so-called carbon circular economy approach for itself. However, oil and gas exports form the backbone of its economy, so the efforts do not impact its continued aggressive investment into fuel exporting. The UAE has also not announced specifics on how it will reach this target, but it does aim to work with the energy, economy and industry and other sectors to achieve the net zero target by 2050, but more likely 2060. As for Aramco, Saudi Arabia's energy major, it feels that the global spare capacity of crude is reducing fast and there is a need for more investment. It still believes that demonizing the hydrocarbon industry will be counterproductive to stable energy supplies worldwide. However, the investment in gas would allow Aramco to eliminate major liquid burning and emissions for the kingdom. So to sum it all up, Aramco is seeking the support of global economies to ensure adequate crude spare capacity as the world emerges from COVID-19, as they, along with Saudi Arabia, focus on a reduction in their emissions to help bring them into line with the rest of the world. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. 
Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. South African cricketer Quinton de Kock has sensationally withdrawn from the T20 World Cup following his decision not to kneel before yesterday's game against the West Indies. De Kock's refusal to kneel was at odds with direct orders from Cricket South Africa or the CSA. The Proteas comfortably beat the West Indies by 8 wickets, reaching the target of 144 runs. However, sadly this win was overshadowed by the news of de Kock exiting the tournament under controversial circumstances. CSA have revealed that the 28-year-old's decision not to take a knee was the reason for his withdrawal from yesterday's game, as well as his departure from the T20 World Cup tournament. A statement from the CSA said that the CSA board on Monday had directed the South African players to take a knee in a united and consistent stance against racism prior to the game. In other words, this was a mandatory order from the CSA. The CSA further explained the order to kneel before the game was a global gesture against racism which has been adopted by sports people across different sporting codes as they recognise the power of sport to bring people together. De Kock, who is one of the most talented players in world cricket, has previously refused to take a knee before a game and in June said that he has his own personal opinions for not participating and that those opinions are essentially nobody else's business. The tragic thing about this situation is that there are people who will now assume that de Kock's refusal to participate in this forced gesture is based on a refusal to reject racism. In other words, there are those that will now assume that he is a racist because he did not take a knee before the game. Moreover, the fact that Quinton de Kock is a South African player particularly makes this more conscious chequered history of apartheid. The simple fact is, you cannot force a moral or social stance. CSA is at fault here for making that gesture mandatory. Therefore, CSA has done more to create division than it has to actually bring people together. Furthermore, if an official organisation is going to force a moral stance, then where is the consistency? Two nights ago, Pakistan defeated India for the first time in a World Cup T20. The history of Pakistan and India is particularly fraught with violence and ill feeling and cricket matches between the two nations are always passionately supported by the respective fans. But at no point has either cricket board ever forced their respective players to make any sort of gesture or display an attempt to dissolve any geopolitical tension. It's the game of cricket itself that transcends any issue related to race, colour and creed. This is what sporting bodies around the world just don't seem to understand. Forcing social, racial, political or moral positions is a terrible idea. If any gestures are to be made, they should be made through altruism, that is, by the player's own decisions. Any imposed moral position is completely meaningless and does more to divide than it does to unite. In the aftermath of the South African superstar's dramatic exit, Indian commentator Harsha Bogal released a disturbing tweet to his 8.6 million followers saying he would not be surprised if de Kock never plays for South Africa again. If this were to be the case, it would be a loss for world cricket caused by the mistake of, once again, forcing a mixture of sports and politics. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine.
you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving, Ningalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugongs, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off the grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysonet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. 
whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to the Expert Talks Executive Corner by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Nitin Dashpande, Sales and Operations, Country Head of Katonic. And Katonic ML Ops platform is a collaborative platform with unified UI to manage all data science in one place. It is for customers and developers to introduce the ML Ops practice into their production systems. And for those that are new to this term, ML Ops is a set of practices that combines the creative scientific process of data scientists with the professional software engineering process to build and deploy machine learning models into production safely, quickly and sustainably. And we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. Bringing you live today, we have Mr. Nithin Deshpande, Sales and Operations Country Head of Katonic. Welcome to the show, Nithin. Thank you very much and I appreciate inviting us to this particular tech show. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, we can get into the interview. Our Thank tech, you. Tech talk. Thank you. Yes, let's get started now. Artificial intelligence has tremendous power to transform organizations. However, those possibilities can only be realized after ML models are deployed into production and there are thousands of organizations with great potential that are yet to embed ML models. So what advice would you like to give such organizations? Yeah, so uh, if you look at the ML models, ML models are the combination of data and code and each organization has a lot of data which is cold but it is in a messy condition. Uh, the data is there all over the place within the internal uh, business systems, IT systems, and it is outside the system which is in the social media platform. Moreover, the data is growing exponentially. It is becoming increasingly diverse and uh, it is faced through new data sources and is being used and analyzed by many people. So organizations are looking at extracting the value from the data. So our organization therefore need to start with uh, data insights or analytics platform that could scale up with minimal efforts. They need faster business insights through an archi architecture which enables a rapid build of an agile, scalable analytics capability. And they need to set up a governance and compliance mechanism in a unified way to secure, monitor and manage access to the data. So the next step to move, the, move up the value chain is to infuse data and AI models into ML platform. And the only way to do this is to have your own AI to differentiate uh, yourself with respect to the competitors. Rather than, give, rather than giving this data to any third party uh, uh, service provider who may, there is a possibility that he may give it to your competitors. So at Econic, what we have done is we have built a unified platform which can do both. It can do business IQ intelligence uh, and provide the analytics uh, insights to you as well as ML ops capability to provide inference, inferences and predictions. Right. It's, it sounds like such a step forward into the future because a lot of these high level theoretical um, ideas that seem good in theory sometimes don't apply so well 
to the practical world. So it's great to hear that Catonic has something in motion there. Thank you for sharing that. And Gartner reported that 85% of AI models don't make it to production. Additionally, according to a 2021 study from Algorithmia, the average deployment time for models that make it into production is about 18 months. So as per yourself working for Catonic, what, from your experience, what could you see as a reasoning behind this, please? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. And uh, in fact, uh, unfortunately, this is a reality. Uh, because AI is hard while taking ML data into production. And uh, therefore, there are, uh, there are many reasons. But I see there are four reasons as to why ML models do not see a light at the end of the tunnel. The first and foremost thing is that there is a general perception in the organization that machine learning is all about machine learning code. And most of the organizations, what they do is they engage data scientists to build the data model, experiment with the data models, take the best model out of it. And then uh, the data scientists come out with the inference. We he creates a beautiful dashboard, which organization says, yes, this is what we wanted. But when they take into production, they fail. Uh, and the main reason is that the ML code is a very tiny part or a small part of the entire data science process because it requires a lot of activities preceding the ML model uh, experimentation or training of the ML model and subsequent activities. And these activities are not the end goal. The monitoring is not the end goal. So you need to perform these activities right from your data extraction from various sources, entity resolution, data transformation, data cleaning, creating the features out of that data. And this particular aspect is uh, is neglected by most of the organizations. So that is the first reason. The second reason is on the AI, because AI is a combination of data and code. For example, if I give you a Windows 8 software and if you load it on your existing or the latest uh, laptop which you have, it will work. But uh, as uh, data, uh, uh, data changes with respect to the time as, as well as with respect to the uh, 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 additional data sets or respect to the geography, then your model also uh, changes and there is a drift in the performance. You need to continuously monitor, retrain the model and redeploy the model. Now this particular cycle is sometimes very complex and then this aspect is generally missed while designing the platform. The third reason is that ML lifecycle has got uh, many uh, roles. So there are data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers, then you have DevOps engineers, IT operations team. And then there has to be a, a, a smooth handover from one role to another role. And generally what we have found that the data scientists who build the model, they do this entire uh, building operation in an isolated manner. And then they throw this particular work to the next role, which is ML ops, who then take this model into production and this often results in, uh, uh, in results in writing the models as well as there is an awkward handshake which happens which makes the process more difficult and error prone. Uh, the, the fourth thing is basically the AI requires a lot of tools to be integrated because I have mentioned that there are a lot of preceding activities before the ML model training and taking into production and testing it out as well as the subsequent activities and, and each of these requires a lot of tools to do the work. And so what you need to do is you need to integrate all these tools on a, on, a, on a platform which can work seamlessly and then you are able to build a, a monitoring and management layer as well as a governance layer on top of it as well as security feature which is wrapped around it. Now all this takes, uh, all this takes time, money and it is very complex. And then uh, it becomes very difficult for the organization to sustain the program and they burn a lot of money and then the program is called off. So that is the fourth uh, reason why the uh, models do not make into the production. Now what we have seen in the IBC or Gartner, they say that there are only 6% of the organizations who have built this kind of uh, platform where they have invested time, they have invested money and they have seen that they have the right tools, right uh, people, right uh, resources, right governance mechanism, right security features so that they are able to do the entire data science process uh, end to end seamlessly. 
Wow, you've really told us so much in just that one to two minute answer. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Now, the AI industry is set to boom in about four or five years. They're expecting trillions of dollars to be invested into the development of AI and for it to emerge further into the mainstream through industry. Um, just off the main discussion, do you think that blockchain will help um, AI and Catonic do what they are planning to do? Is there any chance that you will move on to the blockchain with your operations? Uh, in fact, uh, my CEO, uh, Mr. Prem Narayan Das, in fact, he has in fact implemented one of the largest or uh, the uh, big, uh, big uh, blockchain program for one of the bank in Australia, Commonwealth Bank of Australia. This program was almost around one year, uh, one year where uh, the program was awarded. So definitely, Catonic, uh, we would like to focus on to see how we can embed blockchain into our AI ML journey because we have all the platform, but we would definitely like to look at the other technology which we can integrate with our platform. Okay, thank you so much. Back to the main discussion. To solve the challenges of AI, the practice of MLOps has been introduced over the last two to three years. Could you talk about, in more detail, uh, the growth prospects that MLOps have achieved in these past two to three years? The practical practice across the application into the golden era of machine learning with increasing day by day across all the customer segments. So ML Ops has evolved into an independent approach to ML lifecycle management. In short, ML Ops, if I uh, put it, it is equal to uh, machine learning plus DevOps plus data engineering. So in our IT parlance, we put it as it is CI plus CD, CI continuous integration, continuous development, continuous monitoring and continuous training. So in last two to three years, uh, if you look at it, the ML ops has gone through three stages of transformation. The first stage has been entry level model training and manual deployment. The second is automated triggering of ML model. And the third stage has been the ML automation using continuous monitoring, retraining and redeployment into production environment. And according to the IDC report, the compounded annual growth rate, CAGR, in last five years in the ML ops area has been around 23%. And by 2027, it is expected to grow by more than 30%. Well, wow, thank you. It's, it's growing at a very rapid pace. So hopefully the deployment is uh, quite intuitive and an easy process and not too involved. Seems like it would be quite um, involved and technical, however. Um, using ML Ops to effectively manage and govern the AI lifecycle from Scott on YouTube via Calkine Media and more of the expert talks and live market updates and say stay apprised and invest wisely. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Calkine TV. The troubles in Victoria by now have been well documented. Whilst COVID-19 is causing problems, the real virus is increasingly that of the Daniel Andrews government. 
ruling with a hand over fist mentality that includes weaponizing the police force against citizens, mandating vaccines for millions, and as it now turns out, barring members of parliament from entering the Victorian chamber. One of those politicians who has been banned from entry into Parliament is Legislative Council Representative Tim Quilty from the Liberal Democrats, and he joins me live now on Calkine TV. Tim, welcome to the show. Tim, unfortunately, we haven't got your microphone uh, live now. If there's any way that you can fix that for us, that would be fantastic. We're not hearing you coming through. What we'll do, Tim, is we'll go to a very quick break and we'll just try and sort out this audio issue. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Can you hear me now? No. I can't hear you either. Don't know. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? 
Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hi there, I'm Rose Jacobs and I'm here with you for Calkine. Today we're going to look at NASA's shared update on the launch of Artemis 1. But first, make sure you press that bell icon for all the latest updates right here. NASA's plan to launch the test flight of Artemis 1 have been shifted to February 2022, according to the Space Agency. The uncrewed lunar mission is the ambitious program of NASA to return humans to the moon. It was initially programmed for the end of this year in November. However, the timeline has slipped due to a few factors such as the pandemic and Hurricane Ida, as well as a few other storms and factors. On the 22nd of October, NASA officials stated that if all the tests go well as per the plan, then after that the launch window will open around the moon. The uncrewed Orion spacecraft will be launched atop the space launch system and the flight will reach the moon. And not only that, it will travel beyond it. It will cover the distance that has never been covered while carrying humans. After the completion of the flight, the Orion will splash down in the Pacific Ocean. On Wednesday, a major milestone has been achieved by the agency as it reported the completion of stacking of Orion spacecraft atop its SLS mega rocket. NASA highlighted that a person of color and a woman will be the first ones to make the flight. The launch window in February 2022 will open on the 12th and close on the 27th. The next launch window will open in March and after that in April. The launch periods are predicted based on Earth's relative position and orbital mechanism. For performing technology demonstrations and experiments, small satellites such as CubeSats will be deployed. If everything goes as per the schedule, then Artemis 2 will be launched in 2023 and Artemis 3 in 2024. So what is a space launch system? Well, a space launch system is Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. The troubles in Victoria by now have been well documented. Whilst COVID-19 is causing problems, the real virus increasingly is that of the Daniel Andrews government. 
Ruling with a hand over fist mentality that includes weaponizing the police force against citizens, mandating vaccines for millions, and as it now turns out, barring members of parliament from entering the Victorian chamber. One of those politicians who has been banned from entry into parliament is Legislative Council Representative Tim Quilty from the Liberal Democrats, and he joins me live now on Calkine TV. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Hopefully you're hearing me this time. Tim, got you loud and clear. Now, look, you're one of the members of the Parliament yes. in Exile at the moment. Can you explain what that is and why you're a part of it? OK, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Andrews government brought in rules to say that uh, all members of Parliament would have to show their vaccine passports in order to participate in the Parliament. Um, it's because, and because they're doing this to everyone else in Victoria as well, they decided to make some special rules for them as well. Um, David and I refused to show our papers because we don't believe in the vaccine. We think it's a uh, gross violation of human rights of Victorians. Um, we, we we're we both vaccinated. We could easily show our papers and turn up, but we refused to do that, so we got kicked out of the parliament. Um, we called it the, a, a purge. Um, they kicked MPs out of parliament. What's left is a rump parliament. Last time this happened in a West, Westminster democracy was back in 1648 when Cromwell... Uh, so he could get a remaining rump that would vote for him, support for him being the king um, when he went on to become dictator of uh, England. Um, so a shocking thing that they've done, they've upturned hundreds of centuries of press, parliamentary precedent to do it, um, but we didn't buckle under it, so we have set up a rebel parliament or parliament in exile in a basement in a nightclub in Melbourne, <laughs> um, and we've been conducting parliament from here for the last week. Now, I understand as well that whilst you have got your separate parliament set up there, it now doesn't actually allow you to vote on parliamentary issues. How can that possibly be the case, given you are still an elected representative? Yeah, well, exactly. This is the whole problem with it. Um, because te technically under the Constitution, you can't vote unless you're at the parliament. And then by passing this, this rule that barred us from accessing the parliament, they took our vote away. Um, and right when they were introducing their uh, permanent pandemic legislation mm. power that's going to use the power to extend this state of emergency in depth um, or that their motivation was to get rid of our voices and um, to get rid of our vote and make it easier for them to push well, let's touch on that right now, because obviously this is the big talking point at the moment, is the fact that it's, it's pretty intense legislation that's being pushed forward. Typically what we've seen is a state of emergency that just seems to be constantly rolled over despite the current scenario that Victoria is experiencing. This would obviously give somewhat unprecedented powers. We're having people like yourself who can't vote on it. Do you now know what is actually included in it? Because it's been very much a document of secrecy. Oh, absolutely. They, they've been working on this bill for months, but... Uh, that didn't show it to any MP. In fact, the official government line was uh, MPs didn't deserve to see it. We weren't uh, supporting the government, so we had no right to see it, the legislation. It finally got out this week. Uh, it was leaked to the media first, who then passed it on to MPs. Um, so we finally got to see it. Um, parts of it are not terrible. They've, they've sort of half included the things we've been calling for, during of emergency, more transparency, and so on. Um, revealing the advice to you for it. Um, but they could have done that anyway without this new legislation. Mm. Uh, they're making it uh, just indefinite. Uh, the Premier's giving all the power to the Premier to make it go on and using uh, severe penalties. So it'll be up to two years in prison for anyone who knowing breaks a, a mandate. Um, so if you're outside without your mask on and they decide that was a particularly bad not mask wearing event um they could throw you in prison for two years it's shocking it's crazy stuff especially when you consider daniel andrews was recently of course found in public twice without a mask on i would love to see whether he would also potentially face the wrath of two years imprisonment for his own laws but um well, quite interesting there as well, Tim. I mean, you mentioned that some elements of it are fine, but there's also the, the subject of uh, potentially a $90,000 fine, for example, of trying to use uh, a fake COVID passport or, or things like that. Uh, typically as well, I mean, you mentioned there too that you haven't been able to see, you had to get a leaked copy from the media. Usually there's about a month of consultation period. Why is this one so shrouded in mystery? Is there a concern about 
the entirety of the bill in that sense that there were things that he doesn't want seen in order to be assessed further? You've got to assume that was behind it. They didn't want um, public opinion to build up against it. Uh, so the bill is going through the lower house today and we're assuming it won't come to the upper house um, until a couple of weeks' time. So there will be a little bit of time to review it. But there's been very little concession. In the, uh, they've, they've kept it all shrouded uh, because I, we can only presume because they didn't want anyone to push it. Um, it's just not the way things are normally done. Uh, and there's no need for it now. The, basically over. They got the vaccination rates up over 90%. Mm. Um, the crisis is over. It's time to go back to normal life. But um, Andrews doesn't want to do that. He wants to keep it rolling. He wants to keep his powers. Yeah. More lockdowns, uh, more vaccine mandates. Um, why? Now, for those who aren't living or watching from Victoria, uh, is there actually an election on the way? I thought there might have been one coming in November at some point in time. Is that this year, next year? When, when does that happen for the uh, Next the year. State? So it'll be, be November 2022. So it's just over well, 13 months off. Right, okay, um, okay. So this so is going to be got, something that's still in place for some time then, if, uh, if yeah. it does indeed get and out. You've got to assume that um, he's trying to extend the emergency way through into uh, election, so that he can, he can still be an emergency premier, um, because I see no other reason for doing this. Well, Tim, the most bizarre part to me at present is that unvaccinated people at the moment in Victoria, they can actually go to a retail outlet, yet when the state hits 90% of double dosage, presumably it, it should be a safer state, according to how this all works, but they'll then have those freedoms revoked. What have the discussions been around surrounding that decision, and does it have any correlation with science at all in that respect? Uh, it's, it's the science, yeah. Um, <laughs> what it really is, is uh, the law, or the current emergency uh, if someone takes that to court, it'll probably be ruled illegal because it's not uh, proportionate. Um, but under the new powers, have by that date in November, um, they'll be able to do whatever they like. So that, the reason they've postponed it is not the science or anything else. It's just because under the new laws, it'll be legal. And under the current laws, it probably won't. Right, okay. Well, look, Daniel Andrews has also recently stated that unvaccinated individuals will not be allowed to participate in regular Victorian life until potentially 2023. I mean, a full, more than a year from now. Presumably, Victoria hits their 90% vaccination rate of the double dose by the end of this year. Why is that the decision then, if we're looking at potentially a year post double 90%? Um. Don't ask me. It's insane. It's it's utterly insane. Um, it makes no sense. Um, Andrews is angry that people defying his will, um, and he's trying to force everyone to it, into it. Uh, I can't tell you more than that. It, it does not make sense. There is no science behind it. It's just um, Andrews' iron will to power, uh, uh, trying to force it on everyone. Has there been any consultation process with the likes of the Liberal Democrats or other parties, or is it just within the Andrews circle creating these things? Uh, we, we certainly haven't been consulted about it, um, and that the three crossbenchers who supported it, um, mm. the previous state of emergency extensions, were involved in negotiations, although some of them claim they weren't, or they say they were and they weren't, we don't know what the picture is there, but certainly the opposition and the rest of the crossbench have had no consultation on it, and I think, don't think it's been very, very much consultation outside of the parliament either. We had a... Victorian Bar Association came out yesterday slamming it um, and the fact that there's been no consultation that their government said they were consulted them but all they did was a 45 minute uh, Teams uh, meeting with them which they discussed almost nothing about the bill. Um, yeah, no consultation whatsoever. And Tim, who were those three crossbenchers that were approached? So we know um, on the last two states of emergency extensions um, we had the, the Greens, um, uh, Animal Justice, Andy Medic, and the Reason Party, uh, you know, uh, so those three M MPs are the ones that were involved in and they got a briefing on Monday from the government, and we did that time or not, um, and it seems likely that they will be the ones that support it again, I think, supporting this. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of them haven't made public yet. 
Now, just for those who might be tuning in a little late to this interview, can you, one, if you're willing to do so, uh, declare what your vaccination status is and whether you believe people should be vaccinated? We know that you certainly not agreed to uh, provide uh, vaccinated or unvaccinated and, and yourself, of course. So I'm vaccinated um, and I'm really mm. choice. what um, choice. These things shouldn't be forced by the government. So people have the right to choose not to be vaccinated. Kalkai Media. I'm James Preston, signing off for now. James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mo Hamduna. Mo is the founder of MoWorks. MoWorks is a full service independent creative agency. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello, Mo. Good to speak with you today. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. No problem. Very interested to hear more about Mo Works. So, could you explain for our audience a little bit more about what you do? Sure. So, um, we run an agency here. We, we're based in Docklands. We work with our clients um, in three, uh, three key aspects. We work with the clients who potentially uh, utilize some form of a digital product as part of their solution. Uh, so, either uh, an application, a web app, an e-commerce, or uh, a SaaS product. Um, and then we help with them. We work with them on uh, aspect of the, the brand itself, uh, building uh, the strategy behind it, then the design and development or the innovation aspect of the product itself, and then helping uh, take it to, to, to market. And Mo, what do you believe are the key drivers to help a company to build a distinctive brand? Um, a distinctive brand. So uh, I believe a key aspect to build uh, a strong and distinctive brand uh, nowadays is really by having a more inclusive brand, a brand that really embraces the diversity of its people, the, the diversity of the the customer you bring in your brand to, and of course the community that's surrounding your business or, or the product itself. So, by inclusivity, I um, um, this inclusivity can be really reflected in um, 
in the core of the brand, like in the vision itself, in the value that you have. Um, it can also, as part of the positioning of the brand, like once you understand your, your, your consumer base and how diverse they are and you build an inclusive brand, this can be uh, reflected in the positioning of it and in the persona of the brand itself. So how do you help your clients build on their business strategies and help them to realize their ideas? Um, I mean, with this question, um, I believe it can be answered in many ways because we, um, if, if we want to build uh, or to help out, work with our client in building strategy around their brand itself. So um, here it's more we take it to really uh, understand uh, uh, the, the problem they, they here trying to solve, the, um, the current uh, um, status of the market itself, and understand really how they see themselves fit. Are they more uh, looking to be um, a brand that uh, have high quality but really low in prices like some, like Google or Amazon, you, you know, they're competing in prices at the same time they're not compromising the quality or the expectation? Or are you more trying to be a premium product uh, with premium prices? So uh, there's lots of things come in place if you want to think of it from um, I would say uh, a brand point of view, but if you also want to strategize or you want to think of um, strategies for um, um, how you can bring your ideas uh, to life um, or what sort of idea you should explore and, um, and implement. Here potentially we, we work with them in, um, in more some form of a discovery phase where uh, we can work with their uh, front of the front staff um, they have uh, to understand uh, the pain point they're facing, um, etc. And in today's highly competitive business market, a user-centric approach is a must. How can businesses implement user-centric innovation techniques and strategies? Yep. Perfect. So this actually relates back to the last point I was talking about. So if you want to implement, uh, as you said, the user-centric uh, techniques, basically, it's really you want to go to, uh, as simple as going back to the to the users. Now, going back to consumers too early, sometimes it can backfire uh, because not every all consumers understand what they need if they don't see it just yet. So I believe a good approach usually is by chatting to uh, your front staff, the staff that really dealing and dealing on a daily basis with their your consumer, because usually your your front staff have their own pain by this uh, daily interaction with the consumers, or they actually see the pain or hear it from the consumer themselves. So I believe it's always a great start. It's by going to your um, your employee who interact on a daily basis with the consumer. Another way to, uh, in uh, implementing uh, a user-centric uh, technique is really by checking other complementary um, industries, not particularly your industry. So you can look at something similar or uh, can be complementary to your space or not. And just really and see how they innovate. How what what is new in that industry? Uh, what the stuff that they brought in and it's doing a mass success? And see how you can bring this into your own industry. And we've seen this one like with our clients um, in either in the construction space or solar or safety. We've been looking at other industries such as retail, e-commerce, fintech, and we're seeing what been happening in that space that booming for them that doing great result uh, showing lots of innovation and then we are bringing them into those let's say less digitized uh, industries and see okay this is it's a, a new concept it's an, a new it's been tested but in another industry and maybe it's time to test it in in this space itself like in the solar or in a b2b construction space etc now, in relation to the pandemic, what have you witnessed regarding businesses moving to meet the demands of the transforming digital world? Look, um, at this stage, I believe it's almost clear for all of us how, how many things has changed. Like we've been mo mo over a year uh, on it and um, uh, it's quite obvious that things like 
majority of the consumers and businesses are more tech savvy. Uh, everyone understand how to navigate their way through QR codes, through Zoom calls, etc. So, so this is one of the most important things. Is really, it pushed people. I believe that were hesitant or to to change, hesitant to digitize lots of. Um, um, of aspect of their business and push them to 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 do that change. And once, I believe, once they've been in the change now for over a year, most of them they start recognizing how actually it's it's more comfortable in the digital world, um, and it's easier to do business. It's cutting lots of the stuff that is unwanted, um, um, and we saw changes in how you do grocery, in how you do learning, in how you do the telehealth, QR code. Majority of these stuff uh, are here to stay. This is, I believe, are one of the biggest changes that uh, is happening currently to the Australian market uh, and its consumers. Um, for us, for example, at MoWorks, we saw also um, a different type of request from our clients. And this has really been, um, I don't want to say shocking, but it's, uh, it was expected, but was really great to see that now uh, last year we built an, an app for example for telehealth that connect uh, uh, people with pharmacists to issue uh, a medical certificate uh, we also worked on in a new project to uh, digitize an event business event uh, business into a virtual events um, and help different businesses who just start digitizing their processes to allow their their team to work from anywhere from home etc well, it's such a great space to be working in. Thank you so much for explaining Mo Works to us, Mo. No worries. Th thank you for having me. And thank you for your time today. With that, I will sign off. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, Dust up your passports, pack your bags, and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Are 
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. As the demand for cryptocurrencies surges worldwide, startups are looking for creative ways to attract crypto enthusiasts. In a first, a company called Worldcoin has said that it would scan people's eyes and reward them with digital currency. Sounds a little Black Mirror come Blade Runner, but it's not sci-fi, it's crypto fact. Sam Altman, an American entrepreneur and the chief executive officer of OpenAI, is the mind behind Worldcoin, and he has said that his new startup would hand out free digital currency to people who verify their accounts by taking an iris scan. Worldcoin is believed to have already raised 25 million US dollars in funding from investors, which includes Reid Hoffman, the billionaire co-founder of LinkedIn, and venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. The startup's co-founders are Max Novenstern and Alex Blania. Worldcoin aims to launch a cryptocurrency distributed fairly across the world and become a collectively owned global currency. Alex Blania reportedly said that the startup aims to expand the reach of cryptocurrencies as it can widen the boundaries of the economy. So how will the Worldcoin work? Worldcoin has already shipped its orb-shaped devices to people in 12 countries. Now these are used to scan the iris. Testers get users to sign up by having their iris scanned. The image is then encrypted and becomes a unique code, with the original then deleted in order to protect the user's privacy. Once that's been completed, the individual then receives a free share of Worldcoin's cryptocurrency. So far, 100,000 global users have, excuse the pun, had their eyes on the prize. And Worldcoin aims to reach 1 billion users by 2023. Now as for the actual ecosystem, well at present it's designed to operate in a similar manner to the concept of Universal Basic Income, or UBI. The orb arrives, you pass on the details of your iris, you get free money and the cycle continues. The view being in regards to UBI, that as automation ramps up and regular roles are pushed away in favour of machines and software that can perform the tasks typically done by humans, governments can subsequently mitigate those impacts through, of course, monetary handouts. Now if you're like me, that's a pretty fancy way of saying increase government dependence on the slippery slope to communism and quite literally sell your eyes in the process. But hey, I'm a cynic. Also. 
With all of the details that have been released and the interviews that have been conducted with those behind the project, it's incredible to me that nobody has stopped to ask exactly why the company wants the unique scan of your iris and what they plan to do with it. At the very least, it's creepy. At worst, it's a gateway to something rather Orwellian, especially with the backdrop of the past two years. Why exactly is everyone becoming a Bond villain lately? Anyway, one early feature of the project will be a digital wallet that lets users store their crypto and make payments. But more broadly, the platform hopes to attract developers who can build apps on top of its system. Part of that is owing to WorldCoin's roots within the Ethereum system. Now, WorldCoin is a layer 2 Ethereum based cryptocurrency and it has the security of the Ethereum blockchain. The startup reportedly chose Ethereum due to its developer network and hopes that the network will adopt WorldCoin shortly. Perhaps they can sweeten the deal by offering them your sweet, sweet digital eyeballs. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, very concerningly reporting for Kalkine. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, but today's guest is Mr. Vincent Fletcher, the CEO of Carton Cloud. And Carton Cloud streamlines your accounting and admin tasks from route optimization to invoice creation all in one place. They ensure every step of your transport and warehouse management operations is transparent, flawlessly controlled and efficiently conducted in their own words. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. So bringing you live today, we have Mr. Vincent Fletcher, CEO of Cart and Cloud. Welcome to the show, Vincent. Hey, thanks very much for having me on. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks for making time for us. And there's been some encouraging data collated from Cart and Cloud's Logistics Index, CCLI, showing high industry optimism, strong growth expectations. We're keen to find out more. Could you tell us how the index aggregates this data and what was the motivation behind your brand, please? Yeah, sure. So we, we began the, the Cart and Cloud Logistics Index to just sort of get a bit of a snapshot of how the SME 3PL logistics space is is viewing you know business conditions and of course the last 18 months have been sort of unlike anything else what we found is that this kind of information it's not it's not easy to say access just from um, you know general sources because it's such a it's quite a niche specific industry and but we thought that it would be really valuable to get that information together being able to sort of combine it with the, the network of 3PLs that we uh, are in business with and um, and share it with everyone so the way that it works is every quarter we send out a questionnaire and the questionnaire has a total of eight questions on it. Of those eight questions, three of them are the same each time. And those questions are, how do you expect your business to perform in the next six months? What is your view of the current economic climate for your business? And based on the economic climate and the performance of your business, how would you rate the likelihood that your business will bring on additional staff within the next six months? So we're really just trying to get a sense check of, of how they're viewing you know, the situation that they're in and how they believe their business is going to perform. And what we do is we take the answers to those first three questions and we combine them together and then we end up with what we're calling our index value. Now, because this is the second time we've run this quarterly index, uh, we had a baseline that we could use from the last index that we ran. So how that works is last time we ended up with some scores and we used that to create a baseline of 100. And then this time when we ran the, the index again, we could use the same aggregated scores from the second quarter. And basically if we got a score of greater than 100, it would show that people were more optimistic than they had been in the previous quarter. And conversely, if the index came out at less than 100, then it mean that they were the less optimistic. The index itself in, in Q2, although it was still really good, it did see a slight drop. So we actually saw that businesses on the whole went down from our baseline of 100 down to, an eight, down to a score of 86. And 
I mean, there's been significant ongoing lockdowns through, you know, most of Australia, or well, most of Australia's population for, for the, sort of the last four months. Um, and we believe that this had, you know, a bit of an impact on some of those scores that we saw. What interesting information. Thank you. And, and going to all that trouble to get that data aggregated, but for a very good purpose. Thanks for sharing that. How long have you been running that index for? Oh, so this is the second time that we've run it. So we're currently collecting data for the third index. So that would cover the period um, from July through to October. Okay. So we're, the way that it works is that if, if people fill out the form, then they can immediately access the results of the previous index. So we've done that to try and encourage businesses to put this information in um, in order to actually, you know, get, get data coming in that we can use to share with everybody again afterward. Fantastic. Yeah. Straight from the horse's mouth. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, it's very interesting to hear what the results were and we'll discuss that more with you now. So we've seen some global havoc over the supply chain, logistics and shipping costs and delays across several industries that you touched on a bit there. How has the Australian logistics industry stayed neutral to the economic shifts, government stimulus and changes to business practices in response to the pandemic? Hmm, that's a good question. So I think it's like COVID-19 has been both good and bad for logistics. Obviously you've got um, supply chain issues with a lot of international freight and this is coming out of issues with say manufacturing shortages like you're seeing with um, chip manufacturing slowing down you know parts that people need to build computers and cars and things. Um, but then you've also got issues with containers sort of getting stockpiled in certain locations and not able to get back which makes it even worse when they're trying to ship things internationally. However, although that's going on at sort of that, that international and often sea freight level, um, then you've got, you know, a really large number of people who previously weren't doing much on the e-commerce space now ordering a lot of stuff online and getting it delivered to their homes or to their businesses. The majority of the businesses that have been responding to our, um, our quarterly index are involved in the last mile. So they're typically businesses that are delivering, you know, food and beverage, furniture. They might be doing e-commerce fulfillment as well. Basically anything that they can deliver using a truck at the end. So a lot of these guys saw freight surges and, you know, but the, the downside that I think they would have experienced simultaneously was probably more pricing pressure. You know, people's expectations increasing quite dramatically around them because, you know, there is so much more home delivery stuff going on now, the way that you need to perform in that market has gone up. So I think they probably saw increased demand for their services, but probably also higher pricing pressure. And I think those two things together would have led to, you know, a bit of a neutral outcome on the whole. Great. Thank you so much for your insider's insights there. It's definitely looking much different from the outside in compared to the inside out. So we do appreciate that. Um, there seems to be quite a variance between what the senior staff said to the operational staff in regards to the level of optimism on the economic climate. Yeah. Do, you, do you have um, any uh, insights to share on that? According to the data, I think it said that 70% of the senior staff were optimistic, yet only 40% of the operational staff were tending towards optimism. Yeah, my, my read on that was, you know, we're, we're largely sampling small, medium-sized businesses. And so in a lot of cases, the senior staff are the owners or somebody well-connected to the owner. And I, I looked at the data and I found it quite surprising at first, but then I thought, you know, in order to start a small business, you, you really have to be an optimist because there's so many challenges that come up along the way that people that aren't optimistic, they don't typically go out and begin businesses. I think it's probably partly just how those two different groups in general, and I, and I know that I'm sort of stereotyping here a bit, but how those two different groups actually view opportunity in general. And I think that in a lot of cases when you're dealing with SMEs, the guys that are running them, they have to be optimist. And those results come through in the in the survey that we conducted, I mean, as opposed to say some of the staff that they might have hired who, you know, they're simply not in those shoes, they don't have to be. 
Great, thank you so much. It's, it's so true what you say there. The people that run the companies, it's a 24-hour job really and the fact that they're creating opportunities for people to jump on board and get some great deals and even to be employees is, is fantastic. It's, it's really um, what keeps the um, cogs and screws ticking in, in industry and, and the economy. So great to hear that a majority of the respondents this quarter believe their businesses will perform well or very well in the next six months. That's definitely inspiring to hear. Um, how do you think the hiring intentions will be impacted by this? So it was interesting, you know, of those three questions uh, that I mentioned at the start, you know, the first two about how do you just see your business performing? How do you see the sort of the economic climate at the moment? And then the last one being, how do you feel like, will you be bringing on more staff in the next six months? The results for the first two actually remained really similar to the first quarter, but we had a 37% drop in optimism around hiring more people into the organization. And so that was quite interesting. And I mean, that contributed to, you know, the vast majority of the total drop from 100 to 86. I think a big part of this is potentially technology coming in and, and having a role and businesses realizing that they can't just solve some of these problems by simply adding more headcount to their organizations, especially if they're coming under pricing pressure for you know, the reasons that I spoke about earlier. And so I think in some cases now they're probably figuring out like how do we work smarter rather than just layering in more cost in order to do this additional volume. You know, just anecdotally in the last six months we've seen, you know, quite a few businesses sign up to our our application who had sort of previously been on the fence for you know 18 months to two years and in a lot of those cases they were citing that their their customers are just demanding better technology or that they simply have to figure out a way to do things more efficiently to remain competitive so i did wonder if there was you know if, if that was the primary driver behind these these stats that we're seeing there certainly has been a lot of technological developments um, occurring even in the last 18 months. So it's very interesting to see the impacts it's having on industry. Um, we're coming to the end of our discussion now, uh, Vincent, and investors are putting more pressure on businesses to take consideration of their ESG policies. And there were no respondents who believe their operations are very good at following environmentally friendly practices. Well, a majority of the respondents, which was 82%, thought their operations were okay. Now, do you think this has something to do with the Australian Federal Government's um, perhaps indecisiveness on their carbon emissions policy? Do you think this could be what's causing um, businesses to maybe not do as much as they could? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, now, we didn't have data from the first CCLI around this particular question, so we didn't have anything to compare it to. Uh, do people think that they're doing better or do they think that they're doing worse quarter on quarter? Because this, this made up one of the five questions, which is sort of a new question just to get some, some interesting information. Our take is that it's so hard to know what good looks like in this space at the moment. And I think, you know, there's a real lack of clear guidelines on on how you know individuals or businesses can make a meaningful contribution towards you know the reduction of CO2 or just how they can better you know handle waste and these kinds of things. What we found in our data was that 70% of the responders stated that they were implementing paperless technologies um, as sort of the you know the most common way that they felt that they were becoming more environmentally friendly, obviously reducing paper waste. After that, it was followed by people improving the way in which they dispose of waste. So in logistics, you end up with a ton of like, you know, pallet wrapping, which is sort of plastic, almost like glad wrap that you wrap around pallets. Um, you know, you end up with lots and lots of cardboard. And the way in which that stuff is collected and recycled, that, you know, it, it has a big impact on how much of that just ends up in landfill versus actually getting reused. After they had looked at those two, the next largest was that businesses were looking towards route, route optimization as a way in which they could re you know, reduce their, their consumption or their, their environmental tax. And a big thing there is that if you're you know, really effectively using a route optimization tool, then the number of miles that your drivers need to go, the amount of fuel that they need to burn, it reduces. Um, and you know, ideally, this wouldn't be an issue. And you know, I'm sad to see how 
we got shown all these great Tesla trucks, I think two or three years ago now, and you still can't buy them, right? Um, and I think that whole market is still sort of in its infancy, which is really sad. And we saw that in the data, you know, like only 14% of the businesses that were out polling said that they were look, looking to invest in electric vehicles to help improve their green practices, which was surprising given the hype around them. And I think it's just showing that the, you know, that market is, is sort of taking is taking more time to come online than what they had expected in this sort of commercial sense. Exactly, exactly. There's, uh, I think there'll be some progress in the next few years. I've heard New South Wales has put out a road map to introduce more electric vehicles and, and some road use incentives. But yes, we definitely are lagging in, in regards to that. But there's been some interesting developments with electric vehicle trucks coming out of Queensland. I think we had someone on the show not long ago. So I guess um, as it becomes more popular, it'll be advertised more hopefully. Um, thank you yeah, so the, much. The commercials of them are, are going to just revolutionise everything if you don't have to fix trucks because they're super expensive just to keep running. Um, yeah. But you know at the moment and if you're running say a refrigerated warehouse in summer and you're trying to either run it at refrigerated or frozen temperatures, even if you've got that whole thing covered in solar, there's no way that you can cover the electricity consumption of the condensers that you need to do it. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a real shame because you, you continue to have to pull power from the grid, which, you know, the majority of which is produced by coal. Very true. Thank you so much, Vincent, for sharing your insights today. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. And best of luck with your near-term goals with Cart and Cloud as well. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> have a nice afternoon. Thank you. And if you've just joined us, we had an informative discussion with Mr. Vincent Fletcher, CEO of Cart and Cloud, and the full recorded interview will be available via YouTube at Calcine Media. Please keep watching Calcine for more expert talks, live market updates, and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine. Hi there, James Preston for Calcine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calcine has a new video. I'm Sage for Calcine Media and today's trending topic is what should students do in their free time? Students have always been considered a generator of new ideas and the most active part of any society. Today the word student refers to a person who is energetic, active and cheerful. We bring to you a list of activities for students to do in their free time. Science and creativity are an interesting pastime. Not everyone likes to spend time idly. Some young people are looking for new ways to gain knowledge and experience. Numerous conferences, contests of scientific papers, round tables, student olympiads are of interest to those who see themselves as creative and purposeful people. The doors of educational institutions offering a second higher education and various additional courses are open to students who are eager for additional knowledge. It is estimated that about 9% of young people use their free time to gain additional knowledge. Another type of leisure is a social activity. Today, young people have their own active life and civic position on all issues. Modern activists are happy to participate in the social life of their group, faculty or university, and these are various creative contests, social events and rallies. 
joint outings into nature, clean-up days and other important and interesting things that leave a bright trace and pleasant memories. If you are an active person, then you'll be noticed and entrusted with social work. For example, to be the head of a group or to perform other socially significant tasks for which, by the way, they can also be paid. Sport is a lifestyle. The opportunity to engage in sports and clubs is another area where you can enjoy your time and usually each university offers a wide range of sports activities. But if you are still not satisfied, there is always an opportunity to visit other sports centres, for example tourism or rock climbing. And usually students admission is free or much cheaper. Part-time work in your free time. Part-time employment somewhat limits the opportunities of young people to spend their student years brightly and pleasantly, but they give valuable life experience and, importantly, additional finances. In general, student life is the most eventful time, which is a real crime to miss. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified when Calkine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, head to the website, it's calkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello everyone, this is Sage and welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. And today's special guest is Mr. Regulan Gautaman, the founder, CEO, director of Virtua Group. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for a creative digital product design agency and game development company based in North Sydney, Australia, who specialises in mobile apps and software. And he also shares some insights on the trending Bitcoin and blockchain space. So stay tuned. And as you know, Calkine TV brings you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market. So today we're very lucky to share some time with Mr. Gauth uh, Regulan Gautaman, sorry, the director at Virtua Group. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm sure your insights will be enjoyed by our viewers. Your company is regarded as the best performing organization in serving the business and technology solutions. Would you like to tell mm -hmm. the viewers about Virtua Group and how does Virtua Technologies innovate, please? Uh, our main company is Virtua Technologies, where we build apps, games, and enterprise applications, and a lot of web apps and stuff like that. That's what we do. And uh, we work on some of the niche spaces as well. So we integrate a lot of IoT-based uh, projects as well. And apart from that, we work with uh, telecommunication companies and game development companies and studios as well. Um, so that's what we do under virtual technologies. And blockchain is one of the new things that we have done. And uh, we're doing pretty well in the blockchain space as well, which is uh, the crypto space. And apart from that, our other companies, virtual imports, uh, where we have a company called Hari Guru, where we, we are actually the number one importer of a premium kids furniture in Australia. We import from Europe and a lot of different places as well. And yeah, so that's that's what the stuff that we do. That sounds fantastic. Quite a diversified portfolio of work there. Incredible. And yeah. thank you for joining us again on Calkine TV. I believe you have been a guest in the past. And mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies has since uh, really emerged into the mainstream now. And 
it's becoming a big part of the digital world and after largely standing aside for years it's it's finally yes. de developing people's curiosity and although it is such a volatile market it is becoming more widely embraced so what are the potential risks for consumers and financial markets would you like to address this yep uh, so most cases people don't really understand this is a DeFi market which is basically there is no regulations or centralized body for people to go and have some queries to be addressed and stuff like that like a regular banks and stuff so that's a, that's one of the major risk when investing in cryptos and DeFi's and stuff um, but apart from that uh, it's still driven by people and it's actually run by uh, people like regular people and stuff so it's a bit more um, uh, so far, we have not seen major issues. We had few, few, few hacking issues and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. apart from that, it's relatively safe compared to uh, standard financial systems, and they've been very robust in terms of transactions and um, um, you know cross-border tra transactions and stuff like that. They've been very efficient, I would say. Uh, yeah, but there are some risks that people need to understand as well. It's a decentralized uh, economy. Yes, and, and that decentralized factor is interesting because it kind of democratizes the whole financial system that we work in so that this kind of an even flow of, of distribution of funds, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, etc. But then the question arises, is it going to de democratize it for everyone or just those who are the computer scientists or who understand finance and, and crypto? So I guess just more awareness raising can help uh, hopefully get everyone Everyone involved, um, and Bitcoin's founder Satoshi Nakamoto eternalized as the as a statue in Budapest. Um, do you believe that it is the beginning of a more inclusive global presence for cryptocurrencies? Do you think it'll be actually possible, in your expert opinion? Uh, I think uh, I do believe because cryptos, you know, there is like a large sectors of cryptos which is controlled by large corporations where they do large size farmings where individual mining and farmings cannot be performed in those sort of coins such as Bitcoin. Even Bitcoin you cannot mine at home. Uh, whereas Ethereum and uh, Ravencoin, Ripple, not Ripple, Ravencoin and a lot of other coins you can actually mine at home as being a regular user. And all you need is just a computer. It could be a laptop, it could be just a regular PC. And so it's like a global civilian population can actually participate and without much of a hurdle. And you don't really need to be super smart in computers and stuff. Uh, you just need to turn on your windows and run a couple of softwares and there you go, you can start mining cryptos. Um, and I think a um, lot of countries also start adopting, you know, South America has got the 70% coverage of uh, ATMs for Bitcoins. That's actually a pretty cool fact, which I just came to know. Um, so yeah, so that's the adoption is pretty huge and people start getting aware of like how to start using cryptos on a real world and uh, businesses started accepting, even including our own business. We accept crypto coins as one of the payment methods as well. And uh, so the laws needs to be a bit more clear for people to understand how they have to file the capital gain or any of the taxes that need to give the government. And then I think it's, it's, uh, it's a much going to be a much huge industry. So it's going to be a lot of people going to be coming together to do it. Well, it's definitely an exciting space to watch and congratulations on, on your progress of now accepting cryptocurrency as payments. That's very exciting as well. So cryptocurrency exchanges and providers of crypto services are scrambling to sever business ties with mainland Chinese clients after some major crackdowns as seen last mm -hmm. Friday, issuing blanket bans on all crypto trading and mining. What do you think will be the global impacts of such a move? Um, people were expecting to be pretty drastic you know we lost some quite a lot of hash rates uh, coming from china to ethereum a lot of these networks but um, it gained pretty quickly because you know like from a minor perspective uh, if if there is going to be less people mining there is going to be more jobs and they generally get a bit more as the difficulty comes down uh, but from a consumer perspective the transaction is going to be a bit slower and it's going to be quite a bit slower if you're going to lose few tera hashes and stuff like that and um, i think from a minor perspective, it is a good thing. So there is like only less people mining, so it's going to be a bit more profitable for them. And um, yeah, but again, crypto is actually DeFi. So, you know, like it doesn't matter if China's cracking down. I don't think so. They can actually block individual miners as a whole. They can actually crack down on a lot of large businesses, but uh, it's more like a peer to peer. So it's going to be pretty hard for them to crack down on uh, individuals. Uh, yeah. 
Exactly right. Thank you so much for your insights because I believe China has tried to ban crypto several times over and there are discussions on the internet, etc. about how many times can you actually ban something. So I guess they will just keep on attempting to ban crypto. But like you say, there's always that peer-to-peer -peer transactions and the individuals mining. So yes, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Now, That's we yeah. have to start winding up shortly, uh, but hopefully we can fit one more question in for you. During the pandemic, sure. we saw people realizing their dependence on technology and, and further digitization, as you probably would have noticed as well, um, with the restrictions brought on by the pandemic. And the economy was um, witnessing an unparalleled boom during the same period in cryptocurrencies as well. Nearly 4,900 new cryptocurrencies entered the market since September 2020, according to Fresh yeah. Reports. Do you have any insights to share on this? Uh, there is a lot of coins coming into into market and DeFi exchanges. And, um, you know, if you look at Binance, there is like quite a lot of new coins has been listed. Pancake swaps have got new tokens listed. So this is all coming into place. But the point is like the tokens needs to have a purpose. Um, if there is no purpose behind it, then it's going to be a bit hard. That's the reason Helium, HNT miners and those things are actually getting popularity compared to um, tokens which doesn't really have any real world problems, solving any real world problems. So IoT space, gaming space, and uh, Access Infinity, that sort of stuff is going to be pretty cool. And I think a lot of people are going to adopt that sort of tokens. And they're going to go pretty well uh, compared to tokens which doesn't have any underlying value. Yeah, you know what? I think that is what is trending, that the play-to-earn games are the way that blockchain and, and crypto is going to really make a stance in the world moving forward and hopefully with as little regulation as possible because an interesting fact that um, a lot of Axie Infinity's players are not banked. They don't really have a bank account or financial system or access to that type of thing that we're so used to, yet they are making money through Axie Infinity's tokens. So very interesting. Thank you so much yes. for your time today, Regulan. Really enjoyed your, your insights. And viewers, if you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Regulan Gautaman, the founder and CEO, director at Virtua Group. And coming up next, please stay tuned for this week's edition of Crypto Buzz and, of course, Kalkine TV's regular lineup of expert talks and market updates. This is Sage signing off for now. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV.
G'day there, I'm Rose Jacobs here with you for Kalkine Media. In this video we're going to look at why biogene technology has been in the news lately. But first of course make sure you do press that bell icon and you'll get all the latest updates right here on Kalkine Media. Australia-based ag tech business enabling next generation of novel insecticides, Biogene Technology, has signed a licence and development agreement with Evergreen Garden Care. The company is intended to develop new insecticide solutions in the consumer markets of the EU, UK and Australia. This announcement took the price of the stock up around 20% during the intraday. This partnership will provide Evergreen the exclusive access to Biogene Technologies, proprietary natural data and technology including its products, Qside and Flavicide. It will also enable Evergreen to exclusively develop and evaluate natural product solutions targeting ant and mosquito control. The retail sales value of these market segments is estimated around about 600 million US dollars. Let's look at some of the key highlights. As per the terms of agreement, Biogene will pay key milestone payments and licenses to the required ongoing development work. The largest and initial of these payments will be paid within the first 18 months. On the other hand, Evergreen will pay Biogene Technology an agreed ongoing undisclosed royalty on all product sales containing its technology upon the launch of commercially viable products. Evergreen will also have an option to license the right to develop Biogene's active ingredients for the other applications in the broad consumer markets. And this is where the terms of those licensing agreements will be separately negotiated. As per the media sources, Biogene's CEO Richard Jagar called the agreement a strong validation of the potential of Biogene's technology for a very large range of commercial consumer applications. He said the next steps of the development program are anticipated to start around the end of this year. And that's it for this video. If you like what you've discovered, then don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and check out calkinemedia.com for all of the latest. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You 
are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Men of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell, and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hello everyone, Sage here. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. Today's guest is Mr. Darren Nelson, the director and founder of Solace Sleep. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for Solace Sleep, a national online and retail bedding company specialising in adjustable beds as well as mattresses and pillows. The beds are functional, elegant and affordable. And their purpose is to provide a better sleep and to ease the pain as part of their customer's health journey. So we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And today we're very lucky to have live with us Mr. Darren Nelson, the founder and director of Solar Sleep. Welcome to the show, Darren. Good morning, Sage. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I'm glad to share this great piece of news with the viewers that Solar Sleep could increase its sales by 400% since the pandemic hit in 2020. And despite mm. the regressing market, you achieved astounding growth. Darren, please share your strategies behind achieving such great success. Well, I, look, it, it starts with, uh, I suppose, what everybody expects from a business. Uh, sometimes we don't get it, which is just, we're a, a family business, so those, those family values, those ethics, uh, we treat people the way they expect to be treated. 
Uh, a lot of it's got to do with our pricing strategy as well. We're factory direct pricing. Um, typically, we're about half the price of uh, you know normal betting retailers out there. And we've developed product that suits the market in terms of, as you said before, their health journey. Um, we've developed product that is easily delivered totally around Australia for their online purchases. And we've got a fully stocked warehouse, which is really important because when an adjustable bed comes along, a lot of it's got to do on an urgency of a health crisis, um, pain, comfort, uh, people don't want to wait 10 to 12 weeks for their product. No, especially when it's going to ease the pain or give them a better night's sleep. And with the advent of the new work from home culture, people now mm. spend more time in their homes. Do you think this change has affected how people view and invest in their furniture and beds especially? Totally, totally. What people are saying to themselves now is their health um, and their sleep is one of the highest levels of what they put on their criteria about their, uh, their own body. Uh, and we're playing catch up in this country. Sleep is now becoming a really hot topic and people are understanding the value of sleep because as they move through different stages of life, they want, uh, as I said before, their health to be consistent. In terms of the people staying at home, um, they're challenged with uh, trying to find a peaceful place in their house to um, conduct their business. Often that's done uh, in the bedroom, often that's done propped up with a couple of pillows and it's not helping their posture. So they're looking for something that's going to um, perform everything they need to perform and that's typically an adjustable bed. And it's never too early, I think, to start investing in your neck and spine um, because mm. the, you'll reap the benefits in the long run. I think you're exactly right there. Posture is so important. So speaking of comfort, older people need more comfortable beds as they spend perhaps longer hours in their homes. And we are making our homes like our own personal oasis these days, which is great. So how yep. do you ensure that your beds are super comfortable and warm for people of all generations? Well, we start with, um, I suppose, our core belief that uh, first we have a range of product that gives people options. Um, they don't have just one choice and it's not logical for people just to have one mattress. Um, as we know, uh, when we purchased our mattresses over a long period of time, uh, we need to have an option in mattresses and we need to be explained what that option is. So there's a lot of scientific proof about what mattresses are best for you. And we go through a whole bit of, uh, I, I suppose, understanding what the customer needs, understanding where they've come from and where they want to go. In terms of uh, people staying at home in an older generation, they're also valuing that more than they ever have because they want their um, health and again their home care to be done in their own environment. They don't want to go to a aged care facility or some sort of care facility, particularly as we are understanding that's more of a high risk environment today. And I think you probably want to invest in a bed that is adjustable and is um, able to be used in times when perhaps you become sick instead of having to at that time then hire out a new bed and then have to make the changes around so why not invest in something that's going to provide you with all the functions and features and, and to get the most use out of it before something drastic happens yeah I see what you mean um, and sorry we, we often talk to people about something that we all know, which mm. is you rather be, um, you know, you'd rather take care of your health now. So in other words, uh, preventing anything than then trying to cure something later on. So the prevention stage is critical because you get more oxygen into your bloodstream. Uh, you get better, a better postural relief, as I said before, and typically um, you're getting a deeper sleep. So with a deeper, longer sleep, your brain and your body is repairing itself overnight. 
Thank you so much for elaborating on that. Prevention is better than the cure. You're absolutely spot on. Thanks for that. And you have used pressure mapping in your beds. Would you please also elaborate on the benefits that uh, pressure mapping provides to people? Yeah, again, critical. What we're, what we're seeing now with our, our, I suppose, our extra bit of advice, our extra bit of, um, I suppose, prescription based, you know, understanding again that body and how you do that is by measuring the pressure points on their body. So then we can tell people, okay, how high typically do you need to raise your head? How high do you need to raise your feet? And when you get those two combinations together, that reduces the pressure off your body. Because the people that toss and turn all night, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing that because the blood flow around their body is stopped. So your brain says, turn me over. I don't like the fact that my blood's not flowing around. That is just another indication or that is the core indication of pressure. Uh, so if we can map their pressure uh, and then we can understand what we can do. For example, even me, I was be able to show when we first started to test it that my body sits on a bit of a skew because um, over many, many years ago, I had a knee injury and that makes my one leg touch shorter than the other. So I could see where my pressure was. Right. Very interesting. And thanks for sharing your own personal journey as well there. And Darren, since you have been working with occupational ter therapists, could you please give your nuanced opinion about uh, positional and comfort therapy? I know you've just touched on it then, but if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that too. Absolutely. What we know is our bodies and our shape of our body should not sleep flat. And that's where postural therapy, positional therapy comes into play. It again means that it might mean um, typically putting your body in a position where, uh, again, we reduce pain, reduce swelling. It may be things like uh, lung disease, um, again, oxygen flow into your body. It, it typically can be as little as uh, chronic snoring, sleep apnea. Things like that is all about positional therapy and an occupational therapist looks for our advice from point of view where that best position is to ease pain, provide better comfort, um, really just about health because they're trying to again provide a health journey going forward for their client. In terms of comfort therapy, as I touched on before, there's a whole big pile of different ranges of mm. uh, indicators that we need to be careful of. One more than anything is things like when you're transferring from a mobility device, be it a wheelchair or a mobile chair in some ways, about how secure and safe the edge of that mattress is, um, to the height of the mattress, to the amount of pressure relief it gives. Um, that's what we call comfort therapy. And then you need positional therapy and comfort therapy to match to those clients' needs. And that's again a lot to do with that pressure mapping and a lot to do with the understanding of what the occupational therapist needs and also what the client needs. Yes, absolutely. And um, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you mentioned having a deeper sleep can aid in the prevention of uh, things down the track that could go wrong with your posture and even with your organs because at night time is apparently na n natural therapists tell me when your organs are healing and it's important to have a complete focus on that and not be tossing and turning all night. Well Darren I've really enjoyed your insights today thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and your passion for thank your project. You Was there any, oh, um, Was there any final comments you'd like to share before we wind up today's discussion? Mm -hmm. Look, I just, I just encourage everybody to consider their sleep. Um, you need to get a long, uh, valuable sleep and often many people say they've slept for seven hours, eight hours, but still don't feel healthy in the morning or they feel like they haven't slept. And that's got a lot to do with the fact, that, as I said before, that tossing and turning, that pressure. Um, and you need, um, and I, this is really important, 
you need to get into a deeper sleep. And if you do that, your body will then react beneficially to that deeper sleep. Great advice and a fantastic note to finish up on there. Thanks, Darren, for your time today and for joining us on Calcine TV. And if you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion. Mr. Darren Nelson, the founder and director of Solar Sleep. And your body might thank you if you check out his website and the offerings his store will give you. The full recorded interview will be available later at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. So please check it out. And thanks for your time watching. Stay watching Kalkine TV for more live expert talks and market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Mingala Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ngalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off-the-grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well, it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert, basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. 
exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks, Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Amos Simotov, founder and CEO of Way2VAT. Now they're headquartered in Israel and it's a global leader in integrated VAT claim and return solutions in over 40 countries and in over 20 languages, serving hundreds of enterprise businesses worldwide. It owns and operates a patented artificial intelligence technology that powers the world's first fully automated end-to-end -end VAT reclaim platform. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Amos, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, <laughs> good morning. <clears throat> good morning to Tel Aviv from Sydney. Good morning. Good now morning first, from Tel Aviv, yeah. Now, firstly, congratulations on your recent listing on the ASX. How do you see the Thank listing you. in way to VAT's longer term story? And how do you plan on using the funds raised? So this is a great moment for us uh, starting our listing in ASX. We've been looking on that process in the last 18 months. So uh, recently we succeeded with that. We are very happy. Um, User fund mainly will uh, support our growth uh, globally uh, in different countries, uh, mainly in Europe, uh, in the US, and uh, most importantly also in the Australian market. So bear in mind today we are working by uh, two channels, enterprise, we do a lot of uh, direct approach to uh, big corporates around the globe. And we are the only vendor in the world today that also pro having an access for SMB market. And for SMB, we will work closely with technology partners. Therefore, having a presence in different territories is a key to our success. Excellent. And congratulations once again. The ASX welcomes you, I'm sure. Now, you have over 150 customers across 40 countries, mostly across Europe and America. Do you have any plans for expansion into these markets? Yes, so uh, today we, uh, we have some presence. Uh, we have our headquarters in London. Uh, we're going to uh, expand our uh, uh, footprint in the, uh, in the Dutch market and Benelux and the Nordic by having another subsidiary. Um, we're going to open an uh, office in New York uh, for the US market. Uh, supporting our growth with our uh, American clients and also you know, in Sydney down the road uh, potentially for, for clients that we are starting to engage in the last few months. Excellent. Now let's look at your company in a little more detail. How does your company plan to revitalize the current tax processes and what difference is expected to make to businesses who currently use manual processes for their VAT? Yeah, most likely if you are looking on the industry, so most of companies are doing that manually when it comes to foreign VAT and they need to reclaim uh, simultaneously in, in 40 different countries. Uh, doing that uh, for a company, it's almost impossible. Uh, so we are providing them an access, automatically access end-to-end -to, -end, uh, to 40 different countries by AI technology 
computer vision technology patented by four different patents. Um, we are doing that today with uh, for our 180 different enterprise clients, and we're doing that also for our technology partners, mainly for the SMB. As mentioned, for the SMB market, we are the only vendor in the world providing a solution and access for small, medium, and large uh, companies in the same time. Uh, small and medium for us, it's a key market. Uh, it's a greenfield. Uh, no one is touching this market. And we think with the technology that we are having and the partnership that we'll have or having today with uh, technology partners will provide an access for any company around the globe, no matter if it's a small, large, or, or big, to access our platform and to reclaim the VAT in 40 different countries. Great. Now, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected lots of businesses across the world. And way to VAT had hoped to list on the ASX last year back in 2020, but that was postponed due to the pandemic. What has happened over the past year that allowed um, way to VAT to conduct such a strong listing for this time? Surprisingly, uh, if we are looking on the last 18 months, we grow on, you know, almost by two times. So this g gave us uh, the encourage to proceed and uh, uh, list starting the listing process uh, uh, last week. So uh, we grow by revenue two times. Uh, we grow by our pipeline. So we have a very strong pipeline in terms of the contract that's going to be signed. Shortly, we're going to announce some big contracts that we signed with big American companies. So we are very encouraging with, uh, with that. We think that, uh, and we are seeing also an increase on the business travelers in the last few months. And we hope once we will uh, we'll get more to on track in terms of uh, business travelers, we will see some dramatic growth in our business as well. Bear in mind the last 18 months, because of the uh, COVID, We've been focusing most on the local VAT for corporate. So we prepare our their uh, VAT local expenses for travel expenses in their own countries. And this brought us some significant revenue. And also uh, claiming uh, account payable, foreign account payables for companies. So now if we see that uh, the a growth in the travel business, then this will come on top of what we have already achieved in the last 18 months, and this will also contribute significantly to our revenue. And as you mentioned there, your company has had some positive tailwinds with the return of travel across the world and also digitization of taxation models driving new processes for many companies. How is Way2VAT tapping into these trends? So this is a trend that uh, we are seeing that jurisdictions are leading that in the last uh, few years. We think with the access that the different countries are providing for a company like us, doing that automatically, that means uh, we are getting all the data, we are analyzing that on a daily basis, we get the, the relevant number of the VAT reclaim, and we are submitting that automatically to their platform. The support that we are having now with different jurisdictions, helping us also to have some uh, big growth in terms of revenue and big growth in terms of return uh, to our clients. So if we are looking on four years, five years back, getting money or uh, getting uh, uh, a cash from uh, different tax authorities, uh, the timeline was between three to four months. Now we are talking about one to two months to receive the money back for our clients. And this is on, on based on the support that we are getting from the jurisdictions and also based on technology that we provided recently integrated to their platform. Well, it's been fantastic chatting with you today, Amos. And once again, congratulations on your listing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today. But stay tuned to Calkine for more informative interviews. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. 
Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Alexandra Malloy. She is a lecturer in aviation at the School of Engineering and IT at UMSW in Canberra. Her research topic is training young novice operators, drivers and pilots. Here at Kalkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Dr. Alexandra, it's a very good pleasure to meet you today. Thank you, Rachel, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Now, I did mention some of your areas of research there. Could you elaborate on those for me and explain how connected is driving a car to flying a plane? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And my background research is actually in uh, training education in uh, human factors, which combines their engineering, education, design, psychology, as well as um, um, aviation and road safety research. When we talk about any high hazardous area and training of the operators, developing of those non-technical skills, and when I say non-technical skills, I mean risk management, uh, decision making, situation awareness, and many more. So when we c it comes to training, uh, there are interventions that really works from one high hazardous industry to another to develop those skills. And uh, it is evident from the number of research that I've been conducting in aviation safety as well as in road safety, and particularly when training young novice operators. Now, looking to the roads, obviously speeding is a huge problem nationwide. How do you believe novice drivers can improve their speed management behavior? Um, there is historically a uh, three E's approach, which is uh, engineering, education, and enforcement. So I think these three components and approaches should work as a system to achieve that safety result and reduce the numbers that we can see still in the statistics. So one of the approaches that can reduce speeding is um, mainly in their influence in their cognitive based uh, training. So to influence uh, their awareness and perception of speed in itself. When we look at the statistics or overall, it seems that there are different types of drivers. And let's say not all young novice drivers speed on the roads, but others do. And there can be like different typology, including those drivers that can be um, in a category of uh, manipulators, deterred drivers, and um, defiers or confirmants. So, and we need to find that approach that works for all of the types of drivers. So, uh, one of the particular uh, training intervention is self-explanation, reflection, or feedback that was found quite effective in improving both young novice pilots and young novice drivers, in particular when the information and training is related to themselves and increased the awareness um, of their particular, for example, numbers of speeding or maximum speed or the average speed they're driving, the young drivers tend to attend to that. So the big problem that some drivers are not aware that they are speeding 
they are not aware about the consequences and the likelihood of being involved into the accident or crash. So, and that's really a problem. And I think a research-based approach would help and would be quite effective in resolving this issue. Some of the recent research uh, that has been done shows that really uh, the approach should be simple, it should be easy to understand, and it should be effective. And that's the key in resolving this issue. Uh, and I think a number of researchers, not only myself, but working on this uh, problem, uh, not only in Australia, but around the world, as we know that speeding is the widely spread risky and illegal behavior, and it consists of 41% uh, that contribute to the road crashes. So definitely there is a gap in um, training, there is a gap in the approach and the road safety approaches that with a concerted effort, and as I mentioned before, with the engineering, enforcement and education, we have to first teach our young drivers and then improve their behaviour. So in your expert opinion, do you believe Australia's driving education is satisfactory or is there scope for improvement? Do you think there could be anything that needs to be added to the driver's test education system? Um, the statistics really shows us that there are thousands of accidents happen due to speeding or speeding related crashes. So that can be, for example, inattention to driving, but in addition with the speeding factor and excessive speed, it really increases that likelihood and severity of the crash. So at this stage, it depends what we compare Australian education to. It is quite advanced compared to many countries around the world. However, if we are looking at the approach of eliminating to, to and achieving the zero um, zero uh, a reduction of errors, so that's really just uh, you still need some effort. So, for example, in driver education, there is a standardized component of education and experience. For example, the graduate license system comprises of several stages, where it is believed that young drivers will have that sort of um, uh, time to practice and also to um, learn about their driving education. Uh, the hazard perception training has been introduced, again with the aim to reduce any potential uh, risks on the road. And still there is a gap because there is not that no component when young drivers going solo on their P driver's license. And according to the statistics, that's the most um, vulnerable stage in the graduate licenses system um, because when young drivers start driving on their own they really underestimate the risks and sometimes overestimate their own skills and as we know from the human factors perspective and the human performance uh, approach there are limitations that people need to be aware of and uh, particular young drivers need to develop that experience and skills to be able to drive safely on the road. So basically, really there is a gap where with a concerted effort and the research-based approach, we will be able and or hopefully will be able to reduce the number of violations, reduce the number of uh, accidents related to speeding and finally to, we will improve young drivers' behaviour. Absolutely. And if we could move on to pilots in training now, what are some of the cognitive based training methods that you teach young people pursuing aviation? Mm. Um, it is really interesting that those approaches that really apply to themselves and where they can analyze their own performance, for example, self explanation or reflection, these training approaches really show that after can. Uh, executing the flight or performing an action when you receive a feedback from an instructor and in addition analyze your perform performance like what did I do wrong it could be done in different way why have I done it and what would I do uh, differently next time and really apply to yourself shows quite a good um, promise in improving their behavior 
However, in comparison to another cognitive-based training, which is reflection, when, when they reflect to another pilot's performance, the performance and self-reported answer shows that really they underestimate their own skills and they believe that it will not happen to me. So with that approach, looking at another uh, pilot's performance, sometimes may work, but sometimes may increase their own um, skills in, re in relation to piloting. And we also need to remember that both um, pilot's training or driving training is different components. So maybe it is easy to learn technically or technicality. It's how to uh, operate a motor vehicle or how to operate an aircraft but enable to manage those skills and thinking about any other factors that influence in this high hazardous and very changing and dynamic environment is really important because when we're driving or flying at planes, it's really a matter of several seconds to make a decision and the decision should be right. So this is a particular problematic area for young novice operators who have really limited experience in these particular areas and there are lots of risks around us. And just finally, with many pilots currently out of work, do you think this will push back the amount of new pilots able to be trained? What, what do you see as the future of aviation for wannabe pilots? This is very, um, I would say, painful question. Why I say painful? Because that's how the pilots feel at the moment. As um, I read recently an article saying that half of the world's population, of the pilots' population, have been grounded and uh, it's really traumatic for them because they take their job really seriously. They love their job and they really live with their jobs. So, but I believe that after pandemic, there will be a really boom of um, flying and uh, really the need of pilots. So that's where we will be looking and the statistics will go up and the need of pilots will be probably um, even 10 times more or even more than we need now so it will be really a uh, growing and booming industry so i believe that the current pilots and the new pilots will be in demand that's for sure excellent well that is great news it's been wonderful chatting with you today dr alexandra thank you so much for your time thank you very much for your time and thank you for inviting me Thank you. With that, I will sign off for today, but stay tuned to Calkine for more informative interviews. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Today is World Tourism Day, and although unfortunately a large part of the year has gone by under lockdowns and travel restrictions, it's not all bad news because we've got the top four best ways for you to celebrate the day this year. So sit back, relax, and come along for the ride through our itinerary list only on this edition of Travel Insights. In the travel industry, virtual reality is turning out to be an interesting medium to capture tourist destinations in a unique and immersive way. In fact, that's first on our list. Kick off your world tourism day by enjoying the finer things in life. Why not take a virtual stroll at the National Gallery of Victoria and immerse yourself in the art and artifacts of a gallery? 
You can even tune in to one of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra's performances and be dazzled by the works of Beethoven and Bach. Top off your concert experience with a virtual tour of the Sydney Opera House as well. Number two on our list, celebrate World Tourism Day by learning a language. There's no better way to prepare for your future's travels with all this spare time at home than to practice a language. Even if you don't become anywhere near fluent, the basics of a foreign language will help you get around and locals will appreciate your efforts. We all know how the French can be. There are plenty of language learning apps at your disposal to make the process a whole lot easier. In fact, some of them even allow you to make friends with people in other countries, which is great because there's no better way to learn a language than through natural conversation. The third way you can celebrate World Tourism Day this year might not be as fun, but why not take a moment to reflect on the responsibilities we have as tourists when traveling the world in this post-pandemic day and age? Start by embracing mindfulness through research and educating yourself on any existing regulations in place in the countries you want to visit. Remember to foster the expansion of the local industry by purchasing authentic and locally made souvenirs. Keep your trip sustainable by considering the environment around you and set a high priority for your safety and sanitation by constantly checking your health and cleanliness. And finally, on this big day, extend your support for people in the tourism sector who will greatly appreciate it since they've been pretty vulnerable recently. A lot of livelihoods depend on the industry, so think about doing them a favor by sharing and promoting the destinations in need. These small actions can help many in the tourism workforce through the struggles of the pandemic. Sometimes selfless actions are the best way to celebrate such an exceptional day. And that concludes our list of things to do on World Tourism Day this year. So stick with us to hear from a very special guest, the founders of this special day itself. Don't go anywhere. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. According to a survey of Boston College, 21% of Americans don't save for old age, and half of US citizens are not saving enough for retirement. Most importantly, some 50% of Americans might not be able to retain their current lifestyle during old age. The survey conducted by the college's Center for Retirement Research in 2019 found. Although fortunately, there are many retirement investment schemes that you can select according to the person's needs. So here are a few. But before we get into it, please give our channel a sub and hit that bell icon to stay ahead of the game. First up is defined contribution. Members contribute a portion of their monthly income into 401k and 403b plans that are tax-free. More than 85% of Fortune 500 companies have adopted the DC plan launched in 1986. The plan's growing contributions show its popularity. Traditional pension plans are the easiest way to invest as employers fund the plan and provide a monthly fixed income after retirement. However, these plans are not popular as only 14% of Fortune 500 companies have embraced them. 
according to a risk management company Willis Towers Watson. Federal Thrift Savings, or FTS. FTS is similar to a 401k but available only to government employees and the armed forces. Employees can select from options like the S&P 500 index funds or large cap index funds or funds that invest in treasury securities. Cash Value Life Insurance This plan gives insurance options like universal life, whole life and variable life. It also gives death benefits like income for relatives. IRA The US government has created an IRA retirement plan for anybody who works. People can save up to $6,000 US dollars, but those who are above 50 years can save up to $7,000 annually. On top of that, there are various types of IRA like traditional, Roth, spousal, SEP and simple. Under the IRA plan, the monthly investments are tax-free and any worker can opt for it. But the amount will be taxable when withdrawing during retirement. Guaranteed Income Annuities or GIAs Employers don't offer this retirement plan. Instead, people buy GIAs from the market. As such, people can buy GIAs at any time. Non-Qualified Deferred Compensation or NQDC This fund is available only to top company executives. And there are two types of NQDC. The first one is like a 401k, in which the employees and the employer put a similar amount in the plan. However, the second one is fully funded by the employer, but the funds are promised later. Hence, it lacks security. Finally, retirement funds should be transferable when an employee joins another company. They should also give high returns. For instance, the growth of these retirement funds should not depend on the success of employers. This is why applicants must know the different retirement schemes available to them and decide what suits them best. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ. If you like this info, please give us a like, share, and a comment, and head to our website at calkinemedia.com. This has been Holly Shields for Calkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached, 
Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello and welcome to the Tech Beat. I'm James Preston, your tech guide, helping you to navigate the bits and the bytes of the World Wide Web and the innovations that abound. In this week's edition, a number of social media giants are distancing themselves from Facebook and Australia looks to implement more cyberspace laws. There's a lot to get through, so let's begin our download on the Tech Beat. TikTok, Snapchat and YouTube are the latest technology giants to have been quizzed by US senators over concerns about the safety of young users. During nearly four hours of questioning on Monday, the tech giants attempted to put distance between their platforms and that of Facebook, which has faced increasing scrutiny from politicians in recent months. Facebook has been accused of harming children's mental well-being and has faced increasing calls for regulation of the platform. But Snapchat told senators its platform did not belong in the same category. TikTok's public policy head Michael Beckerman, meanwhile, told the hearing that TikTok is not a social network based on followers. But TikTok has faced accusations its algorithm serves harmful content to its teenage users, which as weight loss, such as weight loss videos or dangerous pranks. U.S. Senators also have growing concerns about both censorship and the spread of misinformation. Some Senators say legislation protecting social networks from being sued, such as Section 230, need to be revisited. Originally seen to protect internet providers such as BT or Comcast, it has become the main shield for huge sites such as Facebook, Twitter and YouTube, which cannot possibly review every single post from their users before publication. However, Many US politicians claim the legislation is now outdated and social networks must be held accountable. As for me, I just want to see Mark Zuckerberg looking like he's come to planet Earth and is learning how to communicate with humans for the second time around. Good on you, Marky. Now, speaking of Facebook, they have admitted that core parts of the platform appear hardwired for spreading misinformation and divisive content. According to a fresh wave of internal documents that showed the social media company struggled to contain hate speech and was reluctant to censor right-wing US news organisations. Though, to be fair, why should the left get a free pass? After all, if you dare criticise the tribe that was the Ghostbusters reboot a few years back on Twitter, well, you'd get banned. But if you're the Taliban, nope, that's completely fine. You keep tweeting Mohammed bin killing volleyball players a lot. Anywho, an internal memo warned Facebook's core product mechanics or its basic workings had let hate speech and misinformation grow on the platform. In March, a group of researchers inside Facebook compiled a report for one of the company's most powerful executives, Chief Product Officer Chris Cox. The paper included charts and data highlighting a troubling trend that seemed to be accelerating. Namely, Facebook was losing popularity with teens and young adults. The documents also show that the artificial intelligence systems that Facebook employs to root out such content frequently aren't up to the task. 
Facebook whistleblower Francis Halgan also stated that the algorithms are essentially designed in a way that allows for outrage material to be promoted to users which in turn can fuel more violent unrest around the world because of the way its algorithms are designed to promote divisive content. She said the social networks saw safety as a cost centre and said it was unquestionably making hate worse. All right, time now for a very short break on the Tech Beak. And in the vein of Facebook, drop us a comment and let the arguments begin about the pros and cons of having to take an ad break in the first place. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Welcome back to The Tech Beat. I'm James Preston, asking you to swipe right on this show and then make the first move in downloading all this juicy, juicy content. It's a social media focused edition today, but most of the news surrounding these tech giants isn't particularly social. That includes news from Australia's cyberspace. Australia is considering new data privacy rules that could make it illegal for social media companies to direct children to harmful content. This is the latest move by lawmakers around the world to address concerns about the impact of online platforms on young people's mental health. Australia's government on Monday released a draft piece of legislation that would enable the creation of a binding online privacy code for tech companies. The legislation is expected to be introduced in Australia's parliament early next year. Now, if passed, Australia's privacy regulator would oversee the development of a code within 12 months with input from the tech industry. The code would require Facebook and other social media companies to ensure that a child's best interests are the primary consideration when collecting, using and disclosing a child's personal information. For children under 16, social media platforms should get parental approval to create an account. David Coleman, the Australian Deputy Minister for Mental Health, said in a statement that algorithms that direct children to, co con to content such as content about eating disorders or extreme diets, self-harm content, dangerous pranks and other issues which are clearly not in the best interests of children would be outlawed moving into the future. Australia's privacy regulator would investigate possible breaches of the new rules and companies could be fined 10% of their annual Australian revenue for serious breaches, an amount that could run into the tens of millions of dollars for the tech giants. Services like dating apps, chat rooms and video conferencing platforms could also qualify as social media according to a government briefing on the new rules. These services would be subject to the same child protection requirements as Facebook's under Australian, Australia's new privacy proposal. Data brokerage services such as credit bureaus and major online platforms including Alphabet by Google would be subject to new requirements. But the strictest rules like the 16 year age limit would only apply to platforms in the social media category and Google has said it has no immediate comment on the proposed rules. As for my final comment, I think it's a great thing. Social media is increasingly having a very harmful impact on emerging generations who feel the need to look or act in a certain way during their precious formative years. It's time to let kids be kids without even more pressure being placed upon them. All right, well, that's all for this edition of The Tech Beat. I hope you enjoy the show, and until next Thursday, remember to keep your head in the iCloud and take a gigabyte out of life. Hi there, James Preston for Calkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. 
from the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Robert Russell, founder of Truckit.net, Australia's leading freight marketplace, which offers listings for freight jobs with access to a vast network of transport providers, and you'll sure find someone for your job. Truckit.net is an Australian company with an easy-to-use online marketplace to receive competitive quotes. So keep watching till the end to find out more. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and bringing you live today. We have Mr. Robert Russell, founder of CEO Truckit.net. Welcome to the show, Robert. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sage. So, Robert, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. You've had quite an impressive journey from the international rugby circuit to now running an innovative digital marketplace for freight. Could you share your journey with us, please? Yeah, I, I guess it all, well, it all started here in, I'm based in Brisbane, and um, before I, I guess my rugby career played a bit of a part in it, we, I moved over to, uh, to Scotland to play to play in it, uh, to play a professional rugby, which led on to an international career. And I think as a rugby player, you get a bit of spare time. So uh, throughout that process, I started looking into um, what would be life after rugby. And, and I think it was e-commerce that really, um, I'd done a Bachelor of Business or Commerce back here in Brisbane. And, and um, I, I really saw the opportunity in the online world and started a business over there. Uh, and on exiting that business and coming back to Australia in 2012, it was during my time over there that I, I really saw the um, opportunity, I guess, in, in online tech and, and marketplaces. Um, you know, marketplaces have become a big part of uh, the online space and, and our lives, I think, um, yeah, for everyone. So it was sort of, yeah, international rugby through to, to, to now um, running a, yeah, truck it, which is Australia's largest freight marketplace. That's fantastic. A very inspirational story because not everyone has the foresight to think that way. So congratulations and here we are today interviewing you on Expert Talks. Well, established in 2012, Truckett's digital marketplace matches people wishing to freight large items with transport operators. Um, who do you tend to find are your main clients? Do they tend to come from one industry or veer towards domestic or international freight? And do you count yourself as somewhat of a watchdog for consumers? Yeah, look, you know, as, as you said, we're a, we're a marketplace. We're here to match, um, you know, freight consumers of, of all, uh, you know, both personal and business. So we, we have uh, customers or clients, you know, in the business space, we've got large corporates. Um, we've got mining and resources companies. We've got you know large retailers, right down to the the mum and, and dad businesses. And on the personal side, we've got a lot of um, personal freight being done. I suppose with 
um, you know, the increase in online shopping. There's a lot of people that buy off places such as Graze Online. Um, we have a great partnership with Graze Online. And, you know, they're, they're buying things such as, you know, could be vehicles, motor vehicles, cars, jet skis, uh, furniture, anything like that. And, and we're really here to help them move it. So um, we do, um, I guess, yeah, absolutely. I, we, we consider ourselves a bit of a watchdog. I mean, we're a very transparent marketplace with the, um, you know, everyone can see what's going on. So it's the, you know, free market forces of supply and demand that, that really, um, you, you know, that really run the, the marketplace, I guess. And, and I guess in a sense, it's a, it's a watchdog for everyone. So, you know, it's, it's mostly down to, to sort of spot market um, or spot prices rather than contracted rates. So when someone's got that harder to move item or something they don't have a contract in place for, um, yeah, they use truck it. Sounds great. So do you find, you mentioned there, the supply and demand um, of the free market tends to uh, balance out the more expensive um, providers to, and to the cheaper ones that offer more economical rates? Do you think it sort of balances out or do the more expensive ones actually offer a better service? Yeah, no, we, we see all that. I mean, um, absolutely. We, we've a lot of customers who use us for exactly that reason. They, you know, they, they're, the rates they might get or they don't know where to start, who to go to, and especially if they've got a, a rate with a network carrier or someone that, and it's going to a place that they're not regularly using, they probably don't have that sort of volume discount. So um, we see, you know, price differentials, you know, you know, is, is a huge range. Um, and we hear that from our customers all the time. So it's exactly that reason that they use us. And um, yeah, that's been a, it's been a great asset of the business, I suppose, being able to do that. And, you know, just back on the on the provider side, we, we've got providers who are, you know, tier one uh, carriers right down to, again, the owner operators um, doing business, but they all um, competing for the work. And um, I think free markets, as I said before, they, they have a balancing effect. So, um, the, you know, the customers looked after. Well, I think your service definitely provides plenty of advantages for both the providers and the customers. It sounds great. It makes it so easy all in one place and they can just pick and choose what they want. That sounds fantastic. Um, in September, truck users posted more than 17,000 freight jobs on the marketplace. And this is a 65% increase on the June uh, figures, which was 60% on the same month last year. So what do you think is driving this growth? Is there a fee for using your service? Yeah, well, in terms of driving the growth, I mean, obviously the, the COVID effect has certainly played a part. Um, you know, it's forced people to do a lot more stuff online, which has been great for the business. But I think ultimately, um, you know, the, the scale of business is now, we really see sort of network effects taking hold. You know, we've got great liquidity in the marketplace. We've got a lot of We've got over 6,000 transport providers that use us and we've, um, we've had over 400,000 customers. So there is really good liquidity and um, I think that's really starting to show the way now. I mean, even with COVID restrictions um, you know, easing, we don't expect um, it to change. You know, people's you know, user behaviours have, uh, I'd say, have learnt to trust and use marketplaces such as Trucket. And we'll, we uh, you know, believe that that will continue. So. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a very bright future. And I think that's, that's the main reason for, you know, the growth that we've seen, um, you know, between uh, this time last year and now, yeah. Fantastic. And this is a little bit off the main discussion, but just wondering, uh, search engine optimization is vital um, in e-commerce. Um, do you think your e-commerce strategy has helped put you in the forefront of the industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, digital marketing is is paramount to what we do. We've got some great um, agencies that help look after us, and we've got great staff that really run all those marketing campaigns. And SEO, search engine optimization, is a is a is a big part of what we do, um, just as other paid forms of, of marketing as well. So, it is you know, it's it's critical to get that part right, and we're we're very fortunate to have. Um, great people in those positions to, to, to ensure that we're getting great results. Fantastic. Thanks very much for sharing your insights. So um, another side of things that's 
a little bit grey is how are freight fees decided upon generally? Does it vary from company to company or is there a standard overall? Um, how do the fuel levy and road vehicle operating costs come into play please? Yeah, well, those things obviously, as, as they increase, they they play a part in the in the pricing. Um, but just to be clear, we we don't actually set the pricing. We're not um, the likes of we're not Uber who, who who name the price. We let our providers, our transport providers, name their price. So um, you know they factor all those things in when they when they're doing that. Some people have rate tables and they get adjusted. But yeah, we, we see it's a it's a bit of a, a topic, I suppose, at the moment. Those those mm. increasing costs are are driving the prices up. They certainly are. They're making it quite tricky for certain industries depending if you're in table grapes or wine or some of the commodities at the moment, it's uh, getting quite expensive. Uh, and shipping costs have surged with many expecting inflation to hit record levels due to this. Uh, what are your thoughts on the subject for the near future? and your near-term goals for truckit.net, please. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, inflation's, inflation's just part of life, as I mm -hmm. see it. Um, you know, it, it's, there will be inflationary things that happen, and certainly in this industry, I believe. But, it, you know, it's not going to change um, the opportunities we have uh, or the goals we have. I mean, I think it's a great time. It's a great opportunity for, for transport providers at the moment. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people coming into the market. It has... Um, struggled a bit with the uh, the last few months with some of the more restricted lockdowns we've seen but um, right now we're seeing a lot come back in and um, yeah it's a busy space and you know yeah I think it's got a, a very bright future for, for, for the transport providers who want to get involved in the industry and obviously consumers are using it are using us more and more and they're using on you know um, digital means to, to move their goods so yeah so it's um we've got a yeah a very optimistic future. Yes, well, the industry's been great for creating jobs over the downturn, that's for sure. It's been giving a lot of people a chance to keep um, keep the roof over their heads working in deliveries and logistics, so that's that's been fantastic. Well, we have to start winding up the discussion. Was there anything you'd like to share with the viewers before we close up today? Uh, no, nothing other than that. I think it's, um, yeah, like I, I think I've, hopefully I've given a them a good rundown of um, what the business is and if they if they'd like to know more yeah go to truckit.net and um, we've got a you know we pride ourselves on great customer support um, that's been a key focus for us for a long time so if we can help anyone out we're, we, we have phone support and um, yeah, only too happy to help anyone thanks so much for sharing your time today Robert we really do appreciate your insights thanks very much Sage and for those who just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Robert Russell, CEO, founder of Truckit.net. Please watch the full recording on YouTube via Calkine Media and keep watching for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. rolled out a central bank digital currency, the Inara, on Monday. Let's take a look. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Kalkai Media. Scheduled to be launched on the 1st of October, the process was delayed due to implementation issues. According to the official document, the launch of the Inara accumulates the years of research done by the Central Bank of Nigeria in developing the payment system to make transactions a seamless process. Nigeria, along with Ghana, were the early movers in Africa to explore their version of digital currencies. 
In recent times, CBDCs have gained traction, and that's ever since El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. The Central Bank of Nigeria for some time now has been working on a workable model of CBDC that would help in replacing the cash system and use the digital mode of payments. As the Inara is a new product, the Nigerian government is keen to put the system in place to ensure smoother implementation. Developed by the fintech company Bit, the Inara uses two applications for the CBDC. The Inara Speed Wallet and the Inara Merchant Wallet being the application will be available both on Google and Apple App Stores. The central bank governor, Goodwin Emelifile, reported that around 500 million Inara, which is 1.21 million US dollars, have been minted. With the Inara, the central bank aims to create a secure and cost-effective process for remittance inflow to the country, along with other benefits. When compared to fiat currency, the Inara is expected to be cost-effective and the account holder will not be charged for daily transactions. People can use the system even without a phone or with proper internet access. The Central Bank of Nigeria has also said that the Inara can serve as a medium for the government to send direct payments to Nigerians eligible for specific welfare programs. So in conclusion, the Inara will help African nations to expedite their CBDC programs as well as give a template for others to launch their own. It will now be critical for Nigeria to ensure a successful implementation of the central bank digital currency to ensure that people adopt in a holistic manner. Now, if you like this information, please press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. You can also subscribe to our channel. I'm Rachel, signing off for Kalkai Media. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix, with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released, and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkai. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. 
Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy The Gentleman drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Here on the channel, we're bona fide travel enthusiasts and viewers, you might remember our deep dive into the travel tech space on Travel Insights. Well, today we're joined by an industry expert that's cut from the same cloth. Mari Decker is the CEO of Touramigo, the complete streamlined booking system that's specifically designed for multi-day tour agents and operators. Welcome to the show, Murray. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me, Kelly. It's great to have you on. Now, first of all, I've got to ask, since things are panning out quite well for the travel space, we might be soon witnessing at the beginning of a new age of travel. Do you think the industry is ready? 
I do, and um, I'm actually talking to you from Greece <laughs> at this stage, um, which most of Europe, UK um, and US, Canada have been open for the last three, three four months and they're back to pre-COVID levels. Um, very different travellers, but um, certainly by the end of this year to the beginning of next year, um, people are definitely ready to travel. Um, and we're, we're seeing that with uh, witnessing it in person as well as bookings. That's really promising to hear and it's a shame we're lagging a bit behind here in Australia but it's um, very, op very optimistic looking especially from your end considering that you're in Greece yourself so it looks great as well. In your opinion how should multi-day tour operators and agents prep themselves as a few countries gingerly relax these restrictions like we mentioned and reopen borders? Yeah, it has been quite difficult for them with the ever-changing border restrictions um, across the world. Um, but they have modified their businesses with cancellation policies just to give the, the consumer confidence that, um, you know, if something does change last minute, um, they have the confidence that the, the operator or the agent's going to look after them. Um, we also found a big surge in tour operators as well as selling partners to invest in technology. Um, so improving their backend systems, which ultimately improves their connectivity and distribution. So what does that mean? It means that their businesses can run far more efficient. It's a massive time savings for them. Um, and for selling agents or distribution and um, travel agents, it's also a, a huge time saver and um, access to new products and revenue. Absolutely. And we've obviously seen quite an evolution in the travel tech space over the period despite the restrictions on travel. Now you mentioned the flexibility that um, the two, operator, two operators and businesses have had to offer to consumers. Is this flexibility here to stay, do you think? Look, I think so. I don't see why it, it wouldn't. Um, I think that uh, the COVID has taught um, many industries, including the travel industry, many lessons. And I think uh, with the sort of flexible options, it's been very popular for travellers. Um, also for credits. I think that's the, the really the best way um, for uh, these businesses to operate, that they can keep the consumer uh, or the traveler that's with their product that they're obviously wanting to be with their brand and um, and hopefully put them on to a, a different trip um, so that they actually lose their holiday. Definitely, hopefully that's the case for some time to come. Now onto your platform, Tourmaker is a complete and tech empowered streamlined booking system. Could you tell us a bit about your online booking software and supplier booking platform? Yeah, certainly. Um, so to put it um, in in the way that we usually ch chat about it, we're like the connector or the conduit between a tour operator and their selling partners or travel agents. So we provide the technology to enable tour operators to access new revenue streams, um, new like selling partners, um, and the travel agent can access these new products. So our software is a full back-end booking and reservation system. Now, Murray, if you're still with me, for those viewers that are wondering, how do your distribution partners earn revenue? Yes, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, so we promote direct commercial relationships between the tour operator and the, the selling partner, so they can earn the full commissions on, on the sale of the, uh, the tours. That is really good to hear. And um, about, if you can give us an idea, how many partners do you have in the works? What's the scope of this? Of this deal? Yeah, so we have about half a million multi day tour um, departures in our system already um, and uh, a global sort of network of distribution partners that is currently sitting around uh, 10 to 12, um, but we're in continuous negotiations to provide more value to our. Um, tour operators that are in there. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's ever evolving, but it's um, a process that. Uh, the travel industry is looking far more at digitalizing multi-day tours. Um, so we are getting a lot more interest, particularly out of COVID, which has highlighted to this industry that they need to be more online um, and have further uh, revenue streams and distribution partners. Um, and that's what we provide. Very impressive. It's certainly great to see that growth you've achieved so far, especially. And considering this, uh, this growth you've had, are you looking at expanding further perhaps into other markets or growing this distribution partner channel even further? 
Absolutely. Most of our partnerships are already international, um, but that's why I'm over here in Europe at the moment. Um, I'll be in UK beginning of, uh, or at the end of next month, um, and then going to the US. Um, so and this is all to drive the expansion um, into these other markets, um, because we are looking for more multi-day tour operators and also more selling partners that would want to benefit from the, um, the commissions that are available through these multi-day tours. That's great to hear. And I imagine that obviously demand might be greater in those markets at the moment as they're obviously experiencing much more lax laws in terms of travel restrictions. Is that the case? That's absolutely the case. Yeah, so they're, they're definitely, um, they are, I can't believe how busy it is over here, but um, yeah, they're definitely traveling. Um, and a lot of Americans are traveling over here. I think just as of beginning of November, um, USA is going to open up to um, foreign travelers from Euro um, and the UK, uh, which is really great news. And um, yeah, I, I would highly suspect that we're back to very close to normal levels uh, by January, February next year. Well, it's very great to hear, especially for Turamigo and your business. But um, obviously, we, we're a little bit uh, envious here in Australia. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's expected. <laughs> now, yeah, it's um, perks of the job. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Just before you wrap up now, Mari, what's been your favorite emerging trend in the travel industry recently that you're hoping to leverage at Turamigo? Yeah, we're finding travellers are travelling for longer. Um, they're looking for more local experiences and more immersive experiences. Um, and we're finding that a lot more people are booking online. Um, and that's sort of been a bit of a byproduct of COVID um, because they haven't really had a choice. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're just finding that a lot more people are more comfortable either researching online um, and then booking at a travel agency or processing the booking um, online for a higher value item such as multi-day tours. Right, that's really interesting. You've obviously seen the complete digitization of the industry and um, that's obviously something that you've been able to take advantage of with Turamigo. Although it's surprising to hear that the, uh, the length and duration of the tourist stay and um, experiences has changed. Yeah, um, and I, I wouldn't quite say we're digitalized just yet in uh, the multi-day tours, but we, we certainly, um, as when I got cut off before, we, we have built out booking and reservation software that is the full backend system for multi-day tour operations. Uh, so this allows them to build itineraries, um, reporting, they can manage all of their suppliers, their finances, their commercial overlays, um, they can pay all their suppliers through the one system. So it's a first step um, to producing a system that's specifically designed for their business, um, which is leading to, they always get a live connectivity feed from, from that system. Um, so it, it, it has had a huge impact, the COVID um, you know, uh, pandemic, and it has not only changed the, the travel industry, but it's also changed the, the consumer behaviours. Not drastically for the consumer and travellers, people still want to go to the same places, but um, they're just, uh, when we find that people might have been travelling for a week, they might be traveling for two or three weeks at this stage for booking wise. Right, I don't doubt that. That's quite interesting as well. And it'll be interesting to see how that pans out and if that consumer behavior pattern is something that stays. But um, obviously, the industry is still evolving as we emerge out of the pandemic, especially on the digital front. And um, on that note, though, that's just about all we've got time for. But I've got to say, thanks so much for joining us today, Murray. It's been great to hear your insights. Thank you very, very much for having me and the time and sorry about those uh, that little technical difficulty in the middle. Not a problem. Pleasure to have you on. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. If you've just joined us, we've had a stellar discussion with Mr. Mari Decker of Tour Amigo. You can catch this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on the Calkine channel later today. But for now, thanks for your time and stay tuned to Calkine TV for more live updates. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. 
whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, Dust off your passports, pack your bags, and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Australia is expected to become completely cashless in the coming 10 years as the coronavirus pandemic is accelerating the phasing out of physical currency according to a recent survey. Of the 25 experts surveyed, 56% said that the country was all set to be fully cashless by 2031. According to October's Find a Reserve Bank Australia cash rate survey, 89% of the 28 respondents were of the view that COVID-19 had accelerated the fall of paper money. Finder's analysis of the RBA data revealed that the number of ATM withdrawals has declined by 65% with its peak in December 2008. In a separate survey of 1,015 Aussies, Finder also found that 40% of people were using less cash than this time the previous year. Though of course, we are in the middle of a lockdown. But there's no doubt, COVID-19 has accelerated the fall of paper money. Paper money's lifespan is shortening, and cash-only businesses are now few and far between. That's according to the head of consumer research at Finder, Graham Cook. These businesses are expected to get even rarer, according to Cook. A few years ago, Finder predicted a cashless society in Australia by 2036. What does the survey on RBA rate cuts say though? All 39 panellists expect a cash rate hold in October, while 77% expect the rate to remain stagnant until 2023 at 0.1%. The RBA will announce its decision on monetary policy on Tuesday. Market participants expect the central bank to have an on-hold stance. According to them, the RBA may not bring about any changes to the cash rate and financial facilities programs. The RBA had already reduced the weekly bond buying to 4 billion Aussie dollars. In today's meeting, the focus of market participants would be on how policymakers evaluate economic performance. So with all that said, should we be concerned? In short, yes. Whilst a cashless society does indeed have some benefits, there should be some concern around the abolishment of cash. The actions of governments globally and here in Australia have rightfully risen concerns around controls and freedoms. Relinquishing the circulation of cash, which is legal tender, would have further control implications. It is possible that things such as vaccination status could, for example, preclude someone from accessing banking services. Such a concept has already been floated in Edo in Nigeria. Many elderly individuals also do not partake in online banking or the use of cards for digital transactions. 
such a decision could be extremely abrasive for this group moving forward. More centralised control of funding also inherently leads to more taxation, and that's the key advantage for the government. Tradies, for example, love a cash in hand job on the side, and given how tough things are with slow wage growth and ever increasing cost of living, destroying the secondary economy would rightfully have plenty of people up in arms. One thing that you can expect is that crypto will become even more prevalent as it works into the new direction of world finances whilst also remaining disconnected from government. And let's face it, that's quite a good thing. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Thanks for joining us yet again for a trending news topic. Today we're covering miners made commitments to attain neutrality by 2050. The International Council on Mining and Metals, or ICMM, said on Tuesday that the top miners of the world are committed to the goal of limiting direct and indirect emissions by 2050 or earlier. And many leading miners across the globe, including Rio Tinto, BHP, Anglo American, FMG, etc., are under pressure from the environmentalists and shareholders related to environmental emissions. And they have already made commitments to attain neutrality by 2050 in direct and indirect emissions. Net zero commitments. ICMM members collectively made commitments to net zero scope one and scope two emissions by 2050. The collective commitment made by the miners represents a joint ambition from the leaders that holds nearly 33% of the global metals and mining industry. The significant announcement comes ahead of the UN climate gathering planned in the next month, aiming for more ambitious climate actions from more than 200 countries that inked the iconic Paris Agreement to reduce global warming. The 28 members of ICMM that hold nearly 650 operational sites in more than 50 countries will report their annual progress reports for the decarbonisation. Limiting direct and indirect emissions. Direct and indirect emissions can be reduced by integrating the operations with renewable energy sources and reducing the utilisation of fossil fuel driven equipment and mine trucks which are responsible for maximum emissions in mines. The technology to produce carbon emission free production of steel is not yet proven. However, the Council aims to put a cap on emissions of iron ore and steel processing plants by 2023 or sooner. Good late afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sage. You're watching Kalkine TV live from Sydney. And this is the last show of the day, the last trade. There's no better way to wind down the day than with the latest market close commentary. So let's get started. And the ASX 200 ended lower today, dropping 0.25% after setting a new 20-day high.
And over the last five days, the index is virtually unchanged, but is currently 2.65% below its 52-week high. Let's now take a look at the top gainers and losers of the day. Borrell was today's top performer, up 4.9%. The stock is at its highest level since August. And following suit were Reliance, Worldwide Corporation and Reese. The stock of Nearmap rose 3.7%, whereas electronics and consumer goods chain JB Hi-Fi rose 3.2%. The red zone of the ASX 200 pack was led by online gaming group PointsBet that plummeted as much as 16% today. IOOF Holdings fell 8% and Nickel Mines traded 5.5% lower. And other top laggards today were Aurocoba and Kodan. And let us now shift our focus to the stocks that fetched the investors' attention today. Online gaming group PointsBet's holding saw its stock fall by over 15% today at the lowest level since August last year. And the fall comes after PointsBet released a market update that showed heavy spending as the company pursues aggressive growth in the US. Wealth manager IOOF Holdings saw continued growth in its funds under management and administration for the three months ended 30th September 2021. Restated group FUMA was up 2.4 billion Australian dollars to 321.1 billion Australian dollars. And as at the end of September, IOOF maintained active advice services relationships with 1,883 financial advisors, slightly lower than the numbers at the end of June. And today, the stock traded in the red zone. Australia and New Zealand banking group said that its full-year cash profit from continuing operations rose 65%, reaching 6.2 billion Australian dollars. This is despite pressures on mortgage growth boosted by the release of more than 500 million Australian dollars in provisions for bad debts as the economic outlook improves. And ANZ traded up by nearly 0.5% today. Shares in Whitehaven Coal fell over 11% in the opening hour of trade today. The company was on track for its worst day since mid-April and the decline dragged the shares to a two-month low and moderately reversed a rally over the past year as the price of coal shot higher. Heightened demand for energy, particularly in Europe and China, has helped to push the price of the commodities skyward as a lack of scale from new renewables and underinvestment in fossil fuels squeezed prices higher. On the contrary, Building Materials Group Borrell is now at its highest level since August. The company told shareholders that lockdowns are not having as big an impact as first forecast. The a bit impact of COVID-related costs and lower volumes in the September quarter was around 33 million Australian dollars, compared with an earlier estimate of around 50 million Australian dollars. And casino operator the Star Entertainment Group has avoided a second strike at its annual general meeting today after shareholders lashed the group last year over its executive pay while also defending its track record on preventing money laundering. There were misleading assertions in the media reports and the company was committed to a culture of compliance, said Star's chairman John O'Neill. And shares traded up by 0.5% today. And it's time for a small break, but stay tuned with me. I'll be back with more of the trending market updates. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello, welcome back. Sage here with the Market Close Commentary by Calkine TV. And let us look at some more of those stocks that grabbed the investors' attention today. Electronics and consumer goods chain JB Hi-Fi has seen its sales plunge in the September quarter as it weathered the extended lockdowns in Sydney and Melbourne, though its chief executive says conditions have improved this month. And so much so, the cumulative impact for the 2022 financial year is now not expected to exceed 50 million Australian dollars. And today, shares traded up by nearly 3%. 
Priceline operator Australian Pharmaceutical Industries has gained 1.1 million Australian dollars net profit for 2021 despite COVID-19 retail shutdowns hitting the business hard. The pharmacy wholesaler revealed that it had booked revenues of 4 billion Australian dollars for 2021, a 0.4% drop on last year. API shares traded flat today. And now that we know what the stance is back home, let us move on to the next segment and understand the Asian and global markets performance. And most Asian stocks fell today amid the concerns that the recovery from the pandemic will slow as elevated inflation forces tighten the monetary policy. And besides, investors are watching whether one of the biggest developers ever grand group can avoid a default on two trillion yuan of debt. Shares slipped in Japan were a little changed in South Korea and the market in India opened flat. In Japan, the benchmark Nikkei 225 index was down 0.84%, while the broader Topics index slipped 0.64%. Hong Kong stocks started Thursday's trade slightly higher following the previous day's steep losses, though investors were keeping a wary eye on the surging inflation, central bank tightening and a fresh COVID outbreak in China. The Hang Seng Index added 0.08% and the Shanghai Composite Index slipped 0.38%. And we've made it to the last segment of the show. Let's have a quick look over the buzzing crypto market's performance. And today the global crypto market cap was down 4.49% to 2.46 trillion US dollars. Bitcoin's price today slipped below the $60,000 US level, its lowest level in over a week, following a record-breaking level hit last week. The world's largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization was trading 3.5% lower at 58,725 US dollars. Bitcoin is up more than 30% this month and the digital token is still on track for its best month since February. Meanwhile, Shiba Inu soared nearly 67%. The coin has been named after the Japanese dog breed Shiba Inu the mascot of Shiba Inu, which is based on the Shiba Pup. The coin aims to be the Ethereum-based counterpart to Dogecoin. In other news, an exchange-traded fund tracking cryptocurrency miners and infrastructure providers debuted in Australia, the latest in the global flurry of digital asset products. The Cosmos Global Digital Miners Access ETF, ticker DIGA, will include firms like Marathon Digital, Holdings Riot, Blockchain, Hive Blockchain Technologies and Hut8 Mining and will trade on the ChiX Australia Exchange. And next month, BetaShares is due to launch an Australia-listed ETF tracking global crypto-linked companies. And earlier in October, the US allowed a futures-based ETF, a development that helped propel Bitcoin to a record high. And with that, folks, it's a wrap. Hope you found the market closing commentary informative and we'll be back tomorrow live from Sydney at 9.30 in the morning. You can count on that for the first report on the pre-market scenario. Till then, take care, take care, stay safe. Sage signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
What do you know about Facebook's Novi? Let's take a look at eight things you should know about the digital wallet. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. The main question is, how will Facebook fit into the crypto universe? On its website, Novi Wallet cites its availability in Guatemala and the US for money transfers using the Pax dollar, a stable coin collateralized to the US dollar. Now, for the uninitiated, Facebook's Novi Wallet is not a cryptocurrency wallet, which are hot and cold, but a digital wallet that will be used for money transfers and not for storing cryptocurrencies. The Novi Wallet is a plain digital wallet. The world's leading cryptocurrency exchange, Coinbase, will act as the custody partner for Novi. It means that Coinbase's infrastructure will be used for the safekeeping of users' Novi funds. Coinbase custody comes under the purview of the New York Department of Financial Services. The state banking law also considers it as a fiduciary. The money transfer will initially rely on the USDP stablecoin, which according to CoinMarketCap has a market cap of almost 945 million US dollars as of now. Users will convert their local currency into USDP and these PAX dollar stablecoins will be transferred instantly to the intended recipient's account. Facebook's Novi will charge no fee from the users for adding and sending a USDP. However, the official website says today there are no fees which means that fees may become a part in the future. Novi for the time being will also not add any markup to exchange rates or currencies. The platform will convert one USD to one PAX dollar and vice versa. The user can know beforehand how much money will be received by the recipient in local currency. It can bring predictability and transparency in money transfers. Novi is currently in its pilot phase. Having started with two countries, Facebook's digital wallet can likely enter other jurisdictions depending on the initial response from the users. So basically, Facebook's Novi is a digital wallet, which is not comparable to cryptocurrency wallets. The latter store crypto tokens, however, Novi Wallet will facilitate no fee cross-border remittances. Novi will use the PAX dollar as the stable coin with a one-to-one -one peg with the US dollar. Now, if you like this information, press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. You can also subscribe to our channel. I'm Rachel, signing off for Calkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.